Accessory Before the Fact by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lee Vogler. At the Moorland Crossroads, Martin stood examining the signpost for several minutes, in some bewilderment. The names on the four arms were not what he expected. Distances were not given, and his map, he concluded, with impatience, must be hopelessly out of date. Spreading it against the post, he stooped to study it more closely. The wind blew the corners flapping against his face. The small print was almost indecipherable in the fading light. It appeared, however, as well as he could make out, that two miles back he must have taken the wrong turn. He remembered that turning. The path had looked inviting. He had hesitated a moment, then followed it, caught by the usual lure of walkers, that it might prove a shortcut. A shortcut snares as old as human nature. For some minutes he studied the signpost and map alternatively. Dusk was falling, and his knapsack had grown heavy. He could not make the two guides tally, however, and a feeling of uncertainty crept over his mind. He felt oddly baffled, frustrated. His thought grew thick. Decision was most difficult. I'm muddled, he thought. I must be tired, as at length he chose the most likely arm. Sooner or later it will bring me to an end, though not the one I intended. He accepted his walker's luck and started briskly. The arm read, over Lydicy Hill, in small fine letters that danced and shifted every time he looked at them, but the name was not discoverable on the map. It was, however, inviting, like the shortcut. A similar impulse again directed his choice, only this time it seemed more insistent, almost urgent, and he became aware then of the exceeding loneliness of the country about him. The road for a hundred yards went straight and curved like a white river running into space. The deep blue-green of heather lined the banks, spreading upwards through the twilight, and occasional small pines stood solitary here and there, all unexplained. The curious adjective, having made its appearance, haunted him. So many things that afternoon were similarly unexplained, and the short cup, the darkened map, the names of the signpost, his own erratic impulses, and the growing strange confusion that crept upon his spirit. The entire countryside needed explanation, though perhaps interpretation was the truer word. Those little lonely trees had made him see it. Why had he lost his way so easily? Why did he suffer vague impressions to influence his direction? Why was he here, exactly here? And why did he go now over Lydicy Hill? Then, by a green field that shone like a thought of daylight amid the darkness of the moor, he saw a figure lying in the grass. It was a blot upon the landscape, a mere huddled patch of dirty rags, yet with a certain horrid picturesqueness, too. And his mind, though his German was of the schoolroom order, at once picked out the German equivalents as against the English, lump and lumpen flashed across his brain, most oddly. They seemed in that moment right and so expressive, almost like onomatopoeia words, as if they were possible of sight. Neither rags nor rascal would have fitted what he saw. The adequate description was in German. Here was a clue tossed up by the part of him that did not reason. But it seems he missed it, and the next minute the tramp rose to a sitting posture and asked the time of the evening. In German, he asked it, and Martin, answering without a second's hesitation, gave it, also in German, halb sieben, half past six. The instinctive guess was accurate. A glance at his watch when he looked at it a moment later proved it. He heard the man say with the covert insolence of tramps, Thank you, much obliged. For Martin had not shown his watch, another intuition subconsciously obeyed. He quickened his pace along that lonely road, a curious jumble of thoughts and feelings surging through him. He had somehow known the question would come, and come in German. 
It had flustered and dismayed him. Another thing that had also flustered and dismayed him, he had expected it in the same queer fashion. It was right, for when the ragged brown thing rose to ask the question, a part of it remained lying on the grass. Another brown dirty thing. There were two tramps, and he saw both faces clearly. Behind the untidy beards, below the old slouch hats, he caught the look of unpleasant, clever faces that watched him closely while he passed. The eyes followed him. For a second he looked straight into those eyes, so he could not fail to know them. And he understood, quite horridly, that both faces were too sleek, refined, and cunning for those of ordinary tramps. The men were not really tramps at all. They were disguised. How covertly they watched me, was his thought, as he hurried along the darkening road, aware in dead earnestness now of the loneliness and desolation of the moorland all about him. Uneasy and distressed, he increased his pace. Midway, and thinking what an unnecessarily clanking noise his nailed boots made upon the hard white road, there came upon him with a rush together the company of these things that haunted him as unexplained. They brought a single definite message that all this business was not really meant for him at all, and hence his confusion and bewilderment that he had intruded into someone else's scenery and was trespassing upon another's map of life. By some wrong inner turning, he had interpolated his person into a group of foreign forces which operated in the little world of someone else. Unwittingly somewhere, he had crossed the threshold and was now fairly in. A trespasser, an eavesdropper, a peeping Tom. He was listening, peeping, overhearing things that he had no right to know because they were intended for another. Like a ship at sea, he was intercepting wireless messages he could not properly interpret because his receiver was not accurately tuned in to their reception. And more, these messages were warnings. Then fear dropped upon him like the night. He was caught in a net of delicate, deep forces he could not manage, knowing neither their origin nor purpose. He had walked into some huge psychic trap, elaborately planned and baited, yet calculated for another than himself. Something had lured him in, something in the landscape, in the time of day, his mood, Owing to some undiscovered weakness in himself, he had been easily caught. His fear slipped easily into terror. What happened next happened with such speed and concentration that it all seemed crammed into a moment. At once, and in a heap, it happened. It was quite inevitable. Down the white road to meet him, a man came swaying from side to side in drunkenness, quite obviously feigned. A tramp and while Martin made room for him to pass, the lurch changed in a second to attack, and the fellow was upon him. The blow was sudden and terrific, yet even while it fell, Martin was aware that behind him rushed a second man who caught his legs from under him and bore him with a thud and crashed to the ground. Blows rained then. He saw a gleam of something shining, a sudden deadly nausea plunged him into utter weakness where resistance was impossible. Something of fire entered his throat, and from his mouth poured a thick, sweet thing that choked him. The world sank far away into darkness. Yet through all the horror and confusion ran the trail of two clear thoughts. He realized that the first tramp had sneaked at a fast double through the heather, and so come down to meet him and that something heavy was torn from fastenings that clipped it tight and close beneath his clothes against his body. Abruptly then the darkness lifted, passed utterly away. He found himself peering into the map against the signpost. The wind was flapping the corners against his cheek, and he was poring over names that he now saw quite clear. Upon the arms of the signpost above were those he had expected to find and the map recorded them quite faithfully. All was accurate, and as it should be. He read the name of the village he had meant to make, 
It was plainly visible in the dusk, two miles the distance given. Bewildered, shaken, unable to think of anything, he stuffed the map into his pocket unfolded and hurried forward like a man who had just awakened from an awful dream that had compressed into a single second all the detailed misery of some prolonged, oppressive nightmare. He broke into a steady trot that soon became a run. Perspiration poured from him. His legs felt weak, and his breath was difficult to manage. He was only conscious of the overpowering desire to get away as fast as possible from the signpost at the crossroads where the dreadful vision had flashed upon him. For Martin, accountant on a holiday, had never dreamed of any world of psychic possibilities. The entire thing was torture. It was worse than a cooked balance of the books that some conspiracy of clerks and directors proved at his innocent door. He raced as though the countryside ran crying at his heels, and always still with him the incredible conviction that none of this was really meant for himself at all. He had overheard the secrets of another. He had taken the warning for another into himself, and so altered its direction. He had thereby prevented its right delivery. It all shocked him beyond words. It dislocated the machinery of his just and accurate soul. The warning was intended for another, who could not, would not, receive it now. The physical exertion, however, brought at length a more comfortable reaction and some measure of composure. With the lights inside, he slowed down and entered the village at a reasonable pace. The inn was reached, a bedroom inspected and engaged, and supper ordered with the solid comfort of a large bass to satisfy an unholy thirst and complete the restoration of balance. The unusual sensations largely passed away, and the odd feeling that anything in his simple, wholesome world required explanation was no longer present. Still, with a vague uneasiness about him, though actual fear quite gone, he went into the bar to smoke an after-supper pipe and chat with the natives, as his pleasure was upon a holiday and so saw two men leaning upon the counter at the far end with their backs toward him. He saw their faces instantly in the glass, and the pipe nearly slipped from between his teeth. Clean-shaven, sleek, clever faces, and he caught a word or two as they talked over their drinks. German words. Well-dressed they were, and both men with nothing about them calling for particular attention. They might have been two tourists holiday-making like himself in tweeds and walking boots, and they presently paid for their drinks and went out. He never saw them face to face at all, but this sweat broke out afresh all over him, a feverish rush of heat and ice together ran about his body. Beyond question he recognized the two tramps, this time not disguised, not yet disguised. He remained in his corner without moving, puffing violently at an extinguished pipe, gripped helplessly by the return of that first vile terror. It came to him with an absolute clarity of certainty that it was not with himself they had to do, these men, and further, that he had no right in the world to interfere. He had no locus standi at all. It would be immoral, even if the opportunity came. And the opportunity he felt would come. He had been an eavesdropper, and he'd come upon some private information, even the secret kind, that he had no right to make use of, even that good might come, even to save life. He sat on in his corner, terrified and silent, waiting for the thing that should happen next. But night came without explanation. Nothing happened. He slept soundly. There was no other guest at the inn but an elderly man, apparently a tourist like himself. He wore gold-rimmed glasses, and in the morning Martin overheard him asking the landlord what direction he should take for Literacy Hill. His teeth began then to chatter, and weakness came into his knees. He turned left at the crossroads, Martin broke in before the landlord could reply. You'll see a signpost that's about two miles from here, and after that it's a matter of four miles more. How in the world did he know? flashed horribly through him. I'm going that way myself, he was saying next. I'll go with you for a bit if you don't mind. The words came out impulsively and ill-considered. Of their own accord they came, 
for his own direction was exactly opposite. He didn't want the man to go alone. The stranger, however, easily evaded his offer of companionship. He thanked him with the remark that he was starting later in the day. They were standing all three beside the horse trough in front of the inn, when at that very moment a tramp, slouching along the road, looked up and asked the time of day, and it was the man with the gold-rimmed glasses who told him. Thank you, much obliged, the tramp replied, passing on with his slow, slouching gait, while the landlord, a talkative fellow, proceeded to remark on the number of Germans that lived in England and were ready to swell the Teutonic invasion, which he, for his part, deemed imminent. But Martin heard it not. Before he had gone a mile upon his way, he went into the woods to fight his conscience all alone. His feebleness, his cowardice, were surely criminal. Real anguish tortured him. A dozen times he decided to go back upon his steps, and a dozen times the singular authority that whispered he had no right to interfere prevented him. How could he act upon knowledge gained by eavesdropping? How interfere in the private business of another's hidden life merely because he had overheard, as at the telephone, its secret dangers? Some inner confusion prevented straight thinking altogether. The stranger would merely think him mad. He had no fact to go on. He smothered a hundred impulses and finally went on his way, with a shaking, troubled heart. The last two days of his holiday were ruined by doubts and questions and alarms, all justified later when he read of the murder of a tourist upon Lidacy Hill. The man wore gold-rimmed glasses and carried in a belt about his person a large sum of money. His throat was cut, and the police were hard upon the trail of a mysterious pair of tramps said to be Germans. End of Accessory Before the Fact Humorous Ghost Stories by Dorothy Scarborough. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paula Messina. Back from that born by Anonymous. Practical Working of Materialization in Maine. A strange story from Pocock Island. A materialized spirit that will not go back. The first glimpse of what may yet cause very extensive trouble in this world. The Sun, Saturday, December 19, 1874. We are permitted to make extracts from a private letter, which bears the signature of a gentleman well known in business circles and whose veracity we have never heard called in question. His statements are startling, and well-nigh incredible. But if true, they are susceptible of easy verification. Yet the thoughtful mind will hesitate about accepting them without the fullest proof, for they spring upon the world a social problem of stupendous importance. The dangers apprehended by Mr. Malthus and his followers become remote and commonplace by the side of this new and terrible issue. The letter is dated at Pocock Island, a small township in Washington County, Maine, about 17 miles from the mainland and nearly midway between Mount Desert and the Grand Menin. The lost state census accords to Pocock Island a population of 311, mostly engaged in the porgy fisheries. At the presidential election of 1872, the island gave Grant a majority of three. These two facts are all that we are able to learn of the locality from sources outside of the letter already referred to. The letter omitting certain passages which refer solely to private matters, reads as follows. But enough of the disagreeable business that brought me here to this bleak island in the month of November. I have a singular story to tell you. After our experience together at Chittenden, I know you will not reject statements because they are startling. My friend, there is upon Pocock Island a materialized spirit 
which or who refuses to be dematerialized at this moment and within a quarter of a mile from me as i write a man who died and was buried four years ago and who has exploited the mysteries beyond the grave walks talks and holds interviews with the inhabitants of the island and is to all appearances determined to remain permanently upon this side of the river i will relate the circumstances as briefly as i can john newbegin in april eighteen seventy john newbegin died and was buried in the little cemetery on the landward side of the island newbegin was a man of about forty-eight without family or near connections and eccentric to a degree that sometimes inspired questions as to his sanity what money he had earned by many seasons fishing upon the banks was invested in quarters of two small mackerel schooners the remainder of which belonged to john hodgson the richest man on pocock who was estimated by good authorities to be worth thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars new begin was not without a certain kind of culture he had read a good deal of the odds and ends of literature and as a simple-minded islander expressed it in my hearing knew more bookfuls than anybody on the island he was naturally an intelligent man and he might have attained influence in the community had it not been for his utter aimlessness of character his indifference to fortune and his consuming thirst for rum many yachtsmen who have had occasion to stop at pocock for water or for harbour shelter during eastern cruises will remember a long listless figure astonishingly attired in blue army pants rubber boots loose toga made of some bright chintz material and very bad hat staggering through the little settlement followed by a rabble of jeering brats and pausing to strike uncertain blows at those within reach of the dead sculpin which he usually carried round by the tail this was john newbegin his sudden death as i have already remarked he died four years ago last april the mary emmeline one of the little schooners in which he owned had returned from the eastward and had smuggled or run in a quantity of st john brandy newbegin had a solitary and protracted debauch he was missed from his accustomed walks for several days and when the islanders broke into the hovel where he lived closed down to the seaweed and almost within reach of the incoming tide they found him dead on the floor with an emptied demijohn hard by his head after the primitive custom of the island they interred john newbegin's remains without coroner's inquest burial certificate or funeral services and in the excitement of a large catch of porgies that summer soon forgot him and his friendless life his interest in the mary emmeline and the pretty boat recurred to john hodgson and as nobody came forward to demand an administration of the estate it was never administered the forms of law are but loosely followed in some of these marginal localities his reappearance at pocock well my dear four years and four months had brought their quota of varying seasons to pocock island john newbegin reappeared under the following circumstances in the latter part of last august as you may remember there was a heavy gale all along our atlantic coast during this storm the squadron of the naugatuck yacht club which was returning from a summer cruise as far as campobello was forced to take shelter in the harbour to the leeward of the pocock island the gentlemen of the club spent three days at the little settlement ashore among the party was mr r e by which name you will recognize a medium of celebrity and one who has been particularly successful in materializations at the desire of his companions and to relieve the tedium of their detention mr e improvised a cabinet in the little schoolhouse at pocock and gave a seance to the delight of his fellow yachtsmen 
and the utter bewilderment of such natives as were permitted to witness the manifestations the conditions appeared unusually favorable to spirit appearances and the seance was upon the whole perhaps the most remarkable that mr e ever held it was all the more remarkable because the surroundings were such that the most prejudiced sceptic could discover no possibility of trickery the first form to issue from the wood closet which constituted the cabinet when mr e had been tied therein by a committee of old sailors from the yachts was that of an indian chief who announced himself as hockamock and who retired after dancing a harvest moon pas seul and declaring himself in very emphatic terms as opposed to the present indian policy of the administration hockamock was succeeded by the aunt of one of the yachtsmen who identified herself beyond question by allusion to family matters and by displacing the scar of a burn upon her left arm received while making tomato ketchup upon earth then came successfully a child whom none present recognized a french canadian who could not talk english and a portly gentleman who introduced himself as william king first governor of maine these in turn re-entered the cabinet and were seen no more it was some time before another spirit manifested itself and mr e gave directions that the lights be turned down still further then the door of the wood closet was slowly opened and a singular figure in rubber boots and a species of dolly varden garment emerged bringing a dead fish in his right hand his determination to remain the city men who were present i am told thought that the medium was masquerading in grotesque habiliments for the more complete astonishment of the islanders but these latter rose from their seats and exclaimed with one consent it is john newbegin and then in not unnatural terror of the apparition they turned and fled from the schoolroom uttering dismal cries john newbegin came calmly forward and turned up the solitary kerosene lamp that shed uncertain light over the proceedings he then sat down in the teacher's chair folded his arms and looked complacently about him you might as well untie the medium he finally remarked i propose to remain in the materialized condition and he did remain when the party left the schoolhouse among them walked john newbegin as truly a being of flesh and blood as any man of them from that day to this he has been a living inhabitant of pocock island eating drinking water only and sleeping after the manner of men the yachtsman who made sail for bar harbor the very next morning probably believed that he was a fraud hired for the occasion by mr e but the people of pocock who laid him out dug his grave and put him into it four years ago know that john newbegin has come back to them from a land they know not of a singular member of society the idea of having a ghost somewhat more condensed it is true than the traditional ghost as a member was not at first over pleasing to the three hundred eleven inhabitants of pocock island to this day they are a little sensitive upon the subject feeling evidently that if the matter got abroad it might injure the sale of the really excellent porgy oil which is the product of their sole manufacturing interest this reluctance to advertise the skeleton in their closet superadded to the slowness of these obtuse fishy matter-of-fact people to recognize the transcendent importance of the case must be accepted as explanation of the fact that john newbegin's spirit has been on earth between three and four months and yet the singular circumstance is not known to the whole country but the pocockians have at last come to see that a spirit is not necessarily a malevolent spirit and accepting his presence as a fact in their stolid unreasoning way they are quite neighborly and sociable with mr newbegin i know that your first question will be is there sufficient proof of his ever having been dead to this i answer unhesitatingly yes 
he was too well known a character and too many people saw the corpse to admit of any mistake on this point i may add here that it was at one time proposed to disinter the original remains but that project was abandoned in deference to the wishes of mr newbegin who feels a natural delicacy about having his first set of bones disturbed from motives of mere curiosity an interview with a dead man you will readily believe that i took occasion to see and converse with john newbegin i found him affable and even communicative he is perfectly aware of his doubtful status as a being but is in hopes that at some future time there may be legislation that shall correctly define his position and the position of any spirit who may follow him into the material world the only point upon which he is reticent is his experience during the four years that elapsed between his death and his reappearance at pocock it is to be presumed that the memory is not a pleasant one at least he never speaks of this period he candidly admits however that he is glad to get back to earth and that he embraced the very first opportunity to be materialized mr newbegin says that he is consumed with remorse for the wasted years of his previous existence indeed his conduct during the past three months would show that his regret is genuine he has discarded his eccentric costume and dresses like a reasonable spirit he has not touched liquor since his reappearance he has embarked in the porgy oil business and his operations already rival that of hodgson his old partner in the mary emmeline and the pretty boat by the way newbegin threatens to sue hodgson for his individed quarter in each of these vessels and this interesting case therefore bids fair to be thoroughly investigated in the courts as a business man he is generally esteemed on the island although there is a noticeable reluctance to discount his paper at long dates in short mr john newbegin is a most respectable citizen if a dead man can be a citizen and has announced his intention of running for the next legislature in conclusion and now my dear i have told you the substance of all i know respecting this strange strange case yet after all why so strange we accepted materialization at chittenden is this any more than the logical issue of that admission if the spirit may return to earth clothed in flesh and blood and all the physical attributes of humanity why may it not remain on earth as long as it sees fit thinking of it from whatever standpoint i cannot but regard john newbegin as the pioneer of a possibly large immigration from the spirit world the bars once down a whole flock will come trooping back to earth death will lose its significance altogether and when i think of the disturbance which will result in our social relations of the overthrow of all accepted institutions and of the nullification of all principles of political economy law and religion i am lost in perplexity and apprehension end of back from that bourne the boarded window by ambrose bierce this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by ryan loner the boarded window by ambrose bierce in eighteen thirty only a few miles away from what is now the great city of cincinnati lay an immense and almost unbroken forest the whole region was sparsely settled by people of the frontier restless souls who no sooner had hewn fairly habitable homes out of the wilderness and attained to that degree of prosperity which to-day we should call indigence than impelled by some mysterious impulse of their nature they abandoned all and pushed farther westward to encounter new perils and privations in the effort to regain the meagre comforts which they had voluntarily renounced many of them had already forsaken that region for the remoter settlements but among those remaining was one who had been of those first arriving he lived alone in a house of logs surrounded on all sides by the great forest 
of whose gloom and silence he seemed a part, for no one had ever known him to smile nor speak a needless word. His simple wants were supplied by the sailor barter of skins of wild animals in the river town, for not a thing did he grow upon the land which, if needful, he might have claimed by right of undisturbed possession. There were evidences of improvement. A few acres of ground immediately about the house had once been cleared of its trees, the decayed stumps of which were half concealed by the new growth that had been suffered to repair the ravage wrought by the axe. Apparently, the man's zeal for agriculture had burned with a failing flame, expiring in penitential ashes. The little log house, with its chimney of sticks, its roof of warping clapboards weighted with traversing poles, and its chinking of clay, had a single door and directly opposite a window. The latter, however, was boarded up. Nobody could remember a time when it was not. And none knew why it was so closed. Certainly not because of the occupant's dislike of light and air, for on those rare occasions when a hunter had passed that lonely spot, the recluse had commonly been seen sunning himself on his doorstep if heaven had provided sunshine for his need. I fancy there are few persons living today who ever knew the secret of that window, but I am one, as you shall see. The man's name was said to be Murlock. He was apparently seventy years old, actually about fifty. Something besides years had had a hand in his aging. His hair and long, full beard were white, his gray, lusterless eyes sunken, his face singularly seamed with wrinkles which appeared to belong to two intersecting systems. In figure he was tall and spare, with a stoop of the shoulders, a burden-bearer. I never saw him, these particulars I learned from my grandfather, from whom also I got the man's story when I was a lad. He had known him when living nearby in that early day. One day Murlock was found in his cabin, dead. It was not a time and place for coroners and newspapers, and I suppose it was agreed that he had died from natural causes, or I should have been told and should remember. I know only that with what was probably a sense of the fitness of things, the body was buried near the cabin, alongside the grave of his wife, who had preceded him by so many years that local tradition had retained hardly a hint of her existence. That closes the final chapter of this true story, excepting indeed the circumstance that many years afterward, in company with an equally intrepid spirit, I penetrated to the place and ventured near enough to the ruined cabin to throw a stone against it, and ran away to avoid the ghost which every well-informed boy thereabout knew haunted the spot. But there is an earlier chapter that supplied by my grandfather. When Murlock built his cabin and began laying sturdily about with his axe to hew out a farm, the rifle, meanwhile, his means of support, he was young, strong, and full of hope. In that eastern country whence he came, he had married, as was the fashion, a young woman in all ways worthy of his honest devotion, who shared the dangers and privations of his lot with a willing spirit and light heart. There is no known record of her name. Of her charms of mind and person, tradition is silent, and the doubter is at liberty to entertain his doubt but God forbid that I should share it. Of their affection and happiness there is abundant assurance in every added day of the man's widowed life, for what but the magnetism of a blessed memory could have chained that venturesome spirit to a lot like that? One day Murlock returned from gunning in a distant part of the forest to find his wife prostrate with fever and delirious. There was no physician within miles, no neighbor, nor was she in a condition to be left to summon help. So he set about the task of nursing her back to health, but at the end of the third day she fell into unconsciousness and so passed away, apparently with never a gleam of returning reason. From what we know of a nature like his, we may venture to sketch in some of the details of the outline picture drawn by my grandfather. When convinced that she was dead, Murlock had sense enough to remember that the dead must be prepared for burial. In performance of this sacred duty, he blundered now and again, did certain things incorrectly, and others which he did correctly were done over and over. His occasional failures to accomplish some simple and ordinary act filled him with astonishment, like that of a drunken man who wonders at the suspension of familiar natural laws. He was surprised, too, that he did not weep. Surprised and a little ashamed, surely it is unkind not to weep for the dead. Tomorrow, he said aloud, I shall have to make the coffin and dig the grave, and then I shall miss her when she is no longer in sight. But now she is dead, of course, but it is all right, it must be all right somehow. Things cannot be so bad as they seem. He stood over the body in the fading light, adjusting the hair and putting the finishing touches to the simple toilet, doing all mechanically with soulless care. And still through his consciousness ran an undersense of conviction that all was right, that he should have her again as before and everything explained. He had had no experience in grief. His capacity had not been enlarged by use. 
His heart could not contain it all, nor his imagination rightly conceive it. He did not know he was so hard struck. That knowledge would come later, and never go. Grief is an artist of powers as various as the instruments upon which he plays his dirges for the dead, evoking from some the sharpest shrillish notes, from others the low grave chords that throb recurrent like the slow beating of a distant drum. Some natures it startles, some it stupefies. To one it comes like the stroke of an arrow, stinging all the sensibilities to a keener life, to another as the blow of a bludgeon which in crushing benumbs. We may conceive Murlock to have been that way affected, for, and here we are upon surer ground than that of conjecture, no sooner had he finished his pious work than sinking into a chair by the side of the table upon which the body lay, and noting how white the profile showed in the deepening gloom, he laid his arms upon the table's edge and dropped his face into them, tearless yet and utterly weary. At that moment came in through the open window a long wailing sound like the cry of a lost child in the far deeps of the darkening woods. But the man did not move. Again and nearer than before sounded that unearthly cry upon his failing sense. Perhaps it was a wild beast. Perhaps it was a dream. For Murlock was asleep. Some hours later, as it afterward appeared, this unfaithful watcher awoke and, lifting his head from his arms, intently listened. He knew not why. There in the black darkness, by the side of the dead, recalling all without a shock, he strained his eyes to see he knew not what. His senses were all alert. His breath was suspended. His blood had stilled its tides as if to assist the silence. Who, what had waked him, and where was it? Suddenly the table shook beneath his arms, and at the same moment he heard, or fancied that he heard, a light soft step. Another. Sounds as of bare feet upon the floor. He was terrified beyond the power to cry out or move. Perforce he waited, waited there in the darkness through seeming centuries of such dread as one may know, yet live to tell. He tried vainly to speak the dead woman's name, vainly to stretch forth his hand across the table to learn if she were there. His throat was powerless, his arms and hands were like lead. Then occurred something most frightful. Some heavy body seemed hurled against the table with an impetus that pushed it against his breast so sharply as nearly to overthrow him, and at the same instant he heard and felt the fall of something upon the floor with so violent a thump that the whole house was shaken by the impact. A scuffling occurred and a confusion of sounds impossible to describe. Murlock had risen to his feet. Fear had by excess forfeited control of his faculties. He flung his hands upon the table. Nothing was there. There is a point at which terror may turn to madness, and madness incites to action. With no definite intent, from no motive but the wayward impulse of a madman, Murlock sprang to the wall with a little groping, seized his loaded rifle, and without aim discharged it. By the flash which lit up the room with a vivid illumination, he saw an enormous panther dragging the dead woman toward the window, its teeth fixed in her throat. Then there was darkness blacker than before, and silence, and when he returned to consciousness the sun was high and the wood vocal with songs of birds. The body lay near the window where the beast had left it when frightened away by the flash and report of the rifle. The clothing was deranged, the long hair in disorder, the limbs lay anyhow. From the throat, dreadfully lacerated, had issued a pool of blood not yet entirely coagulated. The ribbon with which he had bound the wrists was broken, the hands were tightly clenched, between the teeth was a fragment of the animal's ear. End of the boarded window. That Damned Thing by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Vogler. One. By the light of a tallow candle, which had been placed on one end of a rough table, a man was reading something written in a book. It was an old account book, greatly worn, and the writing was not, apparently, very legible, for the man sometimes held the page close to the flame of the candle to get a stronger light upon it. The shadow of the book would then throw into obscurity a half of the room, darkening a number of faces and figures for besides the reader, eight other men were present. Seven of them sat against their rough log walls, silent and motionless, and, the room being small, not very far from the table. By extending an arm, any one of them could have touched the eighth man, who lay on the table, face upward, partly covered by a sheet, his arms at his sides. He was dead. 
The man with the book was not reading aloud, and no one spoke. All seemed to be waiting for something to occur. The dead man only was without expectation. From the blank darkness outside came in, through the aperture that served for a window, all the ever unfamiliar noises of night in the wilderness, the long nameless note of a distant coyote, the stilly pulsing trill of tireless insects and trees, strange cries of night birds, so different from those of the birds of day, the drone of great blundering beetles, and all that mysterious chorus of small sounds that seem always to have been but half heard when they have suddenly ceased, as if conscious of an indiscretion. But nothing of all this was noted in that company. Its members were not over much addicted to idle interests in matters of no practical importance. That was obvious in every line of their rugged faces, obvious even in the dim light of the single candle. They were evidently men of the vicinity, farmers and woodmen. The person reading was a trifle different. One would have said of him that he was of the world, albeit there was that in his attire which attested to a certain fellowship with the organisms of his environment. His coat would hardly have passed muster in San Francisco. His footwear was not of urban origin, and the hat that lay by him on the floor, he was the only one uncovered was such that if one had considered it as an article of mere personal adornment, he would have been missing its meaning. In countenance, the man was rather prepossessing, with just a hint of sternness, though he may have assumed or cultivated as appropriate to one in authority, for he was a coroner. It was by virtue of his office that he had possession of the book in which he was reading. It had been found among the dead man's effects in his cabin, where the inquest was now taking place. When the coroner had finished reading, he put the book into his breast pocket. At that moment the door was pushed open and a young man entered. He, clearly, was not of mountain birth and breeding. He was clad as those who dwell in cities. His clothing was dusty, however, as from travel. He had, in fact, been riding hard to attend the inquest. The coroner nodded. No one else greeted him. We have waited for you, said the coroner. It is necessary to have done with this business tonight. The young man smiled. I am sorry to have kept you, he said. I went away, not to evade your summons, but to post to my newspaper an account of what I suppose I am called back to relate. The coroner smiled. The account that you posted to your newspaper, he said, differs probably than that which you will give here under oath. That, replied the other, rather hotly, with a visible flush, is as you choose. I used manifold paper, and have a copy of what I sent. It was not written as news, for it is incredible, but as fiction. It may go as part of my testimony, under oath, but you say it's incredible. That is nothing to you, sir, if I also swear that it's true. The coroner was apparently not greatly affected by the young man's manifest resentment. He was silent for some moments, his eyes on the floor. The men about the sides of the cabin talked in whispers, but seldom withdrew their gaze from the face of the corpse. Presently, the coroner lifted his eyes and said, We will resume the inquest. The men removed their hats. The witness was sworn. What's your name? The coroner asked. William Harker. Age? Twenty-seven. You knew the deceased, Hugh Morgan? Yes. You were with him when he died? Near him. How did that happen? Your presence, I mean. I was visiting him at this place to shoot and fish. A part of my purpose, however, was to study him and his odd, solitary way of life. He seemed a good model for a character in fiction. I sometimes write stories. I sometimes read them. Thank you. Stories in general, not yours. Some of the jurors laughed. Against a somber background, humor shows highlights. Soldiers in the intervals of battle laugh easily, and a jest in the death chamber conquers by surprise. Relate the circumstances of this man's death, said the coroner. You may use any notes or memoranda that you please. The witness understood. 
pulling a manuscript from his breast pocket he held it near the candle and turning the leaves till he found the passage he wanted began to read two the sun had hardly risen when we left the house we were looking for quail each with a shotgun but we only had one dog morgan said that our best ground was beyond a certain ridge that he pointed out and we crossed it by a trail through the chaparral on the other side was comparatively level ground thickly covered with wild oats as we emerged from the chaparral morgan was but a few yards in advance suddenly we heard at a little distance to our right and partly in front a noise as of some animal thrashing about in the bushes which we could see were violently agitated we've started a deer said i wish we'd brought a rifle morgan who had stopped and was intently watching the agitated chaparral said nothing but had cocked both barrels of his gun and was holding it in readiness to aim i thought him a trifle excited which surprised me for he had a reputation for exceptional coolness even in moments of sudden and imminent peril oh come i said you're not going to fill up a deer with quail shot are you still he did not reply but catching the side of his face as he turned slightly toward me i was struck by the pallor of it then i understood that we had serious business on hand and my first conjecture was that we had jumped a grizzly i advanced to morgan's side cocking my piece as i moved the bushes were now quiet and the sounds had ceased but morgan was as attentive to the place as before what is it what the devil is it i asked that damned thing he replied without turning his head his voice was husky and unnatural he trembled visibly i was about to speak further when i observed the wild oats near the place of the disturbance moving in the most inexplicable way i can hardly describe it it seemed as if stirred by a streak of wind which not only bent it but pressed it down crushed it so that it did not rise and this movement was slowly prolonging itself directly toward us nothing that i had ever seen had affected me so strangely as this unfamiliar and unaccountable phenomenon yet i am unable to recall any sense of fear i remember and tell it here because singularly enough i recollected it then that once in looking carelessly out of an open window i momentarily mistook a small tree close at hand for one of a group of larger trees at a little distance away it looked the same size as the others but being more distinctly and sharply defined in mass and detail seemed out of harmony with them it was a mere falsification of the law of aerial perspective but it startled almost terrified me we so rely on the orderly operation of familiar natural laws that any seeming suspension of them is noted as a menace to our safety a warning of unthinkable calamity so now the apparently causeless movement in the herbage and the slow undeviating approach of the line of disturbance were distinctly disquieting my companion actually appeared frightened and i could hardly credit my senses when i saw him suddenly throw his gun to his shoulders and fire both barrels at the agitated grass before the smoke of the discharge had cleared away i heard a loud savage cry a scream like that of a wild animal and flinging his gun upon the ground morgan sprang away and ran swiftly from the spot at that same instant i was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen in the smoke some soft heavy substance that seemed thrown against me with great force before i could get upon my feet and recover my gun which seems to have been struck from my hands i heard morgan crying as if in mortal agony mingling with his cries were such hoarse savage sounds as one hears from fighting dogs inexpressibly terrified i struggled to my feet and looked in the direction of morgan's retreat and may heaven in mercy spare me from another sight like that at a distance of less than thirty yards was my friend down on one knee his head thrown back at a frightful angle hatless his long hair in disorder 
and his whole body in violent movement from side to side, backward and forward. His right arm was lifted and seemed to lack the hand. At least I could see none. The other arm was invisible. At times, as my memory now reports this extraordinary scene, I could discern but a part of his body. It was as if he had been partly blotted out. I cannot otherwise express it. Then a shifting of his position would bring it all into view again. All this must have occurred within a few seconds, yet in that time Morgan assumed all the postures of a determined wrestler vanquished by a superior weight and strength. I saw nothing but him, and him not always distinctly. During the entire incident his shouts and curses were heard, as if through an enveloping roar of such sounds of rage and fury as I have never heard come from the throat of a man or brute. For a moment I only stood irresolute. Then, throwing down my gun, I ran forward to my friend's assistance. I had a vague belief that he was suffering from a fit or some form of convulsion. Before I could reach his side, he was down and quiet. All sounds had ceased. But, with a feeling of such terror as even these awful events had not inspired, I now saw the same mysterious movement of the wild oats prolonging itself from the trampled area about the prostrate man toward the edge of a wood. It was only when it had reached the wood that I was able to withdraw my eyes and look at my companion. He was dead. Three. The coroner rose from his seat and stood behind the dead man. Lifting an edge of the sheet, he pulled it away, exposing the entire body, altogether naked, and showing in the candlelight a clay-like yellow. It had, however, broad maculations of bluish-black, obviously caused by extravasated blood from the contusions. The chest and sides looked as if they had been beaten with a bludgeon. There were dreadful lacerations. The skin was torn in strips and shreds. The corner moved round to the end of the table and undid a silk handkerchief which had been passed under the chin and knotted on the top of the head. When the handkerchief was drawn away, it exposed what had been the throat. Some of the jurors who had risen to get a better view repented their curiosity and turned away their faces. Witness Harker went to the open window and leaned out across the sill, faint and sick. Dropping the handkerchief upon the dead man's neck, the coroner stepped to an angle of the room, and from a pile of clothing produced one garment after another, each of which he held up for a moment for inspection. All were torn and stiff with blood. The jurors did not make a closer inspection. They seemed rather uninterested. They had, in truth, seen all this before, the only thing that was new to them being Harker's testimony. Gentlemen, the coroner said, we have no more evidence, I think. Your duty has been already explained to you. If there's nothing you wish to ask, you may go outside and consider your verdict. The foreman rose, a tall bearded man of sixty, coarsely clad. I should like to ask one question, Mr. Coroner, he said. What asylum did this your last witness escape from? Mr. Harker, said the coroner, gravely and tranquilly, from what asylum did you last escape? Harker flushed crimson again, but said nothing, and the seven jurors rose and solemnly filed out of the cabin. If you've done insulting me, sir, said Harker, as soon as he and the officer were left alone with the dead man, I suppose I'm at liberty to go? Yes. Harker started to leave, but paused, with one hand on the door latch. The habit of his profession was strong in him, stronger than his sense of personal dignity. He turned about and said, The book that you have there, I recognized as Morgan's diary. You seemed greatly interested in it. You read in it while I was testifying. May I see it? The public would... The book will cut no figure in this matter, replied the official, slipping it into his coat pocket. All the entries in it were made before the writer's death. As Harker passed out of the house, the jury re-entered and stood about the table on which the now-covered corpse showed under the sheet with sharp definition. The foreman seated himself near the candle, produced from his breast pocket a pencil and scrap of paper, 
and wrote rather laboriously the following verdict, which with various degrees of effort all signed. We, the jury, do find that the remains come to their death at the hands of a mountain lion, but some of us thinks, all the same, they had fits. 4. In the diary of the late Hugh Morgan are certain interesting entries having, possibly, a scientific value as suggestions. At the inquest upon his body, the book was not put in evidence. Possibly the coroner thought it not worth while to confuse the jury. The date of the first of the entries mentioned cannot be ascertained. The upper part of the leaf is torn away. The part of the entry remaining is as follows. Would run in a half circle, keeping his head turned always toward the center, and again he would stand, barking furiously. At last he ran away into the brush as fast as he could go. I thought at first that he had gone mad, but on returning to the house found no other alteration in his manner than what was obviously due to fear of punishment. Can a dog see with his nose? Do odors impress some olfactory center with the images of the thing admitting them? September 2. Looking at the stars last night, as they rose above the crest of the ridge east of the house, I observed them successively disappear from left to right. Each was eclipsed but an instant, and only a few at the same time, but along the length of the ridge, all that were within a degree or two of the crest were blotted out. It was as if something had passed along between me and them, but I could not see it, and the stars were not thick enough to define its outline. Ugh, I do not like this. Several weeks' entries are missing, three leaves being torn from the book. September 27. It has been about here again. I find evidences of its presence every day. I watched again all of last night in the same cover, gun in hand, double charged with buckshot. In the morning, the fresh footprints were there, as before. Yet I would have sworn that I did not sleep. Indeed, I hardly sleep at all. It's terrible, insupportable. If these amazing experiences are real, I shall go mad. If they are fanciful, I am mad already. October 3. I shall not go. It shall not drive me away. No, this is my house, my land. God hates a coward. October 5. I can stand it no longer. I have invited Harker to pass a few weeks with me. He has a level head. I can judge from his manner if he thinks me mad. October 7. I have the solution of the problem. It came to me last night, suddenly, as by revelation. How simple, how terribly simple. There are sounds that we cannot hear. At either end of the scale are notes that stir no chord of that imperfect instrument, the human ear. They are too high or too grave. I have observed a flock of blackbirds occupying an entire treetop, the treetops of several trees, and all in full song. Suddenly, in a moment, at absolutely the same instant, all spring into the air and fly away. How? They could not all see one another. Whole treetops intervened. At no point could a leader have been visible to all. There must have been a signal of warning or command, high and shrill above the den, but by me, unheard. I have observed, too, the same simultaneous flight. When all were silent, among not only blackbirds but other birds, quail, for example, widely separated by bushes, even on opposite sides of a hill. It is known to seamen that a school of whales basking or sporting on the surface of the ocean, miles apart, with the convexivity of the earth between them, will sometimes dive at the same instant, all gone out of sight in a moment. The signal has been sounded, too grave for the ear of the sailor at the masthead and his comrades on deck who nevertheless feel its vibrations in the ship, 
as the stones of a cathedral are stirred by the bass of the organ. As with sounds, so with colors. At each end of the solar spectrum, the chemist can detect the presence of what are known as actinic rays. They represent colors, integral colors, in the composition of light, which we are unable to discern. The human eye is an imperfect instrument. Its range is but a few octaves of the real chromatic scale. I'm not mad. There are colors that we cannot see. And God help me, the damned thing is of such a color. End of The Damned Thing Dracula's Guest by Bram Stoker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Second Dracula's Guest by Bram Stoker when we started for our drive, the sun was shining brightly on Munich, and the air was full of the joyousness of early summer. Just as we were about to depart, Herr Derbruck, the maitre de hotel of the Quatre Saisons, where I was staying, came down, bareheaded, to the carriage, and, after wishing me a pleasant drive, said to the coachman, still holding his hand on the handle of the carriage door, "'Remember, you are back by nightfall.' The sky looks bright, but there is a shiver in the north wind that says there may be a sudden storm. But I'm sure you will not be late, here he smiled and added, for you know what night it is. Johann answered with an emphatic, Ja, mein Herr, and, touching his hat, drove off quickly. When we had cleared the town, I said, after signaling to him to stop, Tell me, Johann, what is tonight? He crossed himself as he answered laconically, Valprugis knocked. Then he took out his watch, a great, old-fashioned silver thing, as big as a turnip, and looked at it, with his eyebrows gathered together and a little impatient shrug of his shoulders. I realized this was his way of respectfully protesting against the unnecessary delay, and sank back in the carriage, merely motioning him to proceed. He started off rapidly, as if to make up for lost time. Every now and then the horses seemed to throw up their heads and sniff the air suspiciously. On such occasions I often looked round in alarm. The road was pretty bleak, for we were traversing a sort of high, wind-swept plateau. As we drove I saw a road that looked but little used, and which seemed to dip through a little, winding valley. It looked so inviting that, even at the risk of offending him, I called Johann to stop, and when he had pulled up I told him I would like to drive down that road. He made all sorts of excuses, and frequently crossed himself as he spoke. This somewhat piqued my curiosity, so I asked him various questions. He answered fencingly, and repeatedly looked at his watch in protest. Finally, I said, "'Well, Johann, I want to go down this road. I shall not ask you to come unless you like, but tell me why you do not like to go. That is all I ask.' For answer, he seemed to throw himself off the box, so quickly did he reach the ground. Then he stretched out his hands appealingly to me, and implored me not to go. There was just enough of English mixed with the German for me to understand the drift of his talk. He seemed always just about to tell me something, the very idea with, of which evidently frightened him. But each time he pulled himself up, saying as he crossed himself, Valbrug is knocked! I tried to argue with him, but it was difficult to argue with a man when I did not know his language. The advantage certainly rested with him, for although he began to speak in English, of a very crude and broken kind, he always got excited and broke into his native tongue, and every time he did so, he looked at his watch. Then the horses became restless and sniffed the air. At this he grew very pale, and looking around in a frightened way, he suddenly jumped forward, took them by the bridles, and led them on some twenty feet. I followed and asked why he had done this. For answer, he crossed himself, pointed at the spot we had left, and drew his carriage in the direction of the other road, indicating a cross, and said, first in German, then in English, buried him, him what killed himself. I remembered the old custom of burying suicides at crossroads. Ah, I see, a suicide, how interesting! But for the life of me I could not make out why the horses were frightened. Whilst we were talking we heard a sort of sound between a yelp and a bark, 
It was far away, but the horses got very restless, and it took Johan all his time to quiet them. He was pale and said, It sounds like a wolf, but yet there are no wolves here now. No, I said, questioning him. Isn't it long since the wolves were so near the city? Long, long, he answered, in the spring and summer. But with the snow the wolves have been here not so long. Whilst he was petting the horses and trying to quiet them, dark clouds drifted rapidly across the sky. The sunshine passed away, and a breath of cold wind seemed to drift past us. It was only a breath, however, and more in the nature of a warning than a fact, for the sun came out brightly again. Johann looked under his lifted hand at the horizon and said, "'The storm of snow, he comes before long time.' Then he looked at his watch again, and, straight away holding his reins firmly, for the horses were pawing the ground restlessly and shaking their heads, he climbed to his box as though the time had come for proceeding on our journey. I felt a little obstinate and did not at once get into the carriage. "'Tell me,' I said, "'about this place where the road leads,' and I pointed down. Again he crossed himself and mumbled a prayer before he answered, "'It is unholy.' "'What is unholy?' I inquired. "'The village.' then there is a village. No, no, no one lives there hundreds of years. My curiosity was piqued. But you said there was a village. There was. Where is it now? Whereupon he burst out into a long story in German and English, so mixed up that I could not quite understand exactly what he said. But roughly I gathered that long ago, hundreds of years, men had died there and been buried in their graves, and sounds were heard under the clay. And when the graves were opened, men and women were found rosy with life, and their mouths red with blood. And so, in haste to save their lives, I and their souls, here he crossed himself, those who were left fled away to other places, where the living lived, and the dead were dead, and not, not something. He was evidently afraid to speak the last words. As he proceeded with his narration, he grew more and more excited. It seemed as if his imagination had got hold of him and he ended in a perfect paroxysm of fear, white-faced, perspiring, trembling, and looking around him, as if expecting that some dreadful presence would manifest itself there in the bright sunshine on the open plain. Finally, in an agony of desperation, he cried, Valpurgis knocked, and pointed to the carriage for me to get in. All my English blood rose at this, and standing back, I said, You are afraid, Johann, you are afraid. Go home. I shall return alone. The walk will do me good. The carriage door was open. I took from the seat my oak walking stick, which I always carry on my holiday excursions, and closed the door, pointing back to Munich, and said, Go home, Johann. Valpurgis knocked doesn't concern Englishmen. The horses were now more restive than ever, and Johann was trying to hold them in, while excitedly imploring me to not do anything foolish. I pitied the poor fellow. He was deeply in earnest. But all the same I could not help laughing. His English was quite gone now. In his anxiety he had forgotten that his only means of making me understand was to talk my language, so he jabbered away in his native German. It began to be a little tedious. After giving the direction home, I turned to go down the cross road into the valley. With a despairing gesture, Johann turned his horses toward Munich. I leaned on my stick and looked after him. He went slowly along the road for a while, then there came over the crest of the hill a man tall and thin. I could see so much in the distance. When he drew near the horses, they began to jump and kick about and then to scream with terror. Johann could not hold them in. They bolted down the road, running away madly. I watched them out of sight, then looked for the stranger, but I found that he, too, was gone. With a light heart, I turned down the side road through the deepening valley to which Johann had objected. There was not the slightest reason that I could see for his objection, and I dare say I tramped for a couple of hours without thinking of time or distance, and certainly without seeing a person or a house. So far as this place was concerned, it was desolation itself. But I did not notice this particularly till, on turning a bend in the road, I came upon a scattered fringe of wood. Then I recognized that I had been impressed unconsciously by the desolation of the region through which I had passed. I sat down to rest myself and began to look around. It struck me that it was considerably colder than it had been at the commencement of my walk. A sort of sighing sound seemed to be around me, with, 
now and then a high overhead sort of muffled roar. Looking upwards, I noticed that great thick clouds were drifting rapidly across the sky from north to south at a great height. There were signs of a coming storm in some lofty stratum of the air. I was a little chilly, and thinking that it was the sitting still after the exercise of walking, I resumed my journey. The ground I passed over was now much more picturesque. There were no striking objects that the eye might single out, but in all there was a charm of beauty. I took little heed of time, and it was only when the deepening twilight forced itself upon me that I began to think of how I should find my way home. The brightness of the day had gone. The air was cold, and the drifting of clouds high overhead was more marked. They were accompanied by a sort of far-away rushing sound, through which seemed to come at intervals that mysterious cry which the driver had said came from a wolf. For a while I hesitated. I had said I would see the deserted village, so on I went, and presently came on a wide stretch of open country, shut in by hills all around. Their sides were covered with trees which spread down to the plain, dotting in clumps, the gentler slopes and hollows which showed here and there. I followed with my eye the winding of the road, and saw that it curved close to one of the densest of these clumps, and was lost behind it. As I looked, there came a cold shiver in the air, and the snow began to fall. I thought of the miles and miles of bleak country I had passed, and then hurried on to seek the shelter of the wood in front. Darker and darker grew the sky, and faster and heavier fell the snow, till the earth before and around me was a glistening white carpet, the further edge of which was lost in misty vagueness. The road was here, but crude, and when on the level its boundaries were not so marked as when it passed through the cuttings, and in a little while I found that I had must have strayed from it, for I missed underfoot the hard surface, and my feet sank deeper in the grass and moss. Then the wind grew stronger and blew with ever-increasing force till I was fain to run before it. The air became icy cold, and in spite of my exercise I began to suffer. The snow was now falling so thickly and whirling around me in such rapid eddies that I could hardly keep my eyes open. Every now and then the heavens were torn asunder by a vivid lightning, and in the flashes I could see ahead me the great mass of trees, chiefly yew and cypress, all heavily coated with snow. I was soon amongst the shelter of the trees, and there, in comparative silence, I could hear the rush of the wind high overhead. Presently the blackness of the storm had become merged in the darkness of the night. By and by the storm seemed to be passing away, and now only came in fierce puffs or blasts. At such moments the weird sound of the wolf appeared to be echoed by many similar sounds around me. Now and again, through the black mass of drifting cloud, came a straggling ray of moonlight which lit up the expanse and showed me that I was at the edge of a dense mass of cypress and yew trees. As the snow had ceased to fall, I walked out from the shelter and began to investigate more closely. It appeared to me that, amongst so many old foundations as I had passed, there might be still standing a house which, though in ruins, I could find some sort of shelter for a while. As I skirted the edge of the copse, I found that a low wall encircled it, and following this I presently found an opening. Here the cypresses formed an alley leading up to a square mass of some kind of building. Just as I caught sight of this, however, the drifting clouds obscured the moon, and I passed up the path in darkness. The wind must have grown colder, for I felt myself shiver as I walked, but there was hope of shelter, and I groped my way blindly on. I stopped, for there was a sudden stillness. The storm had passed, and perhaps in sympathy with nature's silence my heart seemed to cease to beat. But this was only momentarily, for suddenly the moonlight broke through the clouds, showing me that I was in a graveyard, and that the square object before me was a great massive tomb of marble, as white as the snow that lay on and all around it. With the moonlight there came a fierce sigh of the storm which appeared to resume its course with a long, low howl, as of many dogs or wolves. I was awed and shocked, and felt the cold perceptibly grow on me until it seemed to grip me by the heart. While the flood of moonlight still fell on the marble tomb, the storm gave further evidence of renewing, as though it was returning on its track. Impelled by some sort of fascination, I approached the skepukar to see what it was, and why such a thing stood alone in such a place. 
I walked around it and read over the Doric door in German, Countess Dolingen of Graz, in Styria, sought and found death, 1801. On the top of the tomb, seemingly driven through the solid marble, for the structure was composed of a few vast blocks of the stone, was a great iron spike or stake. On going to the back, I saw engraven in great Russian letters, The Dead Travel Fast. There was something so weird and uncanny about the whole thing that it gave me a turn and made me feel quite faint. I began to wish for the first time that I had taken Johann's advice. Here a thought struck me, which came under almost mysterious circumstances and with a terrible shock. This was Walpurgis Night. Walpurgis Night, when, according to the belief of millions of people, the devil was abroad, when the graves were opened and the dead came forth and walked, when all evil things of the earth and air and water held revel, this very place the driver had specifically shunned. This was the depopulated village of centuries ago. This is where the suicide lay, and this was the place where I was alone, unmanned, shivering a cold in a shroud of sorrow with a wild storm gathering again upon me. It took all of my philosophy, all of the religion I had been taught, all my courage, to not collapse in a paroxysm of fright. And now a perfect tornado burst upon me. The ground shook as though thousands of horses thundered across it, and this time the storm bore on its icy wings not snow, but great hailstones which drove with such violence that they might have come from the thongs of Belieric slingers. Hailstones that beat down leaf and branch and made the shelter of the cypresses of no more avail than though their stems were standing corn. At the first I had rushed to the nearest tree, but I was soon fain to leave it and seek the only spot that seemed to afford refuge the deep Doric doorway of the marble tomb. There, crouching against the massive bronze door, I gained a certain amount of protection from the beating of the hailstones, for now they only drove against me as they ricocheted from the ground in the side of the marble. As I leaned against the door, it moved slightly and opened inwards. The shelter of even a tomb was welcome in that pitiless tempest, and I was about to enter it when there came a flash of forked lightning that lit up the whole expanse of the heavens. In the instant, as I am a living man, I saw, as my eyes were turned into the darkness of the tomb, a beautiful woman, with rounded cheeks and red lips, seemingly sleeping on a bier. As the thunder broke overhead, I was grasped as by the hand of a giant and hurled out into the storm. The whole thing was so sudden that, before I could realize the shock, moral as well as physical, I found the hailstones beating me down and at the same time I had a strange, dominating feeling that I was not alone. I looked towards the tomb. Just then there came another blinding flash, which seemed to strike the iron stake that surmounted the tomb and to bore through the earth, blasting and crumbling the marble as in a burst of flame. The dead woman rose for a moment of agony. While she was lapped in the flame, and her bitter scream of pain was drowned out in the thunder crash. The last thing I heard was this mingling of dreadful sound, as again I was seized in the giant grasp and dragged away, while the hailstones beat on me, and the air seemed reverberant with the howling of wolves. The last sight that I remembered was a vague, white, moving mass, as if all the graves around me had sent out the phantoms of their sheeted dead, and that they were closing in on me through the white cloudiness of the driving hail. Gradually, there came a sort of vague beginning of consciousness, then a sense of weariness that was dreadful. For a time I remembered nothing, but slowly my senses returned. My feet seemed positively racked with pain, yet I could not move them. They seemed to be numbed. There was an icy feeling at the back of my neck and all down my spine, and my ears, like my feet, were dead, yet in torment. But there was in my breast a sense of warmth which was, by comparison, delicious. It was as a nightmare, a physical nightmare, if one may use such an expression, for some heavy weight on my chest made it difficult for me to breathe. This period of semi-lethargy seemed to remain a long time, and as it faded away I must have slept or swooned. Then came a sort of loathing, like the first stage of seasickness and a wild desire to be free from something, I knew not what. A vast stillness enveloped me, as though all the world were asleep or dead, only broken by the low panting of some animal close to me. 
I felt a warm rasping at my throat, then became a consciousness of the awful truth, which chilled me to the heart and sent the blood surging up through my brain. Some great animal was lying on me, and now licking my throat. I feared to stir, for some instinct of prudence bade me lie still, but the brute seemed to realize that there was now some change in me, for it raised its head. Through my eyelashes I saw above me the two great flaming eyes of a gigantic wolf. Its sharp white teeth gleamed in the gaping red mouth, and I could feel its hot breath fierce and accurate upon me. For another spell of time I remembered no more. Then I became conscious of a low growl, followed by a yelp, renewed again and again. Then, seemingly very far away, I heard a holla, holla! as of many voices calling in unison. Cautiously, I raised my head and looked in the direction whence the sound came, but the cemetery blocked my view. The wolf still continued to yelp in a strange way, and a red glare began to move around the grove of the cypresses, as though following the sound. As the voices drew closer, the wolf yelped faster and louder. I feared to make either sound or motion. Nearer came the red glow over the white pall which stretched into the darkness around me. Then, all at once, from beyond the trees, there came at trot a troop of horsemen bearing torches. The wolf froze from my breast and made for the cemetery. I saw one of the horsemen, soldiers by their caps and their long military cloaks, raise his carbine and take aim. A companion knocked up his arm, and I heard the ball whiz over my head. He had evidently taken my body for that of the wolf. Another sighted the animal as it slunk away, and a shot followed. Then, at a gallop, the troop rode forward, some towards me, others following the wolf as it disappeared amongst the snow-clad cypresses. As they drew nearer, I tried to move, but was powerless, although I could see and hear all that went on around me. Two or three of the soldiers jumped from their horses and knelt beside me. One of them raised my head and placed his hand over my heart. "'Good news, comrades!' he cried. His heart still beats. Then some brandy was poured down my throat. It put vigor into me, and I was able to open my eyes fully and look around. Lights and shadows were moving along the trees, and I heard men call to one another. They drew nearer, uttering frightened exclamations, and the lights flashed as others came pouring out of the cemetery pell-mell like men possessed. When the further ones came close to us, those who were around me asked them eagerly, well have you found him the reply rang out hurriedly no no come away quick quick this is no place to stay in on this of all nights what was it was the question asked in all manner of keys the answer came variously and all indefinitely as though the men were moved by some common impulse to speak yet were restrained by some common fear from giving their thoughts Indeed, gibbered one whose wits had plainly given out for the moment. A wolf, and yet not a wolf, another put in shudderingly. No use trying for him without the sacred bullet, a third remarked in a more ordinary manner. Serve us right for coming out on this night. Truly we have earned our thousand marks, were the ejaculations of a fourth. There was blood on the broken marble, another said after a pause. The lightning never brought that there, and for him— is he safe? Look at his throat. See, comrades, the wolf has been lying on him and keeping his blood warm. The officer looked at my throat and replied, He is all right. The skin is not pierced. What does it all mean? We should never have found him but for the yelping of the wolf. What became of it? asked the man who was holding up my head, and who seemed to be the least panic-stricken of the party, for his hands were steady and without tremor. On his sleeve was the chevron of a petty officer. It went to its home, answered the man, whose long face was pallid, and who actually shook with terror as he glanced around him fearfully. There are graves enough there in which it may lie. Come, comrades, come quickly. Let us leave this cursed spot. The officer raised me to a sitting posture, as he uttered a word of command. Then several men placed me upon a horse. He sprang to the saddle behind me, took me in his arms, gave the word to advance, and, turning our faces away from the cypresses, we rode away in a swift military order. As yet my tongue refused its office, and I was perforce silent. I must have fallen asleep, for the next thing I remembered was finding myself standing up, 
supported by a soldier on each side of me. It was almost broad daylight, and to the north a red streak of sunlight was reflected like a path of blood over the waste of snow. The officer was telling the men to say nothing of what they had seen except they found an English stranger, guarded by a large dog. Dog! That was no dog, cut in the man who had exhibited such fear. I think I know a wolf when I see one. The young officer answered calmly, I said a dog. Dog, reiterated the other ironically. It was evident that his courage was rising with the sun, and, pointing to me, he said, Look at his throat! Is that the work of a dog, master? Instinctively I raised my hand to my throat, and as I touched it I cried out in pain. The men crowded round to look, some stooping down from their saddles, and again there came the calm voice of the young officer. A dog, I said. If aught else were said, we should only be laughed at. I was then mounted behind a trooper, and we rode on into the suburbs of Munich. Here we came across a stray carriage, into which I was lifted, and it was driven off to the Croix Saison, the young officer accompanying me, whilst a trooper followed with his horse, and the others rode off to their barracks. When we arrived, Hel Delbruck rushed so quickly down the steps to meet me, that it was apparent that he had been watching within. Taking me by both hands, he solicitously led me in. The officer saluted me and was turning to withdraw, when I recognized his purpose and insisted that he should come to my room. Over a glass of wine I warmly thanked him and his brave comrades for saving me. He replied simply that he was more than glad and that Herr Delbruck had taken the first steps to make all the searching party pleased, at which ambiguous utterance at the Mati de Hotel smiled while the officer pleaded duty and withdrew. "'But Herr Delbruck,' I inquired, "'how and why was it that the soldier searched for me?' He shrugged his shoulders, as if in depreciation of his own deed, as he replied. "'I was so fortunate as to obtain leave from the commander of the regiment in which I served to ask for volunteers.' "'But how did you know I was lost?' I asked. "'The driver came hither with the remains of his carriage, which had been upset when the horses ran away.' "'But surely you would not send a search-party of soldiers merely on this account?' "'Oh, no,' he answered. "'But even before the coachman arrived, I had this telegram from the boyar whose guests you are.' And then he took from his pocket a telegram which he handed me, and I read. "'Bistritz. Be careful of my guest. His safety is most precious to me. Should aught happen to him, or if he be missed, spare nothing to find him and ensure his safety.' He is English, and therefore adventurous. There are often dangers from snow and wolves in night. Lose not a moment if you suspect harm to him. I answer your zeal with my fortune. Dracula. As I held the telegram in my hand, the room seemed to whirl around me, and, if the attentive Machi de Hotel had not caught me, I think I should have fallen. There was something so strange in all of this something so weird and impossible to imagine that there grew on me a sense of my being in some way the sport of opposite forces, the mere vague ideal of which seemed in a way to paralyze me. I was certainly under some form of mysterious protection. From a distant country had come, in the very nick of time, a message that took me out of the danger of the snow-sleep and the jaws of the wolf. End of Dracula's Guest The Judge's House by Bram Stoker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by the Second. The Judge's House by Bram Stoker. When the time for his examination drew near, Malcolm Malcolmson made up his mind to go somewhere to read by himself. He feared the attractions of the seaside, and also he feared completely rural isolation. For of old he knew it charms, and so he determined to find some unpretentious little town where there would be nothing to distract him. He refrained from asking suggestions from any of his friends, for he argued that each would recommend some place of which he had knowledge, and where he had already acquaintances. As Malcolmson wished to avoid friends, he had no wish to encumber himself with the attention of friends' friends and so he determined to look out for a place himself. He packed a portmanteau with some clothes and all the books he required, then took ticket for the first name on the local timetable which he did not know. 
when at the end of three hours journey he alighted at benchurch he felt satisfied that he had so far obliterated his tracks as to be sure of having a peaceful opportunity of pursuing his studies he went straight to one inn which the sleepy little place contained and put up for the night benchurch was a market town and once in three weeks was crowded to excess but the remainder of the twenty-one days it was as attractive as a desert malcolmson looked around the day after his arrival to try to find quarters more isolated than even so quiet an inn as the good traveller afforded there was only one place which took his fancy and it certainly satisfied his wildest ideas regarding quiet in fact quiet was not the proper word to apply to it desolation was the only term conveying any suitable idea of its isolation it was an old rambling heavy-built house of the jacobian style with heavy gables and windows unusually small and set higher than was customary in such houses and was surrounded by a high brick wall massively built indeed on examination it looked more like a fortified house than an ordinary dwelling but all of these things pleased malcolmson here he thought is the very spot i have been looking for and if i can get opportunity of using it i shall be happy his joy was increased when he realized beyond a doubt that it was not at present inhabited from the post office he got the name of the agent who was rarely surprised at the application to rent a part of the old house mr carnford the local lawyer and agent was a genial old gentleman and frankly confessed his delight at any one being willing to live in the house to tell you the truth said he i should be only too happy on behalf of the owners to let any one have the house rent free for a term of years if only to accustom the people here to see it inhabited it has been so long empty that some kind of absurd prejudice has grown up about it and this can be best put down by its occupation if only he added with a sly glance at malcolmson by a scholar like yourself who wants its quiet for a time malcolmson thought it needless to ask the agent about the absurd prejudice he knew he would get more information if he should require it on that subject from other quarters he paid his three months rent got a receipt and the name of an old woman who would probably undertake to do for him and came away with the keys in his pocket he then went to the landlady of the inn who was a cheerful and most kindly person and asked her advice as to such stores and provisions as he would be likely to require she threw up her hands in amazement when he told her where he was going to settle himself not in the judge's house she said and grew pale as she spoke he explained the locality of the house saying that he did not know its name and when he had finished she answered ay sure enough sure enough the very place it is the judge's house sure enough he asked her to tell him about the place why so called and what there was against it she told him that it was so called locally because it had been many years before how long she could not say as she was herself from another part of the country but she thought it must have been a hundred years or more the abode of a judge who was held in great terror on account of his harsh sentences and his hostility to prisoners at aziz's as to what there was against the house itself she could not tell she had often asked but no one could inform her but there was a general feeling that there was something and for her own part she would not take all the money in drinkwater's bank and stay in the house for an hour by herself then she apologized to malcolmson for her disturbing talk it is too bad of me sir and you and a young gentleman too if you'll pardon me for saying it going to live there all alone if you were my boy and you'll excuse me for saying it you wouldn't sleep there a night not if i had to go there myself and pull the big alarm bell that's on the roof the good creature was so manifestly in earnest and was so kindly in her intentions that malcolmson although amused was touched he told her kindly how much he appreciated her interest in him and added but my dear miss witham indeed you need not be concerned about me a man who is reading for the mathematical tripos has too much to think of to be disturbed by any of these mysterious somethings and his work is of too exact and prosaic a kind to allow of his having any corner in his mind for mysteries of any kind harmonical possessions permutations and combinations and elliptic functions have sufficient mysteries for me mrs witham kindly undertook to see after his commissions and he went himself to look for the old woman who had been recommended to him when he returned to the judge's house with her after an interval of a couple hours 
he found miss witham herself waiting with several men and boys carrying parcels and an upholsterer's man with a bed in a car for she said though tables and chairs might be all very well a bed that had been aired for mayhap fifty years was not proper for young bones to lie on she was evidently curious to see the inside of the house and though manifestly so afraid of the somethings that at the slightest sound she clutched on to malcolmson whom she never left for a moment went over the whole place after his examination of the house malcolmson decided to take up his abode in the great dining-room which was big enough to serve for all his requirements and mrs witham with the aid of the charwoman mrs dempster proceeded to arrange matters when the hampers were brought in and unpacked malcolmson saw that with much kind forethought she had sent from her own kitchen sufficient provisions to last for a few days before going she expressed all sorts of kind wishes and at the door turned and said and perhaps sir as the room is big and draughty it might be well to have one of those big screens put round your bed at night though truth to tell i would die myself if i were to be so shut in with all kinds of, of things that put their head round the sides or over the top and look on me the image which she had called up was too much for her nerves and she fled incontinently mrs dempster sniffed in a superior manner as the landlady disappeared and remarked that for her own part she wasn't afraid of all the bogies in the kingdom i'll tell you what it is sir she said bogies is all kinds and sorts of things except bogies rats and mice and beetles and creaky doors and loose slates and broken panes and stiff drawer handles that stay out when you pull them and then fall down in the middle of the night look at that wainscot of the room it is old hundreds of years old do you think there's no rats and beetles there and do you imagine sir that you won't see none of them rats is bogies i tell you and bogies is rats and don't you get to think anything else mrs dempster said malcolmson gravely making her a polite bow you know more than a senior wrangler and let me say that as a mark of esteem for your indubitable soundness of head and heart i shall when i go give you possession of this house and let you stay here by yourself for the last two months of my tenancy for four weeks will serve my purpose thank you kindly sir she answered but i couldn't sleep away from home at night i am in greeno's charity and if i spend a night away from my rooms i should lose all i've got to live on the rules is very strict and there's too many watching for a vacancy for me to run any risks in the matter only for that sir i'd gladly come here and attend on you all together during your stay my good woman said malcolmson hastily i have come here on purpose to obtain solitude and believe me that i am grateful for the late greeno for having so organized his admirable charity whatever it is that i am perforce denied the opportunity of suffering from such a form of temptation st anthony himself could not be more rigid on that point the old woman laughed harshly ah you young gentlemen she said you don't fear for naught and belike you'll get all the solitude you want here she set to work with her cleaning and by nightfall when malcolmson returned from his walk he always had one of his books to study as he walked he found the room swept and tidied a fire burning in the old hearth the lamp lit and on the table spread for supper with miss witham's excellent fare this is comfort indeed he said as he rubbed his hands when he had finished his supper and lifted the tray to the other end of the great oak dining table he got out his books again put fresh wood on the fire trimmed his lamp and set himself down to a spell of real hard work he went on without pause until about eleven o'clock where he knocked off for a bit to fix his fire and lamp and to make himself a cup of tea he had always been a tea drinker and during college life he had sat late at work and taken tea late the rest was a great luxury to him and he enjoyed it with a sense of delicious voluptuous ease the renewed fire leaped and sparkled and threw quaint shadows through the great old room and as he sipped his hot tea he revelled in the sense of isolation from his kind then it was that he began to notice for the first time what a noise the rats were making surely he thought they could not have been at it all the time i was reading had they been i must have noticed it presently when the noise increased he satisfied himself that it was really new it was evident that at first the rats had been frightened at the presence of a stranger in the light of the fire and the lamp but that as the time went on that they had grown bolder and they were now disporting themselves as was their wont how busy they were 
and hark to the strange noises up and down behind the old wainscot over the ceiling and under the floor they raced gnawed and scratched malcolmson smiled to himself as he recalled to mind the saying of mrs dempster bogies is rats and rats is bogies the tea began to have its effect of intellectual and nervous stimulus he saw with joy another long spell of work to be done before the night was passed and in the sense of security which it gave him he allowed himself the luxury of a good look around the room he took his lamp in one hand and went all around wondering that so quaint and beautiful an old house had been so long neglected the carving of the oak on the panels of the wainscot was fine and on and round the doors and windows it was beautiful and of rare merit there were some old pictures on the walls but they were coated so thick with dust and dirt that he could not distinguish any detail of them though he held his lamp as high as he could over his head here and there as he went round he saw some cracker hole blocked for a moment by the face of a rat with its bright eyes glittering in the light but in an instant it was gone and a squeak and a scamper followed the thing that most struck him however was the rope of the great alarm bell on the roof which hung down in a corner of the room on the right hand side of the fireplace he pulled up close to the hearth with a great high-backed carved oak chair and sat down to his last cup of tea when this was done he made up the fire and went back to his work sitting at the corner of the table having the fire to his left for a little while the rats disturbed him somewhat with their perpetual scampering but he got accustomed to the noise as one does to the ticking of a clock or to the roar of moving water and he became so immersed in his work that everything in the world except the problem which he was trying to solve passed away from him he suddenly looked up his problem was still unsolved and there was in the air that sense of the hour before the dawn which is so dread to doubtful life the noise of the rats had ceased indeed it seemed to him that it must have ceased but lately and that it was the sudden cessation which had disturbed him the fire had fallen low but it threw out a deep red glow and as he looked he started in spite of his sang froid there on the great high-backed carved oak chair by the right side of the fireplace sat an enormous rat steadily glaring at him with baleful eyes he made a motion to it as though to hunt it away but it did not stir then he made the motion of throwing something still it did not stir but showed its great white teeth angrily and its cruel eyes shone in the lamplight with an added vindictiveness malcolmson felt amazed and seizing the poker from the earth ran at it to kill it before however he could strike it the rat with a shriek that sounded like the concentration of hate jumped upon the floor and running up the rope of the alarm bell disappeared into the darkness beyond the range of the green-shaded lamp instantly strange to say the noisy scampering of the rats in the wainscot began again by this time malcolmson's mind was quite off the problem and as a shrill cock crow outside told him of the approach of morning he went to bed and to sleep he slept so sound that he was not even waked by mrs dempster coming in to make up his room it was only when she had tidied up the place and got his breakfast ready and tapped on the screen which closed in his bed that he woke he was a little tired still after his night's hard work but a strong cup of tea soon freshened him up and taking his book he went out for his morning walk bringing with him a few sandwiches lest he should not care to return till dinner-time he found a quiet walk between high elms some way outside the town and here he spent the greater part of the day studying his lapless on his return he looked in to see mrs witham and to thank her for her kindness when she saw him coming through the diamond-paned bay window of her sanctum she came out to meet him and asked him in she looked at him searchingly and shook her head as she said you must not overdo it sir you are paler this morning than you should be too late hours and too hard work on the brain isn't good for any man but tell me sir how did you pass the night well i hope but my heart sir i was glad when mrs dempster told me this morning that you were all right and sleeping sound when she went in oh i was all right he answered smiling the some things didn't worry me as yet only the rats and they had a circus i tell you all over the place there was one wicked-looking old devil that sat up on my own chair by the fire and wouldn't go until i took the poker to him and then he ran up the rope of the alarm bell and got to somewhere up the wall or the ceiling i couldn't see where it was so dark mercy on us said mrs witham 
an old devil and sitting on a chair by the fireplace take care sir take care there's many a true word spoken in jest how do you mean pardon my word i don't understand an old devil the old devil perhaps there sir you needn't laugh for malcolmson had broken into a hearty peal you young folks thinks it's easy to laugh at things that makes older ones shudder never mind sir never mind please god you'll laugh all the time that's what i wish you myself and the good lady beamed all over in sympathy with his enjoyment her fears gone for a moment oh forgive me said malcolmson presently don't think me rude but the idea was too much for me that the old devil himself was on the chair last night and at the thought he laughed again then he went home for dinner this evening the scampering of the rats began earlier indeed it had been going on before his arrival and only ceased whilst his presence by its freshness disturbed them after dinner he sat by the fire for a while and had a smoke and then having cleared his table began to work as before to-night the rats disturbed him more than they had done on the previous night how they scampered up and down and under and over how they squeaked and scratched and gnawed how they getting bolder by degrees came to the mouths of their holes and to the chinks and cracks and crannies of the wainscoting till their eyes shone like tiny lamps as the firelight rose and fell but to him now doubtless accustomed to them their eyes were not wicked only their playfulness touched him sometimes the boldest of them made sallies out on the floor or along the mouldings of the wainscot now and again as they disturbed him malcolmson made a sound to frighten them smiting the table with his hand or giving a fierce shh, shh, so that they fled straight away to their holes and so the early part of the night wore on and despite the noise malcolmson got more and more immersed in his work all at once he stopped as on the previous night being overcome by a sudden sense of silence there was not the faintest sound of a gnaw or scratch or squeak the silence was as of the grave he remembered the odd occurrence of the previous night and instinctively he looked at the chair standing close by the fireplace and then a very odd sensation thrilled through him there on the great old high-backed carved oak chair beside the fireplace sat the same enormous rat steadily glaring at him with his baleful eyes instinctively he took the nearest thing to his hand a book of logarithms and flung it at it the book was badly aimed and the rat did not stir so again the poker performance of the previous night was repeated and again the rat being closely pursued fled up the rope of the alarm bell strangely too the departure of this rat was instantly followed by the renewal of the noise made by the general rat community on this occasion as on the previous one malcolmson could not see at what part of the room the rat disappeared for the green shade of his lamp left the upper part of the room in darkness and the fire had burned low on looking at his watch he found it was close on midnight and not sorry for the divertisement he made up his fire and made himself his nightly pot of tea he had got through a good spell of work and thought himself entitled to a cigarette and so he sat on the great oak chair before the fire and enjoyed it whilst smoking he began to think that he would like to know where the rat disappeared to and for he had certain ideas for the morrow not entirely disconnected with a rat trap accordingly he lit another lamp and placed it so that it would shine well into the right-hand corner of the wall by the fireplace then he got all the books he had on him and placed them handy to throw out the vermin finally he lifted the rope of the alarm bell and placed it on the end of the table fixing the extreme end under the lamp as he handled it he could not help noticing how pliable it was especially for so strong a rope and one not in use you could hang a man with it he thought to himself when his preparations were made he looked around and said complacently there now my friend i think we shall learn something of you this time he began his work again and though as before somewhat disturbed by the noise of the rats soon lost himself in his propositions and problems again he was called to his immediate surroundings suddenly this time it might not have been the sudden silence only which took his attention there was a slight movement of the rope and the lamp moved without stirring he looked to see if his pile of books was within range and then cast his eye along the rope as he looked he saw the great rat drop from the rope on to the oak armchair and sit there glaring at him he raised a book in his right hand and taking careful aim flung it at the rat 
the latter with a quick movement sprang aside and dodged the missile then he took another book and a third and flung them one after the other at the rat but each time unsuccessfully at last as he stood with a book poised in his hand to throw the rat squeaked and seemed afraid this made malcolmson more than ever eager to strike and the book flew and struck the rat a resounding blow it gave a terrified squeak and turning on his pursuer a look of terrible malevolence ran up the chair back and made a great jump to the rope of the alarm bell and ran up it like lightning the lamp rocked under the sudden strain but it was a heavy one and did not topple over malcolmson kept his eyes on the rat and saw it by the light of the second lamp leap onto a moulding of the wainscot and disappear through a hole in one of the great pictures which hung on the wall obscured and invisible through its coating of dirt and dust i shall look up my friend's habitation in the morning said the student as he went over to collect his books the third picture from the fireplace i shall not forget he picked up the books one by one commenting on them as he lifted them conic sections he does not mind nor cycloidal oscillations nor the principia nor quaternions nor thermodynamics now for the book that fetched him malcolmson took it up and looked at it as he did so he started and a sudden pallor overspread his face he turned around uneasily and shivered slightly as he murmured to himself the bible my mother gave me what an odd coincidence he sat down to work again and the rats in the wainscot renewed their gambols they did not disturb him however somehow their presence gave him a sense of companionship but he could not attend to his work and after striving to master the subject on which he was engaged gave it up in despair and went to bed as the first streak of dawn stole in through the eastern window he slept heavily but uneasily and dreamed much and when mrs dempster woke him late in the morning he seemed ill at ease and for a few minutes did not seem to realize exactly where he was his first request rather surprised the servant mrs dempster when i am out to-day i wish you would get the steps and dust or wash those pictures especially the third one from the fireplace i want to see what they are late in the afternoon malcolmson worked at his books in the shaded walk and the cheerfulness of the previous day came back to him as the day wore on and he found that his reading was progressing well he had worked out to a satisfactory conclusion all the problems which had as yet baffled him and it was in a state of jubilation that he had paid a visit to mrs witham at the good traveller he found a stranger in the cosy sitting-room with the landlady who was introduced to him as dr thornhill she was not quite at ease and this combined with the doctor's plunging at once into a series of questions made malcolmson come to the conclusion that his presence was not an accident so without preliminary he said dr thornhill i shall with pleasure answer you any question you may choose to ask me if you will answer me one question first the doctor seemed surprised but he smiled and answered at once done what is it did mrs witham ask you to come here and see me and advise me dr thornhill for a moment was taken aback and mrs witham got fiery red and turned away but the doctor was a frank and ready man and he answered at once and openly she did but she didn't intend you to know it i suppose it was my clumsy haste that made you suspect she told me that she did not like the idea of your being in that house all by yourself and that she thought you took too much strong tea in fact she wants me to advise you if possible to give up the tea in the very late hours i was a keen student in my time so i suppose i may take the liberty of a college man and without offence advise you not quite as a stranger malcolmson with a bright smile held out his hand shake as they say in america he said i must thank you for your kindness and miss witham too and your kindness deserves a return on my part i promise to take no more strong tea no tea at all till you let me and i shall go to bed to-night at one o'clock at latest will that do capital said the doctor now tell us all that you noticed in the old house and so malcolmson then and there told in minute detail all that had happened in the last two nights he was interrupted every now and then by some exclamation from mrs witham till finally when he told the episode of the bible the landlady's pent-up emotions found vent in a shriek and it was not till a stiff glass of brandy and water had been administered that she grew composed again dr thornhill listened with a face of growing gravity and when the narrative was complete and mrs witham had been restored he asked the rat always went up the rope of the alarm bell always 
"'I suppose you know,' said the doctor after a pause. "'What the rope is?' "'No.' "'It is,' said the doctor slowly, "'the very rope which the hangman used for all the victims of the judge's judicial rancor.' Here he was interrupted by another scream from Mrs. Witham, and steps had to be taken for her recovery. Malcolmson, having looked at his watch and found that it was close to his dinner hour, had gone home before her complete recovery. When Mrs. Witham was herself again, she almost assailed the doctor with angry questions as to what he meant by putting such horrible ideas into the poor young man's mind. "'He has quite enough there already to upset him,' she added. Dr. Thornhill replied, "'My dear madam, I had a distinct purpose in it. I wanted to draw his attention to the bell rope and to fix it there.' It may be that he is in a highly overwrought state and has been studying too much, although I am bound to say that he seems as sound and healthy as a young man, mentally and bodily as I ever saw. But then the rats, in that suggestion of the devil. The doctor shook his head and went on. I would have offered to go and stay the first night with him, but that I felt sure it would have been a cause of offense. He may get in the night some strange fright or hallucination, and if he does, I want him to pull that rope. All alone as he is, it will give us warning, and we may reach him in time to be of service. I shall be sitting up pretty late tonight, and shall keep my ears open. Do not be alarmed if Benchurch gets its surprise before morning. Oh, doctor, what do you mean? What do you mean? I mean this, that possibly, nay, more probably, we shall hear the great alarm bell from the judge's house tonight. And the doctor made about as effective an exit as could be thought of. When Malcolmson arrived home, he found it was a little after his usual time, and Mrs. Dempster had gone away. The rules of Greenhow's charity were not to be neglected. He was glad to see that the place was bright and tidy, with a cheerful fire and a well-trimmed lamp. The evening was colder than might have been expected in April, and a heavy wind was blowing, with such rapidly increasing strength that there was every promise of a storm during the night. For a few minutes after his entrance, the noise of the rats ceased but so soon as they became accustomed to his presence they began again. He was glad to hear them, for he felt once more the feeling of companionship in their noise, and his mind ran back to the strange fact that they only ceased to manifest themselves when that other, the great rat with the baleful eyes, came upon the scene. The reading lamp only was lit, and its green shade kept the ceiling in the upper part of the room in darkness, so that the cheerful light from the earth was spreading over the floor and shining on the white cloth laid over the table was warm and cheery malcolmson sat down to his dinner with a good appetite and a buoyant spirit after his dinner and a cigarette he sat steadily down to work determined not to let anything disturb him for he remembered his promise to the doctor and made up his mind to make the best of the time at his disposal for an hour or so he worked all right and then his thoughts began to wander from his books the actual circumstances around him, the calls on his physical attention, and his nervous susceptibility were not to be denied. By this time the wind had become a gale, and the gale a storm. The old house, as solid as it was, seemed to shake to its foundations, and the storm roared and raged through its many chimneys and queer old gables, producing strange, unearthly sounds in the empty rooms and corridors. Even the great alarm bell on the roof must have felt the force of the wind, for the rope rose and fell slightly, as though the bell were moved a little from time to time, and the limber rope fell on the oak floor with a hard and hollow sound. As Malcolmson listened to it, he bethought himself of the doctor's words. It is the rope which the hangman used for the victims of the judge's judicial rancor. And he went over to the corner of the fireplace and took it in his hand to look at it. There seemed a sort of deadly interest in it and as he stood there he had lost himself for a moment in speculation as to who these victims were and the grim wish of the judge to have such a ghastly relic ever under his eyes as he stood there the swaying of the bell on the roof lifted the rope now and again but presently there came a new sensation a sort of tremor in the rope as though something was moving along it looking up instinctively malcolmson saw the great rat coming slowly down towards him glaring at him steadily he dropped the rope and started back with a muttered curse, and the rat turning ran up the rope again and disappeared. And at that same instant Malcolmson became conscious that the noise of the rats, which had ceased for a while, began again. All this set him thinking, and it occurred to him that he had not investigated the lair of the rat or looked at the pictures as he had intended. He lit the other lamp without the shade and, holding it up, 
went and stood opposite the third picture from the fireplace on the right-hand side where, ha where he had seen the rat disappear on the previous night. At the first glance he started back so suddenly that he had almost dropped the lamp, and a deadly pallor overspread his face. His knees shook, and the heavy drops of sweat came on his forehead, and he trembled like an aspen. But he was young and plucky, and pulled himself together, and after the pause of a few seconds stepped forward again, raised the lamp, and examined the picture which had been dusted and washed, and now stood out clearly. It was of a judge, dressed in his robes of scarlet and ermine. His face was strong and merciless, evil, crafty, and vindictive, with a sensual mouth, hooked nose of a ruddy color, and shaped like the beak of a bird of prey. The rest of his face was of a cadaverous color. The eyes were of peculiar brilliance and with a terribly ma malignant expression. As he looked at them, Malcolmson grew cold, for he saw there the very counterpart of the eyes of the great rat. The lamp almost fell from his hand. He saw the rat with its baleful eyes peering out through a hole in the corner of the picture, and noted the sudden cessation of the noise of the other rats. However, he pulled himself together and went on with his examination of the picture. The judge was seated in a great, high-backed, carved oak chair, and on the right-hand side of a great stone fireplace where, in the corner, a rope hung down from the ceiling, its end lying coiled on the floor. With a feeling of something like horror, Malcolmson recognized the scene of the room as it stood, and gazed around him in an awestruck manner as though he expected to find some strange presence behind him. He looked over to the corner of the fireplace, and with a loud cry he let the lamp fall from his hand. There, in the judge's armchair, with the rope hanging behind, sat the rat with the judge's baleful eyes, now intensified and with a fiendish leer. Save for the howling of the storm, without there was silence. The fallen lamp recalled Malcolmson to himself. Fortunately, it was of metal, and so the oil was not spilt. However, the practical need of attending to it settled at once his nervous apprehensions. When he had turned it out, he wiped his brow and thought for a moment. This will not do, he said to himself. If I go on like this, I shall become a crazy fool. This must stop. I promised the doctor I would not take tea. Faith, he was pretty right. My nerves must have been getting into a queer state. Funny I did not notice it. I never felt better in my life. However, it is all right now, and I shall not be such a fool again. Then he mixed himself a good stiff glass of brandy and water and resolutely sat down to his work. It was nearly an hour when he looked up from his book, disturbed by the sudden stillness. Without, the wind howled and roared louder than ever, and the rain drove in sheets against the windows, beating like hail on the glass. But within there was no sound whatever, save the echo of the wind as it roared in the great chimney, and now and then a hiss as a few raindrops found their way down the chimney in a lull of the storm. The fire had fallen low and had ceased to flame, though it threw out a red glow. Malcolmson listened attentively, and presently heard a thin, squeaking noise, very faint. It came from the corner of the room where the rope hung down, and he thought it was the creaking of the rope on the floor as the swaying of the bell raised and lowered it. Looking up, however, he saw in the dim light the great rat clinging to the rope and gnawing it. The rope was already nearly gnawed through. He could see the lighter color where the strands were laid bare, and as he looked, the job was completed and the severed end of the rope fell clattering on the oaken floor, whilst for an instant the great rat remained like a knob or tassel at the end of the rope, which now began to sway to and fro. Malcolmson felt for a moment another pang of terror as he thought that now the possibility of calling the outer world to his assistance was cut off, but an intense anger took its place, and seizing the book he was reading he hurled it at the rat. The blow was well aimed, but before the missile could reach him, the rat dropped off and struck the floor with a soft thud. Malcolmson instantly rushed over towards him, but it darted away and disappeared in the darkness of the shadows of the room. Malcolmson felt that his work was over for the night, and determined then and there to vary the monotony of the proceedings by a hunt for the rat, and took off the green shade of the lamp as to ensure a wider spreading light. As he did so, the gloom of the upper part of the room was relieved from where he stood, Malcolmson saw, right opposite to him, the third picture on the wall from the right of the fireplace. He rubbed his eyes in surprise, and then a great fear began to come upon him. In the center of the picture was a great irregular patch of brown canvas, as fresh as when it was stretched on the frame. The background was as before, with chair and chimney corner and rope, but the figure of the judge had disappeared. 
Malcolmson, almost in a chill of horror, turned slowly around, and then he began to shake and tremble like a man in a palsy. His strength seemed to have left him, and he was incapable of action or movement, hardly even of thought. He could only see and hear. There, on the great high-backed carved oak chair, sat the judge in his robes of scarlet and ermine, with his baleful eyes glaring vindictively, and with a smile of triumph on the resolute, cruel mouth as he lifted with his hands a black cap. Malcolmson felt as if the blood was running from his heart, as one does in moments of prolonged suspense. There was a singing in his ears. Without, he could hear the roar and howl of the tempest, and, through it, swept on the storm, came the striking of the midnight by the great chimes in the marketplace. He stood for a space in time that seemed to him endless, still as a statue, and with wide-open, horror-struck eyes, breathless. As the clock struck, so the smile of triumph on the judge's face intensified, and at the last stroke of midnight he placed the black cap on his head. Slowly and deliberately the judge rose from his chair and picked up the piece of rope of the alarm bell which lay on the floor, drew it through his hands as if he enjoyed its touch, and then deliberately began to knot one end of it, fashioning it into a noose. This he tightened and tested with his foot, pulling hard at it till he was satisfied, and then making a running noose of it, which he held in his hand. Then he began to move along the table on the opposite side to Malcolmson, keeping his eyes on him until he had passed him, when, with a quick movement, he stood in front of the door. Malcolmson then began to feel that he was trapped, and tried to think of what he should do. There was some fascination in the judge's eyes, which he never took off him, and he had perforce to look. He saw the judge approach, still keeping between him and the door, and raise the noose and throw it towards him as if to entangle him. With a great effort he made a quick movement to one side, and saw the rope fall beside him, and heard it strike the oaken floor. Again the judge raised the noose and tried to ensnare him, ever keeping his baleful eyes fixed on him, and each time, by a mighty effort, the student just managed to evade it. So this went on for many times, the judge seeming never discouraged nor discomposed at failure, but playing as a cat does with a mouse. At last, in despair, which had reached its climax, Malcolmson cast a quick glance around him. The lamp seemed to have blazed up, and there was a fairly good light in the room. At the many rat holes and in the chinks and crannies of the wainscot he saw the rat's eyes, and this aspect that was purely physical gave him a gleam of comfort. He looked around and saw that the rope of the great alarm bell was laden with rats. Every inch of it was covered with them, and more and more were pouring through the small circular hole in the ceiling whence it emerged, so that with their weight the bell was beginning to sway. Hark! It had swayed till the clapper had touched the bell. The sound was but a tiny one, but the bell was only beginning to sway, and it would increase. At the sound the judge, who had been keeping his eyes fixed on Malcolmson, looked up, and a scowl of diabolical anger overspread his face. His eyes fairly glowed like hot coals, and he stamped his foot with a sound that seemed to make the house shake. A dreadful peal of thunder broke overhead as he raised the rope again, whilst the rats kept running up and down the rope as though working against time. This time, instead of throwing it, he drew close to his victim, and held open the noose as he approached. As he came closer, there seemed something paralyzing in his very presence, and Malcolmson stood rigid as a corpse. He felt the judge's icy fingers touch his throat as he adjusted the rope. The noose tightened, tightened. Then the judge, taking the rigid form of the student in his arms, carried him over and placed him standing in the oak chair, and stepping up beside him, put his hand up and caught the end of the swaying rope of the alarm bell. As he raised his hand, the rats fled, squeaking, and disappeared through the hole in the ceiling. Taking the end of the noose, which was round Malcolmson's neck, he tied it to the hanging bell rope, and then, descending, pulled away the chair. When the alarm bell of the judge's house began to sound, a crowd soon assembled. Lights and torches of various kinds appeared, and soon a silent crowd was hurrying to the spot. They knocked loudly at the door, but there was no reply. And then they burst in the door, and poured into the great dining room, the doctor at the head. There, at the end of the rope of the great alarm bell, hung the body of the student, and the face of the judge in the picture was a malignant smile. End of The Judge's House
Midnight Black by Hamilton Craigie From Weird Tales, May, 1923 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Midnight Black by Hamilton Craigie Rita Daventry sat bolt upright in her bed, her ears strained against the singing silence, breath indrawn sharply through her parted lips. There had been no sound, save as a sound heard in dreams. But as she sat there, rigid, tense, in the thick darkness, leaning forward a little in the great bed, she was certain that she was not alone. Someone or something was in the room. The blackness was like an invisible wall. It pressed upon her eyelids now, like a gigantic and smothering hand. And then, all at once, she heard it, the brief clink of metal upon metal, a rustle, like the flicker of a wind-blown leaf. Simply by reaching forth her hand, she could have pressed the wall switch, flooding that midnight blackness with the blazing effulgence of the electrolier, but she could not. Eyes strained against that velvet black, she crouched now, in the immensity of the great bed, the silken case of the sheets turned suddenly to ice, her pulse hammering to the tension of her hard-held breath. There, in the stifling dark, there came a clanking, a whirring, as of wings invisible. Then, from the wall clock, there boomed twelve heavy strokes. Midnight. She heard the slow tick-tock of the steady beat. And then, of a sudden, she heard something else, the muffled ticking of a watch. The sound was not loud. It came to her as through walls of silence. But it was nearer now. She was certain of it. The door was closed. It was a heavy, soundproof affair. The intruder, whoever he might be, had entered by the window. Rita Daventry knew that he was armed and desperate desperate with the cold courage of a cornered grizzly, a housebreaker who, if attacked, would shoot his way out, reckless of consequences. To such a man, murder, as the price of his liberty, would be a little thing, and with the thought she stiffened, her mouth opened to release a scream, at the first sound of which she knew aid would come unthinking, swift, reckless, too, in its first fury of intrepid action. But she would not summon that scream. On the floor above, her husband was working, now, in his laboratory. But the man below would have the advantage of the midnight black. With the opening of the door, he would shoot him down with a ruthless, cold, cruelty of a wolf. But that was not all the reason. To Rita Daventry alone now, with this invisible menace of the dark, there had come, on the sudden, a thought to freeze her blood, the thought of Ronald Armitage. It had been only the night before, at a studio tea, that Armitage had made the threat, or the promise, that came to her now, with a sudden, cold, prevision of tragedy. Armitage was young, reckless, debonair, of an engaging manner with women, and Rita had encouraged him. Well, just a little, she told herself. It was a fascinating game, in the playing. The paying, that would be another matter. 
and as if the words had been spoken in her ear, she was hearing now the smooth voice, thickened at trifle with his potations, with that faintly roughened, passionate undertone. Daventry doesn't care, does he? Why should you? I tell you, Rita, you've gotten into my blood. Some night between you and me, the witching hour, ah? Huh? I promise you, I'll be there, and you won't have to look to find me. The handsome, dissipated face had come close to hers. There had been a menace in the tone as well as the caress. And the fact that the man had been, well, not himself, could not condone. The noise, the lights, the music upon which, dancing together, they had floated, as on languorous, steep waves of sound and motion could not condone. Rita had had no excuse, save the oft-repeated, sophisticated sophistry of the last time, this will be the very last. And she had gone on, protesting, if at all, with half-mutinous, wholly unconsidered coquetry, which, at the last, had led to this. Ronald Armitage had the reputation of being something of a blood. The Armitages had sowed and reaped, and as young Ronald, it was said, he would stop at nothing for the accomplishment of his desires. And now, alone in that vast bed, hearing again that stealthy movement by the window. The girl checked again sharply in the act of reaching forth her hand. With her finger upon the button, she froze, rigid, as that smooth, stealthy advance moved closer. There came a fumbling at the footboard. She heard the sound, like a faint rubbing whisper, of naked fingers sliding upon polished wood. But the night was moonless, black emptiness. The bedchamber was like a tomb of blackness, dark as a wolf's throat, and yet alive with movement, with a tension drawn like a fine wire, singing at a pitch too low for sound. At any moment, too, Daventry might come down. He was a careful man, who guarded his house and the treasure therein with a meticulous observance, and sitting there, waiting, nerves at pitch, Rita Daventry tasted to the full the fruits of her single indiscretion. As between Armitage and her husband, she knew now beyond preadventure whom it was she loved, and with a love, as she knew now, fierce and protective, desirous above all of the safety, the life, indeed, of the toiler on the second floor. Armitage had never been in her bedchamber, of course, although he knew its location, had seen it from the outside, walking with Daventry through the corridor without. But in the darkness strange tricks are played with one's sense of direction. The room was a large one, lofty, high-ceilinged. Its rear windows opened upon a service alley, and it had been by means of this alley that the midnight intruder had made entrance. She could hear him now a little better, his breathing, hard-held, and yet rising to that peculiar, stentorous quality that was almost like a snuffling, a quick, eager panting, as of a hound questing his quarry in the dark. If Armitage had been drinking, but then he must have been, or he would scarcely have made good his threat. Daventry, though a studious, careful man, was a lion when amused, and he would shoot, and shoot straight. And if the two should meet there in the midnight black, it would be grim tragedy for one or both. Tragedy with none for witness save that pale girl 
new risen from her couch of dreams, wide-eyed, her gaze fixed now on the sightless staring upon the black well of the night. And then, as she shrank backward against the pillows, there came a thumping clatter, a thick whispered oath, and a following silence that was more terrible than any sound. He was coming now, around the footboard, along the side of the bed. She felt rather than heard that fumbling, stealthy advance, the fingers feeling along the counterpane, the noiseless pad-pad of feet deadened by the thick pile of the Carmenshaw rug. In imagination she could almost see the face, flushed now, bemused with drink, the leering parted mouth. The scream, lodged in her throat now, seemed like a bird breaking against bars. In a moment the silence would be ripped from end to end, as the sheet was ripped from point to point with the tearing impact of that scream, rising heavenward with the first defiling touch of those groping fingers. Armitage's face on that evening had been the face of a satyr, high-colored, the nose sharpened to a point of greed, the eyes in a wide, avid staring upon the perfect curve of her shoulders, her neck. And she had encouraged him with by-play of hand and eye, speech in a low, rich contralto, dealing in double meanings that yet had no meaning, glancing provocatively, plumbing the depths of his, for this. In that moment Rita Daventry knew fear, the primal fear of a woman whose very protection has become her peril, the peril of the abyss. And it was then that she heard it, like a summons of doom, the sound of heavy footsteps from the room above. The footsteps were coming down now. They beat hollowly against the iron treads of the staircase with rapid thunder. Robert Daventry was coming, leaping downward now, to meet the death that waited for him behind that closed door, or to deal it to a man who, somewhere in that smothering dark, crouched, automatic ready, waiting for the man who was coming on the wings of death. After all, her husband might not have heard the thumping clatter. All unknowing, he might be rushing downward to meet an ambush, unsuspected and unknown. And that Armitage would shoot, the woman was convinced, for he would put but one construct upon the headlong descent. Daventry had heard him, knew that he was there, like a thief in the night a marauder, an outlaw, meriting the swift justice of a bullet. And then, all at once, the steps ceased. A silence grew, and held, that was like a silence before storm, so that, to the woman upon the bed, it seemed that she abode in a vacuum of sound and silence, brooding upon the night in a volcanic, breathless calm. It must be a nightmare that would pass, a waking dream that would presently dissolve in the sanity of peaceful slumber. She strove, as a drowning swimmer fathoms deep in dreams, to scream a warning, a command to the man, her man, silent now upon the threshold of life or of death but she could not. And presently, how she could not have told. She knew that, where before there had been one dim presence in the bedroom chamber, now there were two. She had heard nothing, seen nothing, felt nothing, neither the opening nor the closing of the heavy door, 
no faintest sound of breathing the silence held borrowing attention from the electric air remote as though many thicknesses of wall there came to her now as from the world removed the night noises of the city muted by distance to a vague shadow of clamor faint and far and that velvet black before her was as she knew most terribly endowed with motion sinister alive awaiting merely the spark the pressure of a rigid finger upon trigger the touch of hand against hand the faintest whisper of a sound to dissolve in a chaos of red ruin and with it the ruin of her world abruptly again she heard the muffled ticking this time close at hand and with it as she fancied the faint breath of a man but even as she heard it it receded died there came a faint smack of metal upon metal like the snick and slither of a steel blade it was followed by a sort of chugging impact like the sound of a knife sheathed home say at the base of a man's brain or between the shoulders a sound to freeze the blood that armitage could have been capable of this she could not believe but upon the thought her flesh crawled abruptly at the thought of the invisible duelists but one remained now and he was coming toward her she fancied she could hear the faint scarce audible footfalls on the thick pile of the rug and then the silence was abruptly broken by a shattering crash the intruder unfamiliar with the room's interior had swept a great vase from the mantel and then distant and clear she heard the sodden impact of fist on flesh a heavy grunt the lift and strain of heavy bodies close locked and following this in a sudden fury all round the room the pictures rattled in their frames the flooring shook a heavy desk went over in a smashing ruin grunts followed in the straining shock of big men in a death grapple but mostly it was a fight in silence and darkness with the quick hard breathing of men at the last desperate urge of their spent strength with her finger again upon the light switch again she hesitated and in that flash of time she heard all at once a quick sobbing breath a groan then silence somewhere out there in that midnight blackness her husband might be lying wounded dead above him the beast whom she had known as ronald the debonair turning his face now toward the girl who shivering and defenseless crouched forlorn upon the bed but even as this fresh horror out of the dark assailed her there came a heavy crash another the barking rattle of an automatic the quick flashes stabbing into the murk to the right and left the roaring crashes beat upon her ears like a toxin of doom and then in answer three answering shots deliberate slow with them there came the slumping fall of a heavy body and the labored breathing of a man the duel was over for a moment the silence held dreading what the coming of the light might reveal her finger hovering above the push-button came away then with an agony of effort made a darting thrust as the light sprang to full flower she looked with white face 
and staring eyes upon the tall figure in the doorway. It was Robert Daventry. But her hysterical, clad cry was stifled in her throat as her husband, bending forward over the rug, turned over the dead man with his foot. Fearful, yet eager to see, she rose upon her knees, peering with wide eyes over the footboard. Then hysteria seized her with, by turns, a sudden storm of mingled weeping and frantic laughter. That, she cried, pointing a shaking finger at the still figure on the carpet. And then, oh, my God, it might have been. But Daventry, gazing with a grim face at the rigid figure of the housebreaker, the unclean skin with its bristly stubble of unshaven chin, blue now under the lights, thought it merely a natural reaction of the terrific strain which she had undergone. You mean it might have been me, he said slowly. Well, of course. Of course, dear, lied Rita Daventry with a misty smile. The End of Midnight Black by Hamilton Craigie The Moon Bog by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames. The Moon Bog by H. P. Lovecraft. Somewhere, to what remote and fearsome region I know not, Dennis Barry has gone. I was with him the last night he lived among men, and heard his screams when the thing came to him. But all the peasants and police in County Meath could never find him, or the others, though they searched long and far. And now I shudder when I hear the frogs piping in swamps, or see the moon in lonely places. I had known Dennis Barry well in America, where he had grown rich, and had congratulated him when he bought back the old castle by the bog at sleepy Kilderry. It was from Kilderry that his father had come, and it was there that he wished to enjoy his wealth among ancestral scenes. Men of his blood had once ruled over Kilderry, and built and dwelt in the castle, but those days were very remote so that for generations the castle had been empty and decaying. After he went to Ireland, Barry wrote me often, and told me how under his care the grey castle was rising tower by tower to its ancient splendour, how the ivy was climbing slowly over the restored walls as it had climbed so many centuries ago, and how the peasants blessed him for bringing back the old days with his gold from over the sea. But in time there came troubles, and the peasants ceased to bless him, and fled away instead as from a doom. And then he sent a letter and asked me to visit him, for he was lonely in the castle with no one to speak to save the new servants and labourers he had brought from the north. The bog was the cause of all these troubles, as Barry told me the night I came to the castle. I had reached Kilderry in the summer sunset, as the gold of the sky lighted the green of the hills and groves and the blue bog, where on a far islet a strange olden ruin glistened spectrally. That sunset was very beautiful, but the peasants at Ballyloch had warned me against it, and said that Kilderry had become accursed, so that I almost shuddered to see the high turrets of the castle gilded with fire. Barry's motor had met me at the Ballyloch station, for Kilderry is off the railway. The villagers had shunned the car and the driver from the north, but had whispered to me with pale faces when they saw I was going to Kilderry. And that night, after our reunion, Barry told me why. 
The peasants had gone from Kilderry because Dennis Barry was to drain the great bog. For all his love of Ireland, America had not left him untouched, and he hated the beautiful wasted space where peat might be cut and land opened up. The legends and superstitions of Kilderry did not move him, and he laughed when peasants first refused to help, and then cursed him, and went away to buy Loch with their few belongings, as they saw his determination. In their place he sent for labourers from the north, and when the servants left he replaced them likewise. But it was lonely among strangers, so Barry had asked me to come. When I heard the fears which had driven the people from Kilderry, I laughed as loudly as my friend had laughed, for these fears were of the vaguest, wildest, and most absurd character. They had to do with some preposterous legend of the bog, and of a grim guardian spirit that dwelt in the strange olden ruin on the far islet I had seen in the sunset. There were tales of dancing lights in the dark of the moon, and of chill winds when the night was warm, of wraiths in white hovering over the waters, and of an imagined city of stone deep down below the swampy surface. But foremost among the weird fancies, and alone in its absolute unanimity, was that of the curse awaiting him who should dare to touch or drain the vast reddish morass. There were secrets, said the peasants, which must not be uncovered, secrets that had lain hidden since the plague came to the children of Partholan, in the fabulous years beyond history. In the Book of Invaders it is told that these sons of the Greeks were all buried at Tala. But old men in Kilderi said that one city was overlooked save by its patron moon goddess, so that only the wooded hills buried it when the men of Nemed swept down from Scythia in their thirty ships. Such were the idle tales which had made the villagers leave Kilderi and when I heard them I did not wonder that Dennis Barry had refused to listen. He had, however, a great interest in antiques, and proposed to explore the bog thoroughly when it was drained. The white ruins on the islet he had often visited, but though their age was plainly great, and their contour very little like that of most ruins in Ireland, they were too dilapidated to tell the days of their glory. Now the work of drainage was ready to begin, and the labourers from the north were soon to strip the forbidden bog of its green moss and red heather, and kill the tiny shell-paved streamlets and quiet blue pools fringed with rushes. After Barry had told me these things I was very drowsy, for the travels of the day had been wearying and my host had talked late into the night. A manservant showed me to my room, which was in a remote tower overlooking the village and the plain at the edge of the bog and the bog itself, so that I could see from my windows in the moonlight the silent roofs from which the peasants had fled, and which now sheltered the labourers from the north, and, too, the parish church with its antique spire and far out across the brooding bog the remote olden ruin on the islet, gleaming white and spectral. Just as I dropped to sleep, I fancied I heard faint sounds from the distance, sounds that were wild and half-musical, and stirred in me a weird excitement which coloured my dreams. But when I awaked next morning, I felt it had all been a dream, for the visions I had seen were more wonderful than any sound of wild pipes in the night. Influenced by the legends that Barry had related, my mind had in slumber hovered around a stately city in a green valley, where marble streets and statues, villas and temples, carvings and inscriptions, all spoke in certain tones of the glory that was Greece. When I told this dream to Barry we both laughed but I laughed the louder because he was perplexed about his labourers from the north. For the sixth time 
they had overslept, waking very slowly and dazedly, and acting as if they had not rested, although they were known to have gone early to bed the night before. That morning and afternoon I wandered alone through the sun-gilded village, and talked now and then with idle labourers, for Barry was busy with the final plans of beginning his work of drainage. The labourers were not as happy as they might have been, for most of them seemed uneasy over some dream which they had had, yet which they tried in vain to remember. I told them of my dream, but they were not interested till I spoke of the weird sounds I thought I had heard. Then they looked oddly at me, and said that they seemed to remember weird sounds too. In the evening Barry dined with me and announced that he would begin the drainage in two days. For although I disliked to see the moss and the heather and the little streams and lakes depart, I had a growing wish to discern the ancient secrets the deep matted peat might hide. And that night my dreams of piping flutes and marble peristyles came to a sudden and disquieting end, for upon the city in the valley I saw a pestilence descend, and then a frightful avalanche of wooded slopes that covered the dead bodies in the streets, and left unburied only the temple of Artemis on the high peak, where the aged moon priestess Cleis lay cold and silent with a crown of ivory on her silver head. I have said that I waked suddenly and in alarm. For some time I could not tell whether I was waking or sleeping, for the sound of flutes still rang shrilly in my ears, but when I saw on the floor the icy moonbeams and the outlines of latticed Gothic window, I decided I must be awake and in the castle at Kilderry. Then I heard a clock from some remote landing below strike the hour of two, and I knew I was awake. Yet still there came that monotonous piping from afar, wild, weird airs that made me think of some dance of fauns on distant minorless. It would not let me sleep, and in impatience I sprang up and paced the floor. Only by chance did I go to the north window and look out upon the silent village and the plain at the edge of the bog. I had no wish to gaze abroad, for I wanted to sleep, but the flutes tormented me, and I had to do or see something. How could I have suspected the thing I was to behold? There in the moonlight that flooded the spacious plain was a spectacle which no mortal, having seen it, could ever forget. To the sound of reedy pipes that echoed over the bog there glided silently and eerily a mixed throng of swaying figures, reeling through such a revel as the Sicilians may have danced to Demeter in the old days under the harvest moon beside the Sion. The wide plain, the golden moonlight, the shadowy moving forms, and above all the shrill monotonous piping, produced an effect which almost paralysed me. Yet I noted amidst my fear that half of these tireless mechanical dancers were the labourers whom I had thought asleep, whilst the other half were strange airy beings in white, half indeterminate in nature but suggesting pale, wistful naiads from the haunted fountains of the bog. I do not know how long I gazed at this sight from the lonely turret window before I dropped suddenly in a dreamless swoon out of which the high sun of morning aroused me. My first impulse on awaking was to communicate all my fears and observations to Dennis Barry but as I saw the sunlight glowing through the latticed east window, I became sure that there was no reality in what I thought I had seen. I am given to strange phantasms, yet am never weak enough to believe in them, so on this occasion contented myself with questioning the labourers, who slept very late and recalled nothing of the previous night save misty dreams of shrill sounds. 
This matter of the spectral piping harassed me greatly, and I wondered if the crickets of autumn had come before their time to vex the night and haunt the visions of men. Later in the day I watched Barry in the library, poring over his plans for the great work which was to begin on the morrow, and for the first time felt a touch of the same kind of fear that had driven the peasants away. For some unknown reason I dreaded the thought of disturbing the ancient bog and its sunless secrets, and pictured terrible sights lying black under the unmeasured depth of age-old peat. That these secrets should be brought to light seemed injudicious, and I began to wish for an excuse to leave the castle and the village. I went so far as to talk casually to Barry on the subject, but did not dare to continue after he gave his resounding laugh. So I was silent when the sun set fulgently over the far hills, and Kilderry blazed all red and gold in a flame that seemed a portent. Whether the events of that night were of reality or illusion, I shall never ascertain. Certainly they transcended anything we dream of in nature and the universe. Yet in no normal fashion can I explain those disappearances which were known to all men after it was over. I retired early and full of dread, and for a long time could not sleep in the uncanny silence of the tower. It was very dark, for although the sky was clear the moon was now well in the wane, and would not rise till the small hours. I thought as I lay there of Dennis Barry, and what would befall the bog when the day came, and found myself almost frantic with an impulse to rush out into the night, take Barry's car, and drive madly to Bariloch, out of the menaced lands. But before my fears could crystallize into action, I had fallen asleep, and gazed in dreams upon the city in the valley, cold and dead, under a shroud of hideous shadow. Probably it was the shrill piping that awaked me, yet that piping was not what I noticed first when I opened my eyes. I was lying with my back to the east window overlooking the bog, where the waning moon would rise, and therefore expected to see light cast on the opposite wall before me. But I had not looked for such a light as now appeared. Light indeed glowed on the panels ahead, but it was not any light that the moon gives. Terrible and piercing was the shaft of ruddy refulgence that streamed through the Gothic window and the whole chamber was brilliant with a splendour intense and unearthly. My immediate actions were peculiar for such a situation, but it is only in tales that a man does the dramatic and foreseen thing. Instead of looking out across the bog toward the source of the new light, I kept my eyes from the window in panic fear, and clumsily drew on my clothing with some dazed idea of escape. I remember seeing my revolver and hat, but before it was over I had lost them both without firing the one or donning the other. After a time the fascination of the red radiance overcame my fright, and I crept to the east window and looked out, whilst the maddening incessant piping whined and reverberated through the castle and over all the village. Over the bog was a deluge of flaring light, scarlet and sinister, and pouring from the strange olden ruin on the far islet. The aspect of that ruin I cannot describe. I must have been mad, for it seemed to rise majestic and undecayed, splendid and column-cinctured, the flame reflecting marble of its entablature piercing the sky like the apex of a temple on a mountain top. Flutes shrieked, and drums began to beat, and as I watched in awe and terror I thought I saw dark, salient forms silhouetted grotesquely against the vision of marble and effulgence. The effect was titanic, altogether unthinkable, and I might have stared indefinitely had not the sound of the piping seemed to grow stronger at my left. Trembling with a terror oddly mixed with ecstasy, 
I crossed the circular room to the north window from which I could see the village and the plain at the edge of the bog. There my eyes dilated again, with a wild wonder as great as if I had not just turned from a scene beyond the pale of nature. For on the ghastly red-litten plain was moving a procession of beings in such a manner as none ever saw before, save in nightmares. Half gliding, half floating in the air, the white-clad bog-wraiths were slowly retreating toward the still waters and the island ruin, in fantastic formations suggesting some ancient and solemn ceremonial dance. Their waving, translucent arms, guided by the detestable piping of those unseen flutes, beckoned in an uncanny rhythm to a throng of lurching labourers, who followed dog-like with blind, brainless, floundering steps as if dragged by a clumsy but resistless demon will. As the naiads neared the bog without haltering their course, a new line of stumbling stragglers zigzagged drunkenly out of the castle from some door far below my window, groped sightlessly across the courtyard and through the intervening bit of village, and joined the floundering column of labourers on the plain. Despite their distance below me, I at once knew they were the servants brought from the north, for I recognised the ugly and unwieldy form of the cook, whose very absurdness had now become unutterably tragic. The flutes piped horribly, and again I heard the beating of the drums from the direction of the island ruin. Then, silently and gracefully, the naiads reached the water, and melted, one by one, into the ancient bog, while the line of followers, never checking their speed, splashed awkwardly after them, and vanished amidst a tiny vortex of unwholesome bubbles, which I could barely see in the scarlet light and as the last pathetic straggler, the fat cook, sank heavily out of sight in that sullen pool, the flutes and the drums grew silent, and then the blinding rays from the ruins snapped instantaneously out, leaving the village of doom, lone and desolate, in the wan beams of a new-risen moon. My condition was now one of indescribable chaos, not knowing whether I was mad or sane, sleeping or waking. I was saved only by a merciful numbness. I believe I did ridiculous things such as offering prayers to Artemis, Latona, Demeter, Persephone, and Pluton. All that I recalled of a classic youth came to my lips as the horrors of the situation roused my deepest superstitions. I felt that I had witnessed the death of a whole village, and knew I was alone in the castle with Dennis Barry, whose boldness had brought down a doom. As I thought of him, new terrors convulsed me, and I fell to the floor, not fainting, but physically helpless. Then I felt the icy blast from the east window, where the moon had risen, and began to hear the shrieks in the castle far below me. Soon those shrieks had attained a magnitude and quality which cannot be written of, and which make me faint as I think of them. All I can say is that they came from something I had known as a friend. At some time during this shocking period, the cold wind and the screaming must have roused me, for my next impression is of racing madly through inky rooms and corridors, and out across the courtyard into the hideous night. They found me at dawn wandering mindless near Ballyloch, but what unhinged me utterly was not any of the horrors I had seen or heard before. What I muttered about, as I came slowly out of the shadows, was a pair of fantastic incidents which occurred in my flight. Incidents of no significance, yet which haunt me unceasingly, when I am alone in certain marshy places, or in the moonlight. As I fled from that accursed castle, along the bog's edge, I heard a new sound, common, yet unlike any I had heard before at Kilderry. 
The stagnant waters, lately quite devoid of animal life, now teemed with a horde of slimy enormous frogs, which piped shrilly and incessantly in tones strangely out of keeping with their size. They glistened bloated and green in the moonbeams, and seemed to gaze up at a fount of light. I followed the gaze of one very fat and ugly frog, and saw the second of the things which drove my senses away. Stretching directly from the strange olden ruin on the far islet to the waning moon, my eyes seemed to trace a beam of faint quivering radiance, having no reflection in the waters of the bog, and upward along that pallid path my fevered fancy pictured a thin shadow slowly writhing, a vague contorted shadow struggling as if drawn by unseen demons. Crazed as I was, I saw in that awful shadow a monstrous resemblance, a nauseous, unbelievable caricature, a blasphemous effigy of him who had been Dennis Barry. End of The Moonbog by H. P. Lovecraft Recording by Andy Sames The Mysterious Head From Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio By Liu Shi Pu Translated and Annotated By Herbert A. Giles This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Dale Grothman The Mysterious Head by Liu Shi Pu. Several traders who were lodging at an inn in Peking occupied a room which was divided from the adjoining apartment by a partition of boards, from which a piece was missing, leaving an aperture about as big as a basin. Suddenly a girl's head appeared through the opening, with very pretty features and nicely dressed hair and the next moment an arm as white as polished jade the traders were much alarmed and thinking it was the work of devils tried to seize the head which however was quickly drawn in again out of their reach this happened a second time and then as they could see no body belonging to the head one of them took a knife in his hand and crept up against the partition underneath the hole. In a little while the head reappeared. When he made a chop at it and cut it off, the blood spurting out all over the floor and wall. The traders hurried off to tell the landlord, who immediately reported the matter to the authorities, taking the head with him, and the traders were forthwith arrested and examined. But the magistrate could make nothing of the case, and as no one appeared for the prosecution, the accused, after about six months' incarceration, were accordingly released, and orders were given for the girl's head to be buried. The End of The Mysterious Head By Liu Shi Pu Out of the Storm by William Hope Hodgson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker Out of the Storm by William Hope Hodgson Hush, said my friend the scientist as I walked into his laboratory. I had opened my lips to speak, but stood silent for a few minutes at his request. He was sitting at his instrument, and the thing was tapping out a message in a curiously irregular fashion, stopping a few seconds, then going on at a furious pace. It was during a somewhat longer-than-usual pause that, growing slightly impatient, I ventured to address him. "'Anything important?' I asked. "'For God's sake, shut up!' he answered back in a high, strained voice. 
I stared. I am used to pretty abrupt treatment from him at times when he is much engrossed in some particular experiment. But this was going a little too far, and I said so. He was writing, and for reply, he pushed several loosely written sheets over to me with the one curt word, Read! With a sense half of anger, half of curiosity, I picked up the first and glanced at it. After a few lines, I was gripped and held securely by a morbid interest. I was reading a message from one in the last extremity. I will give it word for word. John, we are sinking. I wonder if you really understand what I feel at the present time. You sitting comfortably in your laboratory, I out here upon the waters, already one among the dead. Yes, we are doomed. There is no such thing as help in our case. We are sinking, steadily, remorselessly. God, I must keep up and be a man. I need not tell you that I am in the operator's room. All the rest are on deck, or dead in the hungry thing which is smashing the ship to pieces. I do not know where we are, and there is no one of whom I can ask. The last of the officers was drowned nearly an hour ago, and the vessel is now little more than a sort of breakwater for the giant seas. Once, about half an hour ago, I went out onto the deck. My God, the sight was terrible. It is a little after midday, but the sky is the color of mud. Do you understand? Gray mud. Down from it there hang vast lappets of clouds. Not such clouds as I have ever before seen, but monstrous, mildewed-looking holes. They show solid, save where the frightful wind tears their lower edges into great feelers that twirl savagely above us, like the tentacles of some enormous horror. Such a sight is difficult to describe to the living, though the dead of the sea know of it without words of mine. It is such a sight that none is allowed to see and live. It is a picture for the doomed and the dead, one of the sea's hell orgies, one of the thing's monstrous gloatings over the living. Say the alive in death, those upon the brink. I have no right to tell of it to you. To speak of it to one of the living is to initiate innocence into one of the infernal mysteries, to talk of foul things to a child. Yet I care not. I will expose, in all its hideous nakedness, the death side of the sea. The undoomed living shall know some of the things that death has hitherto so well guarded. Death knows not of this little instrument beneath my hands that connects me still with the quick, else would he haste to quiet me. Hark you, John, I have learnt undreamt of things in this little time of waiting. I know now why we are afraid of the dark. I had never imagined such secrets of the sea and the grave, which are one and the same. Listen! Ah, but I was forgetting you cannot hear. I can. The sea is... Hush! The sea is laughing, as though hell cackled from the mouth of an ass. It is jeering. I can hear its voice echo like satanic thunder amid the mud overhead. It is calling to me. Oh, I must go. The sea calls. Oh, God, art thou indeed God? Canst thou sit above and watch calmly that which I have just seen? Nay, thou art no God. Thou art weak and puny beside this foul thing which thou didst create in thy lusty youth. It is now, God, and I am one of its children. Are you there, John? Why don't you answer? Listen. I ignore God, for there is a stronger than he. My God is here, beside me, around me, and will be soon above me. You know what that means. It is merciless. The sea is now all the God there is. That is one of the things I have learned. Listen. It is laughing again. God is it, not he. It called, and I went out. On to the decks. All was terrible. It is in the waste, everywhere. It has swamped the ship. Only the forecastle, bridge, and poop stick up out from the bestial, reeking thing, like three islands in the midst of shrieking foam. At times, gigantic billows assail the ship from both sides. They form momentary arches above the vessel, arches of dull, curved water half a hundred feet towards the hideous sky. Then they descend, roaring. Think of it. You cannot. There is an infection of sin in the air. It is the exhalations from the thing. Those left upon the drenched islets of shattered wood and iron are doing the most horrible things. The thing is teaching them. Later I felt the vile informing of its breath, but I have fled back here to pray for death. On the forecastle I saw a mother and her little son clinging to an iron rail. A great billow heaved up above them, descended in a falling mountain of brine. It passed, and they were still there. The thing was only toying with them, yet all the same it had torn the hands of the child from the rail, and the child was clinging frantically to its mother's arm. 
I saw another vast hill hurl up to port and hover above them. Then the mother stooped and bit like a foul beast at the hands of her wee son. She was afraid that his little additional weight would be more than she could hold. I heard his scream even where I stood. It drove to me upon that wild laughter. It told me again that God is not he, but it. Then the hill thundered down upon those two. It seemed to me that the thing gave a bellow as it leapt. It roared about them, churning and growling, then surged away, and there was only one, the mother. There appeared to me to be blood as well as water upon her face, especially about her mouth. But the distance was too great, and I cannot be sure. I looked away. Close to me, I saw something further, a beautiful young girl, her soul hideous with the breath of the thing, struggling with her sweetheart for the shelter of the chart house side. He threw her off, but she came back at him. I saw her hand come from her head where still clung the wreckage of some form of headgear. She struck at him. He shouted and fell away to leeward, and she smiled, showing her teeth. So much for that. I turned elsewhere. Out upon the thing I saw gleams, horrid and suggestive, below the crests of the waves. I have never seen them until this time. I saw a rough sailorman washed away from the vessel. One of the huge breakers snapped at him. Those things were teeth. It had teeth. I heard them clash. I heard his yell. It was no more than a mosquito shrilling amid all that laughter, but it was very terrible. There is worse than death. The ship is lurching very queerly with a sort of sickening heave. I fancy I have been asleep. No, I remember now. I hit my head when she rolled so strangely. My leg is doubled under me. I, I think it is broken, but it does not matter. I have been praying. I, I, what was it? I feel calmer, more resigned now. I think I have been mad. What was it that I was saying? I cannot remember. It was something about... about God. I, I, I believe I blasphemed. May he forgive me. Thou knowest, God, that I was not in my right mind. Thou knowest that I am very weak. Be with me in the coming time. I have sinned, but thou art all merciful. Are you there, John? It is very near the end now. I had so much to say, but it all slips from me. What was it that I said? I take it all back. I was mad, and, and God knows. He is merciful, and I have very little pain now. I feel a bit drowsy. I wonder whether you are there, John. Perhaps, after all, no one has heard the things I have said. It is better so. The living are not meant, and yet I do not know. If you are there, John, you will, you will tell her how it was, but not... Not... Hark! There was such a thunder of water overhead just then. I fancy two vast seas have met in mid-air across the top of the bridge and burst all over the vessel. It must be soon now. And there was such a number of things I had to say. I can hear voices in the wind. They are singing. It is like an enormous dirge. I think I've been dozing again. I pray God humbly that it be soon. You will not... not tell her anything about about what I may have said, will you, John? I mean those things which I ought not to have said. What was it I did say? My head is growing strangely confused. I wonder whether you really do hear me. I may be talking only to that vast roar outside. Still, it is some comfort to go on. And I will not believe that you do not hear all I say. Hark again! A mountain of brine must have swept clean over the vessel. She has gone right over on to her side. She is back again. It will be very soon now. Are you there, John? Are you there? It is coming. The sea has come for me. It is rushing down through the companionway. It, it is like a vast jet. My God, I am drowning. I am, am dr End of Out of the Storm by William Hope Hodgson. The Ponicle by Robert Murray Gilchrist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ben Tucker. The Ponicle by Robert Murray Gilchrist. The farmhouse parlor faced the north and the cold light made dimmer by the bubbles of green glass in the heavy lattice gave the place a grotto-like aspect. The floor rattled round the sides and covered in the middle with a knitted carpet of 
yellow and black cloth, was made of uneven flags. As much of the walls as was visible between the rows of memorial cards and samplers, and the engraved portraits of eminent divines from John Wesley to James K. He nauseated the unaccustomed beholder with a monstrous design of livid roses festooned with the ribbons of pea green. At the door, Miss Olerenshaw paused and gazed inward with the devotion of one who prepares to enter a temple. She stooped and held her head sideways to discover if any dust had settled on the high-polished gate-legged table. Its cleanliness proving satisfactory, she folded her cheek duster into the smallest compass and replaced it in the beaded bag that hung at her side and entered and went to the harmonium that stood between the windows. She was a fine middle-aged woman with prominent teeth, a pallid complexion, and a hooked nose. This evening she wore her most imposing gown of steel-gray poplin. As she sat on the high music stool, her back view was like that of a well-developed girl, and her dull, crimped hair was as luxurious as in the days when, as the Methodist local preacher's young daughter, she had caught the fancy of the wealthiest farmer of the countryside. She played the tune of Miles Lane, and began to sing in a voice which, despite its harsh peakland accent and great unpliability, was sweet and clear and strong, a doggerel hymn which her father had written in denunciation of all creeds save his own. A maid clattered along the passage and stood waiting with folded hands until Mrs. Olerenshaw had finished the second verse, which was condemned to superstitious fools and Unitarian and Roman Catholic fiends with equal bitterness. "'There's Mr. Bateman Middleton come, ma'am,' her mistress rose and closed the lid of the harmonium. "'You can bring him in here, Libby,' she said. "'Be sure and see he wipes his feet well.' Then she sat composedly in the big leather-covered armchair with the big lugs in which her husband had slept away his last days. She had just straightened her skirt when Bateman appeared. He was a tall, well-proportioned lad with a broad red face. He had donned for the occasion his fawn-colored holiday suit and his brightest necktie. Mrs. Olerenshaw shook hands with him and made him take the chair at the other end of the hearth rug. After they had discussed the weather and the oats, she came suddenly to the point. Emma told me as you are coming up to ask to leave the court, she said, and so I thought it would be best for her to be out o'er the road. She was ridden o'er to her uncle Persglove, and none's coming back till morn. The young man's face saddened. He had hoped for a pleasant family scene, of the kind he had read of in the novels of Mrs. Sherwood's day, which are still the popular fiction of the hill country. He was not uncertain of the mother's favor, there was no complaint to be urged against his position. The farm of the Hallows was his own property, and his brood mares had won prizes three consecutive years at the No Valley Show. Emma was his first love, and he foresaw no disappointment. "'It's a faith trial as I'm going to test you by,' Mrs. Olerenshaw remarked. "'My father tried it on my husband, and his answer were satisfying. And if yours is, then you have my consent offhand.' "'I'm willing,' the lover replied feebly. Em said it would be no use our walking together unless she gave leave. His tone became even more conciliatory. She was a good daughter, and she'll be guided by your will. Well, then, it's this, the widow said. There were a farmer as used to come to her house when I were a wench, and he said, as it happed to his wife, ere they wedded. I want to give my opinion on it. Some believes it, some doesn't. It fell about this way. The young woman were going to Tid's market with the butter. On her way lay across the Middleton Moor. It were a hot day, a hay time, and shoe were dry as a cricket, and there were not any water or to slack with. Well, she went on and on, till at last she couldn't bear it any longer, and she sat down her basket and looked about. The deep ricks up there where folk used to dig for lead, and all the pit holes are full of green water, covered with scum. It were filthy, but she couldn't forbear, and she just stooped her down. "'sooped like a cow till she were full. "'Then she got up, took her basket, "'and started on again, "'but afore she'd walked ten yards somewhat stirred about in her stomach. "'The old man saw it twisted inside "'like a live horse horror. "'The long and the short hut, "'where his shoe didn't go to tid the market that day, "'nay, nor for long enough afterwards. "'She grew white and flabby, "'and in less than a month were that bad "'she couldn't leave home.' "'Bateman's mouth opened.' Oh dear, he exclaimed. Miss Oler and Shaw sighed when she saw his consternation. 
Doctors could do naught for her, she continued, and her folk began to think she were dying. At last someone suggested as the wise man as lived at Hagen Flat might be of some service. So they sent for him, and he came and said it were a panicle shooed, swallowed. A panicle, but you'll find it in no book. And he came up the next day at edge of dark, and made him build up the house fire with fire balls. And there I took the girl and fastened her in a chair with ropes, and tied her hair to the back bars, and turned all out, and locked the door. He kept her afront to blaze till she were nigh roasted. The old man reckoned he were listening outside, and her moans were somewhat fearful. All of a sudden the panicle popped its head out of her mouth and looked round. Then it drew back again, but the wise man had seen it and he picked up the potter that lay again, and shoved it in the heart of the fire. But the brute wouldn't have come out again, so he moved the young woman till her knees well he touched the grate. She were all covered with blisters afterward. The old chap said, and she had a bad bout of Cepheus. The wise man saw the panicles yet come out again, so he popped behind the chair and hid. And it crawled out bit by bit. A beast a picture of a fat if it, with claws like hands, and a swell body about an arm's length long, and eyes blood red. It let itself down to her breasts, and afore its tail were out of her mouth, its full head were lying in her lap. At last it drew its tail down, and coiled itself up in a knot. And then with one hand the wise man nipped up the potter, and clapped the utter on the girl's lips, and began to burn the panicle to death. The lover's legs were trembling. His hands slipped from the sides of the chair and hung nerveless. "'Oh, Lord, oh, Lord!' he ejaculated. Mrs. Ollardshaw shook her head. She had hardly wished him to pass unscathed from the faith trial, but she was not a woman to be soured by disappointment. When he touched it with a potter, it writhed about like a bit of crosland worsted. Then it stood upright on its hindmost claws and tried to get back again. But his head hand which it bit and caused him to use caustic were in the way so it tumbled down and lay on the hearthstone he laid the potter across it lengthwise it began screeching like a child but it were soon a lump of cinder a long silence followed bateman broke it with a tremulous inquiry did the young woman get better ma'am the man has told us married her only how i never heard such a fearful thing I'd lie for her died. Mrs. Oler and Shaw rose. So you believe it, Bateman? That I do, ma'am. It's as if I could see it now. Well, I'll say good night to you. Only one as believes such a thing isn't a fit to wed with Emma. He crept dumbfounded from the room. She watched him pass through the garden. Then, moved by some careful impulse, she followed to the door. Bateman, she cried, come back a moment. He returned hastily, with a glad flush driving away his wanness. Yes, ma'am. Only this, Bateman. You mana come courtin' Emma only more. End of the Ponicle by Robert Murray Gilchrist The Pebble Prophecy by Valens Lapsley From Weird Tales, November 1923 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Pebble Prophecy A Halloween Story by Valens Lapsley. It happened on Halloween, the time of year which sanctions a brilliant celebration, and a holiday celebration with us was always an event, and a happy one. We usually entertained at such times, not only for the evening, but for the afternoon as well, for, as we lived outside the city, many of our friends had to come a long distance, and those who had not seen each other for some time counted on a reunion of collegial souls. There were some, of course, who could not come for the afternoon, but those who did came early, so immediately after lunch we were awaiting the arrival of those who were to join in a paper chase. This was to be followed, upon our return, by an immense bonfire which we were to build 
to foretell our futures by the pebble prophecy many of our expected guests had never heard before of the ancient halloween custom of placing pebbles on the ground and then building a fire over them to learn of life or death as the legend had it should a pebble be at all disturbed by the heat of the falling embers death would surely follow within the year for the person who placed that pebble solemn rites and ceremonies were performed by each of the younger ones as they with mock gravity placed their pebbles in such positions as they believed perfectly safe from disturbance we built the bonfire with as much care as if it were to endure instead of being destroyed soon the flames were shooting through the leafy branches and the foliage crisping at their touch flashed into still more brilliant lines and vanished far above in thin air as we watched the soaring blaze our spirits soared also we laughed we sang we crowned one another with autumn leaves one and all with buoyant step danced around the fire hand in hand madly gay in the flush of exuberant spirits until the flames began to hum low and dinner time drew near then we betook ourselves still singing and laughing into the house the afternoon had been dark and gloomy as we were assembling for dinner one of the guests suggested that as the weather was becoming more threatening we should go and look for the pebbles before we dined this was heartily approved for if after dinner it should be too dark to find them our labors would have been in vain and our futures still be in doubt we were very merry as we sallied forth to the scene of our late frolic some of the embers were already dead some glowing dimly red others gave forth tiny spirals of smoke and gleaming here and there were leaping darts of blue and crimson it was a pretty sight who could have guessed that beneath it lay a prophecy of a tragedy it was an easy matter to find most of the pebbles each one knew exactly where he had placed his and went directly there shouts and laughter were heard on all sides as various ones on finding and trying to pick up their pebbles dropped them quickly from scorched fingers their evident relief at finding the pebbles amused me as i listened to them i uncovered the place where i had so carefully planted my pebble an odd-shaped piece of quartz which i had chosen because it could be more easily identified it was not there i gently stared at the embers and ashes surrounding the spot becoming more and more excited as i failed to locate it it was not there where was it who could have taken it others joined in my search but we had to give it up as useless it was not until my friends began to ask me jokingly for any instructions i might have for the elaborate funeral they would surely give me that the full meaning came over me with sudden force my blood grew cold in spite of my would-be disbelief a sickening shiver ran through my veins even while i told myself it was foolishness to imagine that such a prophecy could be fulfilled with youthful thoughtfulness my friends increased their tormenting going into dreadful and painful details it seemed to me that they would never cease though they surely could see they were making me suffer thought and feeling were so confused within me that if i had tried to give them utterance i could only have screamed my nerves contracted my head swam giddily and i felt that my death warrant had been signed then a cord seemed to snap in my brain why should i be frightened i had never been superstitious before why should i be now i held a bachelor of science from a leading university and had always scoffed at anything bordering upon superstition yet i was allowing this trifling custom of an ancient time to bother me to be upset over such a simple incident was nonsense i would forget all about it 
and at once. It was a relief when we were summoned to dinner, and by throwing myself heart and soul into the merriment, where music, laughter, and mirth, real and unreal, were mixed together in one harmonious whole, I soon forgot the prophecy of the pebbles. After dinner our spacious rooms were rapidly filled. Sounds of merry voices and laughter were heard from all sides, and the old and young mingled joyously in every old Halloween ante and prank of which we had ever heard. I was my normal self again. Never had I been in higher spirits. Late in the evening some one made the suggestion that we sit in the firelight and tell stories. This was greeted with applause. Everyone was called on in turn to contribute his share to the awe-telling. Fairy tales and tales of adventure followed one another, but all there were nothing compared to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded. There was a wonderful fire in the cavernous old fireplace. The mighty logs, glowing with warmth, were almost hidden by sticks of pine and hickory which were sputtering and crackling with good cheer. The blood-red glare flashed on the faces of those nearest the hearth, while the countenance of those further back only now and then received a casual gleam as a curl of flame darted out into the room. The light threw a shimmering luster of a ruddy hue on the dark wainscoting. The stories had a new zest, told in such an atmosphere, and in the drowsy or sepulchral tones with which people talked in the firelight. It was just the night for such tales, the very witching time of night. The wind blew and howled around the corners of the house. Everything within breathed of sorcery and enchantment. A rather oppressive pause followed a blood-curdling tale, and, to break it, I asked my grandmother to tell some of the weird stories connected with a certain Dame Walcott, who used to sit before that very fireplace a long time ago. My grandmother gladly assented. She told these tales exceedingly well, for in her younger days they were often repeated in the neighborhood round the winter evening's fire. The main part of our house is colonial, and was built by Dame Walcott's father. A portrait of the old woman which had been in the house when my great-grandparents took possession of it had long since been banished to the lumber room where it still remained. Dame Walcott was reported to have had the supernatural power of making others perform acts in imitation of her own, and had been one of the first accused of witchcraft in the colonies. Although she was neither tried nor condemned as a witch, that Puritan of Puritans, Endicott himself, had denounced her, and she found the sentiment against her so strong that she was supposed to have preferred death to life. They had found her body in the lumber room. Just what had caused her death had always remained a mystery, for those were not the days when an unusual death was widely reported or active inquiry made into it. Murder could not have been committed, for the door and windows were securely fastened on the inside. There was no indication of poisoning, and the only bruises on the body were some dark spots like finger marks on her throat. It was very late when my grandmother had finished her stories, and the guests began at once to make preparations for departure. When the outside door was opened, a furious blast of wind rushed in, and drove whirling sleet far down the hall. To go any distance in such a storm would be almost impossible, so we urged our friends to remain until morning. Although our house is large, our guests were many, and our sleeping accommodations were taxed to the utmost. My room had also to be given up, so I gathered some bedding together intending to pass what remained of the night on a discarded cot in the lumber room. I was surprised when my mother strenuously objected. She seemed worried, and spoke with an agitation not quite unmixed with anger. I laughingly assured her 
that there was nothing to fear, kissed her, and bade her good night. There was no electric light in the lumber room, so I lighted a small oil lamp which we keep for emergencies. When I had set this lamp on a chest in my lonely quarters, I saw before me the clinging old portrait of Dame Walcott gazing down from the canvas with an expression which seemed to be looking at me as the fitful light illuminated it. The little green eyes seemed to see everything I did and to watch every movement I made. The physiognomy of the old dame had struck me more than once, just as it would anyone who liked to study human faces best for what they tell of life's experiences. Her eyes had a vague yet answering gaze, and there was a peculiar smile which age made appear like an ugly film hovering above her lips. The picture fascinated me. The longer I studied it, the more the face seemed to take on an animated expression, as if her soul, long stifled in a cold and narrow prison, was unfolding and developing gradually into full consciousness. I should have considerable difficulty in expressing the thoughts which passed through my mind during the scrutiny of this portrait, as I sought for a consciousness of unity between the past and the present. Had the old dame really been a witch? Had she really lured people to death? How had she done it? Had she possessed the power of hypnotism? I stepped back from the portrait. The lamp on the chest managed with diabolical art to cast its shadow so that at a short distance nothing could be seen but what now appeared to me a sinister face. This combination of the storm of the night, the rattle of the loose-fitting windows, and the shadows everywhere were well prepared to fill me with a strange and creepy sensation. Never before had I felt so lonely, nor so cheerless. A sense of isolation oppressed and weighed me down. I knew that a breath of fresh air would help me throw off my depression and my morbid thoughts. I opened the window. A magnificent storm was raging. I heard not a sound nor a sigh beside the wind which whistled shrilly through the trees with an impatient haste as though longing to escape their gaunt and most untempering embraces. There was, in it all, a poetic element that stirred the very depths of my being, and filled me with a sense of music and harmony, driving out, for the moment, all thought of fear. I took several invigorating breaths, intending then to close the window and retire as quickly as possible. Yet, in spite of all this inspiration and determination, my dread returned, and I felt that something strange and sinister surrounded me. A strong presentment came over me without any visible or audible cause. Obeying an impulse, I swung round and looked, and I knew even as I turned why I did so. There was some intruder present. The room was large, and the pieces of furniture stored there caused much of it to be in black shadow. It would have been a good place for children to play hide-and-seek. Anyone hiding in the room at night would most certainly have escaped detection, and while I was unable to see anything out of the ordinary, I knew and felt that there was a living presence in the room. It was this sense of danger that made me turn from the window. I listened intently, rigidly still. I could hear nothing but the raging storm and the pulsing of my blood, yet I clearly felt someone's presence. I waited, terror-stricken. After a moment which seemed to contain a day full of hours, so terrible was its length, I heard a faint sound. The light in most of the room was dim and uncertain, and shadows threw their obscurity between. Yet I felt sure I saw something opposite me, a darker spot in the darkness. My straining eyes soon saw the darker shadow take on shape, 
a figure appearing dim and unsubstantial as if it were molded of darkness and gray light at that moment a breath at wind came through the open window causing the light to flicker throwing dancing shadows all around the room a shaft of light touched the dark mass giving it the outline of a human form a hundred questions seemed to pass through my mind at once was i being made the victim of a cruel joke could it be a burglar a creature of actual flesh and blood could it be some unearthly visitor some spectre forced back by mystic art from another world i tried to speak to scream but my parched tongue was glued to the roof of my mouth i stood there in a frigid trance of speechless terror i could not utter a sound though crying for help could not have brought me aid the door was closed and the howling storm would have drowned my voice i had seen this thing that lurked in the shadows had it seen me i pulled myself back nearer the window trembling with fear afraid of something i could not recognize and hoping against hope that it did not know i was there then came the horrible thought could it be some victim of dame walcott forced to rise and haunt the place where it had met its untimely end some soul that lived in another world or state when our world thought him dead if he had risen from the sealed tomb what would he be seeking here i tried to pray as my mind flashed back to tales i had heard and read of the spirits of the murdered who had been compelled to revisit the scenes of their death until their murders had been avenged and all the stories of ghosts and goblins that i had heard in the evening now came crowding upon my recollection the shadow moved this then was no hallucination no trick of strained eyesight i felt that i was in the presence of something that could not only frighten but could actually harm i tried to call my bewildered wits to my aid and calming the frenzy of my thoughts by a strong effort i determined to try getting out of the room and believe that by keeping in the shadow and close to the wall i could make my escape through the door scarcely had i taken one step when the shadow turned in my direction to turn and fly now was too late all i could do was wait slowly the shadowy form came toward me as it came into the full glare of the light i saw that it was dame walcott with her head bent upon her breast i recoiled in wide-eyed horror from the terrifying spectre no one can ever know what i suffered as i waited waited until she could reach me then flashed across my mind the pebble prophecy was i too to be a victim of dame walcott was the prophecy to be a true one was it to be fulfilled the very night it was made carried out by a spectre risen from the dead very slowly she raised her head very slowly our eyes met very slowly like some jungle panther she glided toward me until she stood directly in front of me she pointed at me jeering her whole face became animated with a sudden glow of fiendish triumph her eyes glistened with a maligned expression i met her gaze fully absorbing into my innermost soul the mesmeric spell i imitated everything she did though vainly striving to prevent it it had been difficult for others to oppose her it was impossible for me she clasped her hands about her throat unable to resist i imitated her tighter and tighter did my hands close i was unable to loosen them it seemed as though they were controlled by some inexorable power she extended her right arm slowly opening her hand 
in it could be plainly seen something that glimmered faintly in the light she described a circle in the air with a perfectly even and majestic motion the light caught the object in her hand and it gleamed like a living coal as she did this her eyes looked straight into mine held steadily for a moment then dropped to the object in her hand my gaze followed hers and i recognized my pebble of quartz which had disappeared from the bonfire everything gradually became dark about me i had a convulsion of terror my tongue was frozen my teeth clenched a film settled upon my eyes a dull faintness overpowered me every vestige of strength deserted me an icy spasm contracted my heart uttering an inarticulate cry i made a last violent effort to free myself from the spell that held me as i felt the shadow of death creeping over me then i sank face downward upon the floor i do not know how long i lay in this death-like swoon familiar faces were all about me when i was restored to consciousness i looked around in bewilderment where was i how came i to be there suddenly i remembered and swooned again when the hot and terrible delirium which followed had burned itself out my loved ones told me the part they had taken in my halloween experiences i had no need to tell them mine they had heard it all in the ravings of my illness my mother had been both angry and anxious because i had refused to heed her and was unable to sleep she awakened my father and insisted that he go with her to do what he could to persuade me to spend the remainder of the night on the sofa in their room on reaching the lumber room they found the lamp burning a window open and a cot unslept in and in searching for me found me at the base of the portrait apparently dead with some ugly black finger marks on my throat in my stiff rigidly clasped hands something gleamed white and shining it was the quartz pebble an alarm was sounded soon voices and steps were heard in the corridor and the room was ablaze with light friends rushed in rubbing their eyes still half asleep questioning each other as to what had happened my grandmother appeared on the threshold full of astonishment at the sudden disturbance she stopped short with a wild cry which rang through the whole house dame walcott where is she all looked to where the portrait had stood against the wall the frame was still there but the figure within it was gone like a cloud melting in thin air or a ghost vanishing into the netherworld she had mysteriously disappeared the end of the pebble prophecy by valens lapsley The Phantom Drug by A. W. Kapfer From Weird Magazine, April 1926 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman A bizarre and fantastic story is The Phantom Drug by a w kapfer this document written in a clear bold hand was found in the burned ruins of an old insane asylum the records of this institution had been saved and upon investigation it was found that an eminent drug analyst was confined within its walls for one of the most horrible crimes ever recorded he was judged and found insane after telling as his defense a fantastic story which was interpreted as a maniac's delusion 
after reading his story, which coincides so well with the known facts, one cannot help but wonder. It's night again, one of those threatening, misty nights that you see in dreams. I'm afraid of it. It turns like a mockery to goad my memory to greater torture. It was on a night much like this that it happened, that horrible experience that gives my mind no rest, that fear that gives shadows ghostly forms and lends an added terror to the scream of an insane inmate. They put me in a madhouse because they judged me insane, me whose mentality is so inexpressibly superior to those that judged me mentally unbalanced. They would not believe the facts I told them, said my story was a fabrication of an unsound mind, as an alibi for the horrible crime I had committed. I swore on my honor that I had told the truth, but even my friends refused to believe me. So it is with little hope of winning your credulity that I leave this written document. But here are the facts. I was at work in my laboratory analyzing some drugs that I had received in a new consignment from India. A tube which contained a phosphorescent liquid attracted my attention, and I read the note my collector had sent with it. He stated that it was supposed to have the power of transforming the mind of a human into the body of an animal, a superstition which the natives of the inner jungle firmly believed. They claimed it is compounded from the brains of freshly slain animals, each brain containing an amount of this substance relative to its size. I naturally scoffed at the claims for this drug, but decided to test it on one of my laboratory animals, so that I could place it in its proper category. I injected a small amount into the system of a rabbit, and watched closely the reaction. For a minute it was motionless, except for the natural movements of breathing. Then its eyelids closed slowly, until they were completely shut, and it appeared in a deep lethargy. For half a minute more there appeared no change. Then its eyes flickered open, and I looked, not into the timid eyes of a rabbit, but those of a scared animal. With a sudden leap it leapt for the laboratory light, which was suspended by a chain from the ceiling. Its paws, however, were unfitted to grip the chain or the sloping reflector, and it fell to the floor only to spring frantically at the curtain in a vain attempt to climb it. Another leap sent it to the top of the cabinet, where it upset several bottles, which fell to the tile floor and smashed. This aroused me from my stupor, and I endeavored to catch it. I might as well have tried to catch its shadow. From cabinet to mantel, from mantel to curtain, curtain to shelf, leaving a trail of spilled and broken bottles in its wake. As it sprang about, strange, squeaking barks came from its throat. Perspiring and out of wind, I gave up the chase, picked up the overturned chair, and sat down to ponder the matter out. I observed the rabbit's actions closely. Now it was on the shelf, looking at its short stump of a tail, and chattering excitedly. Then it rubbed its ears, and seemed startled at their length. I wondered. What was the explanation of this? It flew around like a monkey. A monkey, that was it. The drug made animals act like monkeys. Then the claim of the natives was true, and the drug did have the power of performing a transition. I wondered if the drug always had the same result, and decided to test it again on a white mouse that I took from another cage. I carefully injected a small amount into its bloodstream. After a minute had expired, during which it made no move, it began to twitch about. The blood was pounding in my temples, and my eyes were glued to its quivering form. Slowly it roused from its stupor, 
and then stood on its hind legs while it flapped the front ones about by its side what the deuce i began then i understood the drug affected each animal differently depending on the amount of the dose as i arrived at this conclusion i noticed the rabbit was hopping about in its natural way all trace of its former erratic movements gone never before in my experience had any drug such a startling effect on the brain as to give it the complete characteristics of a different animal my old and dearest friend rodney caleb was living with me and i went to his room to tell him what had occurred he was lying on the bed covered by a heavy blanket which did not entirely conceal the hulking form once the proud possessor of enormous strength now robbed by sickness and old age he was twenty years older than i he liked to talk of the days when his prowess was commented upon where strength and courage counted his voice still held some of its old timber as he greeted me and noticed my excitement hello he said something interesting happened with eager enthusiasm i detailed the effects the drug had had on the rabbit and the mouse i could tell by the expression on his face that he was intensely interested but when i finished he lay back on his pillow as if in deep thought doc he said quietly i think that at last i am going to have my wish fulfilled i looked at him uncomprehendingly you know he said growing excited you know how i've longed to have my old strength back again or at least to be active for a time well there you have a substance that can perform that miracle what do you mean i gasped why can't i take some of that drug he reasoned and control the body of some animal for a while rodney you are crazy i cried aghast i will not consent to your doing such an insensate thing it would mean your death within a few minutes can you imagine yourself as a monkey hopping and swinging about with that old body of yours it could never stand the strain you forget something he smiled what i asked my mind would no longer control this body but that of some active and healthy animal i should say not i began then stopped and reasoned the matter out the rabbit had been controlled by a monkey's mind what happened to the rabbit's mind it was only logical to suppose that they had been exchanged and that some monkey in far-off india had been hopping about like a rabbit during the transition it is possible i admitted that you would have the control of another body but you forget that your body would be controlled by the animal's mind that would be far more risky as was proved by the rabbit's antics in the laboratory you can take care of that he argued by giving me a potion to numb the motor areas of my brain and by giving me a sleeping powder then no matter what impulse is aroused it cannot be carried into action i pondered his words carefully and had to admit to myself that the reasoning was plausible rodney pleaded his cause with desperate earnestness here i am an old man chained to a bed for the rest of my life a year or so at most life holds little attraction for me handicapped as i am my body is weak but the spirit of adventure is still strong within me surely you cannot deny me this favor if not to gratify the wish of an old man then on the claim of our friendship i have but one thing left to say i replied and that is if you take some of this drug then so will i rodney hesitated in involving me in his rash wish it is not necessary for you to do so he said you are healthy and in the name of our profession you owe the world a service nothing claims me nevertheless the arrangement stands i said do you think i could ever bear to have anything happen to you through this enterprise 
without my sharing it never we have stood together in all the things of the past and will continue to do so until the end rodney placed his hand on mine neither of us spoke for a few minutes but we felt the bond of friendship more closely than ever before i can't ask you to risk it he said huskily and tried to hide the disappointment that his voice betrayed and i cannot refuse your wish i replied besides it is in a way my duty to undergo an experience that may prove valuable in research i must admit that i felt thrilled by the prospect of this adventure too when shall we try it i'm ready now he replied what preparations are necessary hardly any i said i'll go down to the laboratory and get the sedatives and a hypodermic needle for this drug i may as well bring my safety kit along before i locked the back door i glanced out into the night the air was surcharged and oppressive and the uncanny stillness that precedes a storm sent a chilling premonition over me i locked the door gathered the articles i needed and returned to the bedroom an electrical storm is coming i said rodney did not answer his eyes were on the tube containing the phosphorescent drug he was breathing faster and became excited and impatient better quiet down a bit rod i admonished my own heart was pumping strangely and the air seemed exceedingly warm i thought it best to hide my perturbation from him however an unexpected crash of thunder made our nerves jump we're as nervous as a couple of kids on their first pirate expedition laughed rod his voice was high-pitched and taut i mixed a sedative and a sleeping potion for him and a strong mixture for myself these we drank then i took off my coat bared my left arm and bade rod roll up his pajama sleeve we shall not feel the effects for a minute or two i told him but by that time the potion we drank will start its work just lie quiet i forced my hand to be steady as i injected the drug into his arm then hastily refilled the needle chamber from the tube and emptied it into my own arm rodney had put his hand by mine as i lay down beside him and i clasped it fervently a drowsiness crept over me as the seconds slipped by then something snapped and i knew no more an unfamiliar atmosphere surrounded me when my mind began to function again slowly the haze wore away and i stirred restlessly as strange impressions flooded my brain i was amongst a heavy growth of trees rank grass and brush my nose felt peculiar to me then i cried out in wonder it was not a faint ejaculation that came from my throat however but a roar a volume of sound that made the very earth tremble and with good cause for i or rather my mind was embodied in an elephant my nose it was now a trunk i became intoxicated with the thought of the strength i now possessed seized a tree with my trunk and with a mighty tug pulled its roots from the ground and hurled it aside my cry of satisfaction was a boom that rolled like a peal of thunder a low growl sounded behind me and i swung my huge hulk quickly around a tiger lay crouching in the undergrowth i raised my trunk threateningly and stamped angrily but the beast did not move then i looked into its eyes and understood it was rodney he had possession of a tiger's body he was overjoyed at my recognizing him and although we could not talk to each other we showed our pleasure plainly enough he gloried in the agility and strength that were now his and took prodigious leaps and flips in a small clearing finally tired and winded from his play 
he came to me and rubbed his back against my leg, purring like an immense cat. With a flip of my trunk I swung him on my back and raced through the jungle for miles. A river cut its way through this wilderness, and we drank our fill. A gallon of water seemed but a cupful to my stupendous thirst. I was amusing myself by squirting water on Rodney, when a roar came from a distance, accompanied by heavy crashings. We faced the direction of the disturbance, and waited breathlessly. Over the top of the waving jungle grass there appeared the head of an angry elephant. That its temper was up was all too plain. Its ears stuck out from its head like huge fans, and its upraised trunk blasted forth a challenge as it charged along. I looked anxiously at Rodney. The light of battle was in his eyes, and I knew that he would be a formidable ally. It was too late to flee. My opponent was too close, and the river was a barrier which, if I tried to cross, would give my adversary the advantage of a firmer footing. My temper was aroused also, and as it was not my own body that was at stake, I did not fear the coming conflict. The huge elephant facing me charged, and I met him halfway. Two locomotives crashing together would not have made that glade tremble more than it did when we met. My enemy gave a scream of fear and pain when we parted, and I soon saw the reason why. Rodney had waited until we were locked, then launched himself at the throat of my rival. He had sunk his teeth deep in its tough hide, and was tearing the flesh from its shoulder and chest with his bared claws. All this I had seen in an instant, and as the monster turned on Rodney, I charged it from the side, driving both tusks deep in it. Almost at the same instant, Rodney severed its jugular vein. The elephant trembled, swayed, and toppled to the ground. I was unhurt, except for an aching head, the result of the first onslaught, but Rodney had not fared so well. As we turned from our fallen adversary, I noticed that one of his legs had been crushed. The light of victory was in his eyes, however, and he seemed happy, despite the pain he must have been suffering. It was then that I noticed a change coming over me, a sort of drowsiness. At first I thought it was due to the exertion I had just gone through, but as its effects became more marked and insistent, I realized with a tremor of terror what it really was. The elephant's mind was trying to throw my own out of possession of its body. I glanced at Rodney apprehensively to see if he were undergoing the same change. He was still in complete control. Then the truth dawned on me. The immense bulk I had been dominating had absorbed the power of the drug faster than the body Rodney controlled. I hurried to his side and tried to make him understand that he should crawl into the jungle and hide until the effect of the drug had worn off. It was no use. The more I stamped and raged, the more his eyes smiled at me as though he thought I was trying to show him how pleased I was at our victory. More and more insistent and powerful did the elephant's mind become. It began to take control of its body and fixed its eyes with a baleful glare on Rodney's recumbent form. I struggled desperately to wrest control from that conquering mind, but in vain. The drug's force was ebbing fast. One last warning I managed to blast out, and Rodney faced me. Horror of horrors! He thought I was calling him. Slowly and painfully he crept toward me. My thoughts became dim, and I struggled, as if in a dream, to conquer again the huge bulk he was approaching, but it was too late. The monster I had once controlled was in almost complete possession now, and I was but an unwilling spectator, viewing things through a veil that grew steadily heavier. When Rodney was but a few feet away, 
the body under me reared in the air a flash of fear showed in rodney's eyes as he realized the awful truth and as his shrill scream rent the air i was swallowed into blackness i don't know how long i lay in a daze in rodney's bedroom consciousness came back slowly as events crowded themselves into my mind i felt for rodney's hand it was not by my side i sat up in bed weak and trembling all over at first i did not see him then i screamed in livid terror rodney lay beside the bed every bone in his body broken as though something weighing several tons had crushed him the end of the phantom drug by a w kepfer the rats in the walls by h p lovecraft this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames The Rats in the Walls by H. P. Lovecraft On July 16, 1923, I moved into Exxon Priory after the last workman had finished his labours. The restoration had been a stupendous task, for little had remained of the deserted pile but a shell-like ruin. Yet because it had been the seat of my ancestors, I let no expense deter me. The place had not been inhabited since the reign of James I, when a tragedy of intensely hideous though largely unexplained nature had struck down the master, five of his children, and several servants, and driven forth under a cloud of suspicion and terror the third son, my lineal progenitor and the only survivor of the abhorred line. With this sole heir denounced as a murderer, the estate had reverted to the crown, nor had the accused man made any attempt to exculpate himself or regain his property. Shaken by some horror greater than that of conscience or the law, and expressing only a frantic wish to exclude the ancient edifice from his sight and memory, Walter de la Pore, eleventh Baron Exum, fled to Virginia, and there founded the family which by the next century had become known as Delapore. Exxon Priory had remained untenanted, though later allotted to the estates of the Norris family, and much studied because of its peculiarly composite architecture, an architecture involving Gothic towers resting on a Saxon or Romanesque substructure whose foundation in turn was of a still earlier order, or blend of orders. Roman, and even Druidic, or native Cymric, if legends speak truly. This foundation was a very singular thing, being merged on one side with the solid limestone of the precipice from whose brink the priory overlooked a desolate valley, three miles west of the village of Anchester. Architects and antiquarians loved to examine this strange relic of forgotten centuries, but the country folk hated it. They had hated it hundreds of years before when my ancestors lived there, and they hated it now, with the moss and mould of abandonment on it. I had not been a day in Anchester before I knew I came of an accursed house, and this week workmen have blown up Exxon Priory and are busy obliterating the traces of its foundations. The bare statistics of my ancestry I had always known, together with the fact that my first American forebear had come to the colonies under a strange cloud. Of details, however, I had been kept wholly ignorant through the policy of reticence always maintained by the Delapores. Unlike our planter neighbours, we seldom boasted of crusading ancestors or other medieval and renaissance heroes, nor was any kind of tradition handed down except what may have been recorded in the sealed envelope left before the Civil War by every squire to his eldest son for posthumous opening. The glories we cherished were those achieved since the migration, the stories of a proud and honourable 
if somewhat reserved and unsocial Virginia line. During the war our fortunes were extinguished and our whole existence changed by the burning of Carfax, our home on the banks of the James. My grandfather, advanced in years, had perished in that incendiary outrage, and with him the envelope that bound us all to the past. I can recall that fire today as I saw it then at the age of seven, with the Federal soldiers shouting, the women screaming, and the Negroes howling and praying. My father was in the army defending Richmond, and after many formalities my mother and I were passed through the lines to join him. When the war ended we all moved north whence my mother had come, and I grew to manhood, middle age, and ultimate wealth as a stolid Yankee. Neither my father nor I ever knew what our hereditary envelope had contained. And as I merged into the greyness of Massachusetts business life, I lost all interest in the mysteries which evidently lurked far back in my family tree. Had I suspected their nature, how gladly I would have left Exxon Priory to its moss, bats and cobwebs. My father died in 1904, but without any message to leave me or to my only child, Alfred, a motherless boy of ten. It was this boy who reversed the order of family information for although I could give him only jesting conjectures about the past, he wrote me of some very interesting ancestral legends when the late war took him to England in 1917 as an aviation officer. Apparently the Delapores had a colourful and perhaps sinister history, for a friend of my son's, Captain Edward Norris of the Royal Flying Corps, dwelt near the family seat at Anchester, and related some peasant superstitions which few novelists could equal for wildness and incredibility. Norris himself, of course, did not take them seriously, but they amused my son and made good material for his letters to me. It was this legendary which definitely turned my attention to my transatlantic heritage, and made me resolve to purchase and restore the family seat which Norris showed to Alfred in its picturesque desertion, and offered to get for him at a surprisingly reasonable figure, since his own uncle was the present owner. I bought Exxon Priory in 1918, but was almost immediately distracted from my plans of restoration by the return of my son as a maimed invalid. During the two years that he lived I thought of nothing but his care having even placed my business under the direction of partners. In 1921, as I found myself bereaved and aimless, a retired manufacturer no longer young, I resolved to divert my remaining years with my new possession. Visiting Anchester in December, I was entertained by Captain Norris, a plump, amiable young man, who had thought much of my son, and secured his assistance in gathering plans and anecdotes, to guide in the coming restoration. Exxon Priory itself I saw without emotion, a jumble of tottering medieval ruins covered with lichens and honeycombed with rooks' nests, perched perilously upon a precipice, and denuded of floors or other interior features, save the stone walls of the separate towers. As I gradually recovered the image of the edifice as it had been when my ancestor left it over three centuries before, I began to hire workmen for the reconstruction. In every case I was forced to go outside the immediate locality, for the Anchester villagers had an almost unbelievable fear and hatred of the place. This sentiment was so great that it was sometimes communicated to the outside labourers causing numerous desertions, while its scope appeared to include both the priory and its ancient family. My son had told me that he was somewhat avoided during his visits because he was a de la poor, and I now found myself subtly ostracized for a like reason, until I convinced the peasants how little I knew of my heritage. Even then they sullenly disliked me so that I had to collect most of the village traditions through the mediation of Norris. What the people could not forgive, perhaps, 
was that I had come to restore a symbol so abhorrent to them, for rationally or not, they viewed Exum Priory as nothing less than a haunt of fiends and werewolves. Piecing together the tales which Norris collected for me, and supplementing them with the accounts of several savants who had studied the ruins, I deduced that Exum Priory stood on the site of a prehistoric temple, a druidical or anti-druidical thing, which must have been contemporary with Stonehenge, that indescribable rites had been celebrated there, few doubted, and there were unpleasant tales of the transference of these rites into the Sibylle worship which the Romans had introduced. Inscriptions still visible in the subcellar bore such unmistakable letters as Div, Ops, Magna Mat, sign of the Magnamator, whose dark worship was once vainly forbidden to Roman citizens. Anchester had been the camp of the Third Augustan Legion, as many remains attest, and it was said that the Temple of Sibylle was splendid and thronged with worshippers, who performed nameless ceremonies at the bidding of a Phrygian priest. Tales added that the fall of the old religion did not end the orgies at the temple, but that the priests lived on in the new faith without real change. Likewise it was said that the rites did not vanish with the Roman power, and that certain among the Saxons added to what remained of the temple, and gave it the essential outline it subsequently preserved, making it the centre of a cult feared through half the heptarchy. About 1000 AD the place is mentioned in a chronicle as being a substantial stone priory housing a strange and powerful monastic order, and surrounded by extensive gardens which needed no walls to exclude a frightened populace. It was never destroyed by the Danes, though after the Norman conquest it must have declined tremendously, since there was no impediment when Henry the Third granted the site to my ancestor, Gilbert de la Poer, first Baron Exum, in 1261. Of my family before this date there is no evil report, but something strange must have happened then. In one chronicle there is a reference to a de la Poer as cursed of God in 1307 whilst village legendary had nothing but evil and frantic fear to tell of the castle that went up on the foundations of the old temple and priory. The fireside tales were of the most grisly description, all the ghastlier because of their frightened reticence and cloudy evasiveness. They represented my ancestors as a race of hereditary demons beside whom Gilles de Retz and the Marquis de Sade would seem the various tyros, and hinted whisperingly at their responsibility for the occasional disappearance of villagers through several generations. The worst characters, apparently, were the barons and their direct heirs, at least most was whispered about these. If of healthier inclinations it was said an heir would early and mysteriously die to make way for another more typical scion. There seemed to be an inner cult in the family, presided over by the head of the house, and sometimes closed except to a few members. Temperament rather than ancestry was evidently the basis of this cult for it was entered by several who married into the family. Lady Margaret Trevor from Cornwall, wife of Godfrey, the second son of the fifth baron, became a favourite bane of children all over the countryside, and the demon heroine of a particularly horrible old ballad, not yet extinct near the Welsh border. Preserved in balladry too, though not illustrating the same point, is the hideous tale of Lady Mary de la Poer, who, shortly after her marriage to the Earl of Shrewsfield, was killed by him and his mother, both of the slayers being absolved and blessed by the priest to whom they had confessed what they dared not repeat to the world. These myths and ballads, typical as they were of crude superstition, repelled me greatly, their persistence and their application to so long a line of my ancestors were especially annoying. 
whilst the imputations of monstrous habits proved unpleasantly reminiscent of the one known scandal of my immediate forebears, the case of my cousin, young Randolph Delapore of Carfax, who went among the Negroes and became a voodoo priest after he returned from the Mexican War. I was much less disturbed by the vaguer tales of wails and howlings in the barren, windswept valley beneath the limestone cliff, of the graveyard stenches after the spring rains, of the floundering, squealing white thing on which Sir John Clave's horse had trod one night in a lonely field, and of the servant who had gone mad at what he saw in the priory in the full light of day. These things were hackneyed spectral law, and I was at the time a pronounced sceptic. The accounts of vanished peasants were less to be dismissed, though not specifically significant in view of medieval custom. Crying curiosity meant death, and more than one severed head had been publicly shown on the bastions, now effaced, around Exham Priory. A few of the tales were exceedingly picturesque, and made me wish I had learnt more of comparative mythology in my youth. There was, for instance, the belief that a legion of bat-winged devils kept witches' sabbath each night at the priory, a legion whose sustenance might explain the disproportionate abundance of coarse vegetables harvested in the vast gardens. And, most vivid of all, there was the dramatic epic of the rats, the scampering army of obscene vermin which had burst forth from the castle three months after the tragedy that doomed it to desertion, the lean, filthy, ravenous army which had swept all before it and devoured fowl, cats, dogs, hogs, sheep, and even two hapless human beings before its fury was spent. Around that unforgettable rodent army a whole separate cycle of myths revolves, for it scattered among the village homes and brought curses and horrors in its train. Such was the law that assailed me as I pushed to completion with an elderly obstinacy the work of restoring my ancestral home. It must not be imagined for a moment that these tales formed my principal psychological environment. On the other hand, I was constantly praised and encouraged by Captain Norris and the antiquarians, who surrounded and aided me. When the task was done, over two years after its commencement, I viewed the great rooms, wainscoted walls, vaulted ceilings, mullioned windows, and broad staircases, with a pride which fully compensated for the prodigious expense of the restoration. Every attribute of the Middle Ages was cunningly reproduced, and the new parts blended perfectly with the original walls and foundations. The seat of my father's was complete, and I looked forward to redeeming at last the local fame of the line which ended in me. I would reside here permanently, and prove that a Dillapore, for I had adopted again the original spelling of the name, need not be a fiend. My comfort was perhaps augmented by the fact that although Exham Priory was medievally fitted, its interior was in truth wholly new and free from old vermin and ghosts alike. As I have said, I moved in on July 16, 1923. My household consisted of seven servants and nine cats of which latter species I am particularly fond. My eldest cat, Nigger Man, was seven years old and had come with me from my home in Bolton, Massachusetts. The others I had accumulated whilst living with Captain Norris's family during the restoration of the Priory. For five days our routine proceeded with the utmost placidity, my time being spent mostly in the codification of old family data. I had now obtained some very circumstantial accounts of the final tragedy and flight of Walter de la Poor, which I conceived to be the probable contents of the hereditary paper lost in the fire at Carfax. 
It appeared that my ancestor was accused with much reason of having killed all the other members of his household, except four servant confederates, in their sleep, about two weeks after a shocking discovery which changed his whole demeanour, but which, except by implication, he disclosed to no one, save perhaps the servants who assisted him, and afterward fled beyond reach. This deliberate slaughter, which included a father, three brothers, and two sisters, was largely condoned by the villagers, and so slackly treated by the law that its perpetrator escaped, honoured, unharmed, and undisguised, to Virginia. The general whispered sentiment being that he had purged the land of an immemorial curse. What discovery had prompted an act so terrible I could scarcely even conjecture. Walter de la Pole must have known for years the sinister tales about his family, so that this material could have given him no fresh impulse. Had he then witnessed some appalling ancient rite, or stumbled upon some frightful and revealing symbol in the priory or its vicinity? He was reputed to have been a shy, gentle youth in England. In Virginia he seemed not so much hard or bitter as harassed and apprehensive. He was spoken of in the diary of another gentleman adventurer, Francis Harley of Bellevue, as a man of unexampled justice, honour, and delicacy. On July 22 occurred the first incident, which though lightly dismissed at the time, takes on a preternatural significance in relation to later events. It was so simple as to be almost negligible, and could not possibly have been noticed under the circumstances. For it must be recalled that, since I was in a building practically fresh and new except for the walls, and surrounded by a well-balanced staff of servitors, apprehension would have been absurd despite the locality. What I afterward remembered is merely this, that my old black cat, whose moods I know so well, was undoubtedly alert and anxious, to an extent wholly out of keeping with his natural character. He roved from room to room, restless and disturbed, and sniffed constantly about the walls which formed part of the old Gothic structure. I realise how trite this sounds, like the inevitable dog in the ghost story, which always growls before his master sees the sheeted figure. Yet I cannot consistently suppress it. The following day a servant complained of restlessness among all the cats in the house. He came to me in my study, a lofty west room on the second story, with groined arches, black oak panelling, and a triple Gothic window overlooking the limestone cliff and desolate valley. And even as he spoke I saw the jetty form of Niggerman creeping along the west wall, and scratching at the new panels which overlaid the ancient stone. I told the man that there must be some singular odour or emanation from the old stonework, imperceptible to human senses, but affecting the delicate organs of cats, even through the new woodwork. This I truly believed, and when the fellow suggested the presence of mice or rats, I mentioned that there had been no rats there for three hundred years, and that even the field mice of the surrounding country could hardly be found in these high walls, where they had never been known to stray. That afternoon I called on Captain Norris, and he assured me that it would be quite incredible for field mice to infest the priory in such a sudden and unprecedented fashion. That night, dispensing as usual with a valet, I retired in the West Tower chamber, which I had chosen as my own, reached from the study by a stone staircase and a short gallery, the former partly ancient, the latter entirely restored. This room was circular, very high, and without wainscoting, being hung with arras, which I had myself chosen in London. Seeing that Niggerman was with me, I shut the heavy Gothic door, 
and retired by the light of the electric bulbs, which so cleverly counterfeited candles. Finally, switching off the light and sinking on the carved and canopied four-poster, with the venerable cat in his accustomed place across my feet, I did not draw the curtains, but gazed out at the narrow north window which I faced. There was a suspicion of aurora in the sky, and the delicate traceries of the window were pleasantly silhouetted. At some time I must have fallen quietly asleep, for I recall a distinct sense of leaving strange dreams when the cat started violently from his placid position. I saw him in the faint auroral glow, head strained forward, forefeet on my ankles, and hind feet stretched behind. He was looking intensely at a point on the wall somewhat west of the window, a point to which my eye had nothing to mark it, but toward which all my attention was now directed. And as I watched, I knew that Niggerman was not vainly excited. Whether the arras actually moved, I cannot say. I think it did, very slightly. But what I can swear to is that behind it I heard a low, distinct scurrying, as of rats or mice. In a moment the cat had jumped bodily on the screening tapestry, bringing the affected section to the floor with his weight, and exposing a damp ancient wall of stone, patched here and there by the restorers, and devoid of any trace of rodent prowlers. Niggerman raced up and down the floor by this part of the wall, clawing the fallen arras, and seemingly trying at times to insert a paw between the wall and the oaken floor. He found nothing, and after a time returned wearily to his place across my feet. I had not moved, but I did not sleep again that night. In the morning I questioned all the servants and found that none of them had noticed anything unusual, save that the cook remembered the actions of a cat which had rested on her window-sill. This cat had howled at some unknown hour of the night, awaking the cook in time for her to see him dart purposefully out of the open door down the stairs. I drowsed away the noontime, and in the afternoon called again on Captain Norris, who became exceedingly interested in what I told him. The odd incidents, so slight yet so curious, appealed to his sense of the picturesque, and elicited from him a number of reminiscences of local ghostly lore. We were genuinely perplexed at the presence of rats, and Norris lent me some traps and Paris green, which I had the servants place in strategic localities when I returned. I retired early, being very sleepy, but was harassed by dreams of the most horrible sort. I seemed to be looking down from an immense height upon a twilit grotto, knee-deep with filth, where a white-bearded demon swineherd drove about with his staff a flock of fungus flabby beasts, whose appearance filled me with an unutterable loathing. Then, as the swineherd paused and nodded over his task, a mighty swarm of rats rained down on the stinking abyss and fell to devouring beasts and man alike. From this terrific vision I was abruptly awaked by the motions of Niggerman, who had been sleeping as usual across my feet. This time I did not have to question the source of his snarls and hisses, and of the fear which made him sink his claws into my ankle unconscious of their effect. For on every side of the chamber the walls were alive with nauseous sound, the verminous slithering of ravenous gigantic rats. There was now no aurora to show the state of the arras, the fallen section of which had been replaced, but I was not too frightened to switch on the light. As the bulbs leapt into radiance, I saw a hideous shaking all over the tapestry, causing the somewhat peculiar designs to execute a singular dance of death. This motion disappeared almost at once, and the sound with it. 
Springing out of bed, I poked at the arras with the long handle of a warming pan that rested near, and lifted one section to see what lay beneath. There was nothing but the patched stone wall, and even the cat had lost his tense realisation of abnormal presences. When I examined the circular trap that had been placed in the room, I found all of the openings sprung, though no trace remained of what had been caught and had escaped. Further sleep was out of the question. So, lighting a candle, I opened the door and went out in the gallery towards the stairs to my study, nigger man following at my heels. Before we had reached the stone steps, however, the cat darted ahead of me and vanished down the ancient flight. As I descended the stair myself, I became suddenly aware of sounds in the great room below, sounds of a nature which could not be mistaken. The oaked panelled walls were alive with rats, scampering and milling, whilst Nigger Man was racing about with the fury of a baffled hunter. Reaching the bottom I switched on the light, which did not this time cause the noise to subside. The rats continued their riot, stampeding with such force and distinctness that I could finally assign to their motions a definite direction. These creatures, in numbers apparently inexhaustible, were engaged in one stupendous migration from inconceivable heights to some depth, conceivably or inconceivably, below. I now heard steps in the corridor, and in another moment two servants pushed open the massive door. They were searching the house for some unknown source of disturbance which had thrown all the cats into a snarling panic, and caused them to plunge precipitately down several flights of stairs, and squat, yowling before the closed door to the sub-cellar. I asked them if they had heard the rats, but they replied in the negative, and when I turned to call their attention to the sounds in the panels, I realised that the noise had ceased. With the two men I went down to the door of the sub-cellar, but found the cats already dispersed. Later I resolved to explore the crypt below, but for the present I merely made a round of the traps. All were sprung, yet all were tenantless. Satisfying myself that no one had heard the rats save the felines and me, I sat in my study till morning, thinking profoundly and recalling every scrap of legend I had unearthed concerning the building I inhabited. I slept some in the forenoon, leaning back in the one comfortable library chair which my medieval plan of furnishing could not banish. Later I telephoned to Captain Norris, who came over and helped me explore the sub-cellar. Absolutely nothing untoward was found. Although we could not repress the thrill at the knowledge that this vault was built by Roman hands. Every low arch and massive pillar was Roman, not the debased Romanesque of the bungling Saxons, but the severe and harmonious classicism of the age of the Caesars. Indeed, the walls abounded with inscriptions familiar to the antiquarians who had repeatedly explored the place. Things like P. Gete, Pro Temp Donna, and El Preic, Vis Pontifi, Attis. The reference to Attis made me shiver, for I had read Catullus, and knew something of the hideous rites of the Eastern god, whose worship was so mixed with that of Sibylle. Norris and I, by the light of lanterns, tried to interpret the odd and nearly effaced designs on certain irregularly rectangular blocks of stone, generally held to be altars, but could make nothing of them. We remembered that one pattern, a sort of raid sum, was held by students to imply a non-Roman origin, suggesting that these altars had merely been adopted by the Roman priests from some older and perhaps aboriginal temple, on the same site. On one of these stone blocks were some brown stains which made me wonder. 
The largest, in the centre of the room, had certain features on the upper surface, which indicated its connection with fire, probably burnt offerings. Such were the sights in that crypt, before whose door the cats had howled, and where Norris and I now determined to pass the night. Couches were brought down by the servants, who were told not to mind any nocturnal actions of the cats, and Niggerman was admitted as much for help as companionship. We decided to keep the great oak door, a modern replica with slits for ventilation, tightly closed, and with this attended to, we retired with lanterns still burning, to await whatever might occur. The vault was very deep in the foundations of the priory, and undoubtedly far down on the face of the beetling limestone cliff, overlooking the waste valley, that it had been the goal of the scuffling and unexplainable rats, I could not doubt. The why? I could not tell. As we lay there expectantly, I found my vigil occasionally mixed with half-formed dreams from which the uneasy motions of the cat across my feet would rouse me. These dreams were not wholesome, but horribly like the one I had had the night before. I saw again the twilit grotto and the swineherd with his unmentionable fungus beasts wallowing in filth, and as I looked at these things they seemed nearer and more distinct, so distinct that I could almost observe their features. Then I did observe the flabby features of one of them, and awaked with such a scream that Niggerman started up, whilst Captain Norris, who had not slept, laughed considerably. Norris might have laughed more or perhaps less had he known what it was that made me scream, but I did not remember myself till later. Ultimate horror often paralyzes memory in a merciful way. Norris waked me when the phenomena began. Out of the same frightful dream I was called by his gentle shaking and his urging to listen to the cats. Indeed there was much to listen to, for beyond the closed door at the head of the stone steps was a veritable nightmare of feline yelling and clawing, whilst Niggerman, unmindful of his kindred outside, was running excitedly around the bare stone walls, in which I heard the same babble of scurrying rats that had troubled me the night before. An acute terror now rose within me, for here were anomalies which nothing normal could well explain. These rats, if not the creatures of madness, which I shared with the cats alone, must be burrowing and sliding in Roman walls, I had thought, to be of solid limestone blocks, unless perhaps the action of water through more than seventeen centuries had eaten winding tunnels which rodent bodies had worn clear and ample. But even so, the spectral horror was no less, for if these were living vermin, why did not Norris hear their disgusting commotion? Why did he urge me to watch Niggerman and listen to the cats outside? And why did he guess wildly and vaguely at what could have aroused them? By the time I had managed to tell him as rationally as I could what I thought I was hearing, my ears gave me the last fading impression of the scurrying, which had retreated still downward, far underneath this deepest of subcellars, till it seemed as if the whole cliff below were riddled with questing rats. Norris was not as sceptical as I had anticipated, but instead seemed profoundly moved. He motioned to me to notice that the cats at the door had ceased their clamour, as if giving up the rats for lost, whilst Niggerman had a burst of renewed restlessness, and was clawing frantically around the bottom of the large stone altar in the centre of the room, which was nearer Norris' couch than mine. My fear of the unknown was at this point very great. Something astounding had occurred, and I saw that Captain Norris, a younger, stouter, and presumably more naturally materialistic man, was affected fully as much as myself. 
perhaps because of his lifelong and intimate familiarity with local legend. We could for the moment do nothing but watch the old black cat as he pawed with decreasing fervour at the base of the altar, occasionally looking up and mewing to me in that persuasive manner which he used when he wished me to perform some favour for him. Norris now took a lantern close to the altar and examined the place where Nigger Man was pawing. Silently kneeling and scraping away the lichens of centuries which joined the massive pre-Roman block to the tessellated floor, he did not find anything, and was about to abandon his effort when I noticed a trivial circumstance which made me shudder, even though it implied nothing more than I had already imagined. I told him of it and we both looked at its almost imperceptible manifestation with the fixedness of fascinated discovery and acknowledgement. It was only this, that the flame of the lantern set down near the altar was slightly but certainly flickering from a draught of air which it had not before received, and which came indubitably from the crevice between floor and altar where Norris was scraping away the lichens. We spent the rest of the night in the brilliantly lighted study, nervously discussing what we should do next. The discovery that some vault, deeper than the deepest known masonry of the Romans, underlay this accursed pile, some vault, unsuspected by the curious antiquarians of three centuries, would have been sufficient to excite us, without any background of the sinister. As it was, the fascination became twofold, and we paused in doubt whether to abandon our search and quit the priory forever in superstitious caution, or to gratify our sense of adventure and brave whatever horrors might await us in the unknown depths. By morning we had compromised and decided to go to London to gather a group of archaeologists and scientific men fit to cope with the mystery. It should be mentioned that before leaving the sub we had vainly tried to move the central altar, which we now recognised as the gate to a new pit of nameless fear. What secret would open the gate? Wiser men than we would have to find. During many days in London, Captain Norris and I presented our facts, conjectures, and legendary anecdotes to five eminent authorities, all men who could be trusted to respect any family disclosures which future explorations might develop. We found most of them little disposed to scoff, but instead intensely interested and sincerely sympathetic. It is hardly necessary to name them all, but I may say that they included Sir William Brinton, whose excavations in the Trode excited most of the world in their day. As we all took the train for Anchester, I felt myself poised on the brink of frightful revelations, a sensation symbolised by the air of mourning among the many Americans at the unexpected death of the President on the other side of the world. On the evening of August 7th we reached Exham Priory, where the servants assured me that nothing unusual had occurred. The cats, even old niggerman, had been perfectly placid, and not a trap in the house had been sprung. We were to begin exploring on the following day, awaiting which I assigned well-appointed rooms to all my guests. I myself retired in my own tower chamber, with Niggerman across my feet. Sleep came quickly, but hideous dreams assailed me. There was a vision of a Roman feast like that of Trimalchio, with a horror in a covered platter. Then came that damnable recurrent thing about the swineherd and his filthy drove in the twilit grotto. Yet when I awoke it was full daylight, with normal sounds in the house below. The rats, living or spectral, had not troubled me, and Niggerman was quietly asleep. 
on going down I found that the same tranquillity had prevailed elsewhere, a condition which one of the assembled savants, a fellow named Thornton, devoted to the psychic, rather absurdly laid to the fact that I had now been shown the thing which certain forces had wished to show me. All was now ready, and at eleven a.m. our entire group of seven men bearing powerful electric searchlights and implements of excavation, went down to the subcellar and bolted the door behind us. Niggerman was with us, for the investigators found no occasion to despise his excitability, and were indeed anxious that he be present in case of obscure rodent manifestations. We noted the Roman inscriptions and unknown altar designs only briefly, for three of the savants had already seen them, and all knew their characteristics. Prime attention was paid to the momentous central altar, and within an hour Sir William Brinton had caused it to tilt backward, balanced by some unknown species of counterweight. There now lay revealed such a horror as would have overwhelmed us had we not been prepared. Through a nearly square opening in the tiled floor, sprawling on a flight of stone steps so prodigiously worn that it was little more than an inclined plane at the centre, was a ghastly array of human or semi-human bones. Those which retained their co-location as skeletons showed attitudes of panic fear, and over all were the marks of rodent gnawing. The skulls denoted nothing short of utter idiocy, cretinism, or primitive semi-apedom. Above the hellishly littered steps arched a descending passage, seemingly chiselled from a solid rock, and conducting a current of air. This current was not a sudden noxious rush, as from a closed vault, but a cool breeze with something of freshness in it. We did not pause long, but shiveringly began to clear a passage down the steps. It was then that Sir William, examining the hewn walls, made the odd observation that the passage, according to the direction of the strokes, must have been chiselled from beneath. I must be very deliberate now and choose my words. After ploughing down a few steps amidst the gnawed bones, we saw that there was a light ahead, not any mystic phosphorescence, but a filtered daylight, which could not come except from unknown fissures in the cliff that overlooked the waste valley. That such fissures had escaped notice from outside was hardly remarkable, for not only is the valley wholly uninhabited, but the cliff is so high and beetling that only an aeronaut could study its face in detail. A few steps more, and our breaths were literally snatched from us by what we saw, so literally that Thornton, the psychic investigator, actually fainted in the arms of the dazed man who stood behind him. Nor is his plump face utterly white and flabby, simply cried out inarticulately, whilst I think that what I did was to gasp or hiss and cover my eyes. The man behind me, the only one of the party older than I, croaked the hackneyed, My God! in the most cracked voice I ever heard. Of seven cultivated men, only Sir William Brinton retained his composure, a thing more to his credit because he led the party and must have seen the sight first. It was a twilit grotto of enormous height, stretching away farther than the eye could see, a subterraneous world of limitless mystery and horrible suggestion. There were buildings and other architectural remains. In one terrified glance I saw a weird pattern of tumuli, a savage circle of monoliths, a low-domed Roman ruin, a sprawling Saxon pile, and an early English edifice of wood. But all these were dwarfed by the ghoulish spectacle presented by the general surface of the ground. 
for yards about the steps extended an insane tangle of human bones or bones at least as human as those on the steps like a foamy sea they stretched some fallen apart but others wholly or partly articulated as skeletons these latter invariably impostures of demoniac frenzy either fighting off some menace or clutching other forms with cannibal intent when dr trask the anthropologist stooped to classify the skulls he found a degraded mixture which utterly baffled him they were mostly lower than the piltdown man in the scale of evolution but in every case definitely human many were of higher grade and a very few were the skulls of supremely and sensitively developed types all the bones were gnawed mostly by rats but somewhat by others of the half-human drove mixed with them were many tiny bones of rats fallen members of the lethal army which closed the ancient epic i wonder that any man among us lived and kept his sanity through that hideous day of discovery not hoffman or hussimans could conceive a scene more wildly incredible more frenetically repellent or more gothically grotesque than the twilit grotto through which we seven staggered each stumbling on revelation after revelation and trying to keep the nonce from thinking of the events which must have taken place there three hundred years or a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand years ago it was the antechamber of hell and poor thornton fainted again when trask told him that some of the skeleton things must have descended as quadrupeds to the last twenty or more generations horror piled on horror as we began to interpret the architectural remains the quadruped things with their occasional recruits from the biped class had been kept in stone pens out of which they must have broken in their last delirium of hunger or rat fear there had been great herds of them evidently fattened on the coarse vegetables whose remains could be found as a sort of poisonous ensilage at the bottom of huge stone bins older than rome i knew now why my ancestors had had such excessive gardens would to heaven i could forget the purpose of the herds i did not have to ask sir william standing with his searchlight in the roman ruin translated aloud the most shocking ritual i have ever known and told of the diet of the antediluvian cult which the priests of sibylle found and mingled with their own norris used as he was to the trenches could not walk straight when he came out of the english building it was a butcher shop and kitchen he had expected that but it was too much to see english implements in such a place and to read familiar english graffiti there some as recent as sixteen ten i could not go into that building that building whose demon activities were stopped only by the dagger of my ancestor walter de la poor what i did venture to enter was the low saxon building whose oaken door had fallen and there i found a terrible row of ten stone cells with rusty bars three had tenants all skeletons of high grade and on the bony finger of one i found a seal ring with my own coat of arms sir william found a vault with far older cells below the roman chapel but these cells were empty below them was a low crypt with cases of formerly arranged bones some of them bearing terrible parallel inscriptions carved in latin greek and the tongue of phrygia meanwhile dr trask had opened one of the prehistoric tumuli and brought to light skulls which were slightly more human than a gorilla's and which bore indescribable ideographic carvings through all this horror my cat 
stalked unperturbed. Once I saw him monstrously perched atop a mountain of bones, and wondered at the secrets that might lie behind his yellow eyes. Having grasped, to some slight degree, the frightful revelations of this twilit area, an area so hideously foreshadowed by my recurrent dream, we turned to that apparently boundless depth of midnight cavern, where no ray of light from the cliff could penetrate. We shall never know what sightless Stygian worlds yawn beyond the little distance we went, for it was decided that such secrets are not good for mankind. But there was plenty to engross us close at hand, for we had not gone far before the searchlights showed that accursed infinity of pits in which the rats had feasted and whose sudden lack of replenishment had driven the ravenous rodent army first to turn on the living herds of starving things, and then to burst forth from the priory in that historic orgy of devastation which the peasants will never forget. God, those carrion-black pits of sword-picked bones and opened skulls! Those nightmare chasms choked with the pithecanthropoid, Celtic, roman and english bones of countless unhallowed centuries some of them were full and none can say how deep they had once been others were still bottomless to our searchlights and peopled by unnameable fancies what i thought of the hapless rats that stumbled into such traps amidst the blackness of their quests in this grisly tartarus once my foot slipped near a horribly yawning brink, and I had a moment of ecstatic fear. I must have been musing a long time, for I could not see any of the party but the plump Captain Norris. Then there came a sound from that inky, boundless farther distance that I thought I knew, and I saw my old black cat dart past me like a winged Egyptian god straight into the illimitable gulf of the unknown. But I was not far behind, for there was no doubt after another second. It was the eldritch scurrying of those fiend-born rats, always questing for new horrors and determined to lead me on even unto those grinning caverns of earth's centre where Nyalathotep, the mad faceless god, housed blindly to the piping of two amorphous idiot flute-players. My searchlight expired, but still I ran. I heard voices and yowls and echoes, but above all there gently rose that impious, insidious scurrying, gently rising, rising as a stiff, bloated corpse gently rises above an oily river that flows under endless onyx bridges to a black and putrid sea. Something bumped into me, something soft and plump. It must have been the rats, the viscous, gelatinous, ravenous army that feast on the dead and the living. Why shouldn't rats eat a de la poor, as a de la poor eats forbidden things? The war ate my boy, damn them all, and the Yanks ate Carfax with flames and burnt Grandsire de la Poe and the secret. No, no, I tell you, I am not that demon swineherd in the twilight grotto. It was not Edward Norrie's fat face on that flabby fungus thing. Who says I am a de la Poe? He lived, but my boy died. Shall a Norris hold the lands of a Dilla poor? It's voodoo, I tell you. That spotted snake, curse you, Thornton, I'll teach you to faint at what my family do. Slud, thou stinketh, I'll learn ye how to gust, while ye swink me like wis. Magna mater, magna mater, atis, dire ad aghads, ad adan, agus bas dunac ort, donus dollars ort, agus litza. <coughs> that is what they say I said when they found me in the blackness after three hours. Found me crouching in the blackness over the plump, half-eaten body of Captain Norris, and my own cap leaping and tearing at my throat. 
Now they have blown up Exxon Priory, taken my nigger man away from me, and shut me into this barred room at Hanwell, with fearful whispers about my heredity and experiences. Thornton is in the next room, and they prevent me from talking to him. They are trying, too, to suppress most of the facts concerning the Priory. When I speak of poor Norris, they accuse me of a hideous thing. But they must know that I did not do it. They must know it was the rats, the slithering, scurrying rats, whose scampering will never let me sleep. The demon rats that race behind the padding in this room and beckon me down to greater horrors than I have ever known. The rats they can never hear. The rats... The Rats in the Walls End of The Rats in the Walls by H. P. Lovecraft Recording by Andy Sames Teeth by Galen C. Collin From Weird Tales Magazine, April 1926 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Terrible was the vengeance prepared by Ling Pu for the lover of Ti Ling. Teeth by Galen C. Collin. Paul Vermain awoke slowly. His blue eyes blinked. He stretched his long form painfully. His strength was hardly enough to lift his blond head from the floor on which he lay. As full consciousness came to him, he gazed about. Above, beneath, on all sides, nothing but closely fitted masonry. A tightly barred window of tiny dimensions admitted the dim light. This was a new experience, which the young American could not fathom. His last memory was of the wonderful Chinese twilight as he lingered at the wall of old Ling Pu's garden, awaiting Ling Pu's goldenly beautiful daughter, Ti Ling. He recalled now a faint, sweet odor coming to his nostrils. He had felt a strange drowsiness stealing upon him and wondered if the scent could be from the white poppies across the wall. He had rested his head on the wall for a minute. Then, this awakening. As his strength returned, he arose. A careful search revealed that nothing had been taken from him while he slept. His clothing was not even must or awry. Robbery, evidently, was not the motive. His cell was entirely devoid of furniture. It contained not even a bench or box. But, by standing on tiptoe, he could just reach the grated window with his eyes. The grounds outside were strangely familiar, in a sort of warped and backward way. Then it dawned upon him. He was staring at Ling Pu's garden, but from the side of the stately palace, instead of the garden wall. Why should he, Paul Vermain, representative of the Standard Oil Company, in Hiawaka, be a prisoner in the old Chinese professor's home. True, Ling Pu was of the older generation and looked with great disfavor upon all foreign devils, but his hatred had never been active. True, the young American had held hands with Ti Ling, the daughter of Ling Pu, many times over the garden wall in the hazy dusk. But according to American standards, there was nothing more than a little pleasurable indiscretion in this. Rack his brain as he would, Vermain could not untangle the mystery. Still drowsy, he lay down again, determined to puzzle his head no more, but to let the solution work itself out as it would. He dozed. Then a sound as a bolt withdrawn awakened him. Still reclining, he opened his eyes. Directly above his face, a stone moved. Then it swung upward, revealing an opening not more than a foot square. 
A wrinkled and benevolent yellow face filled the aperture for a moment, and twinkling black eyes surveyed him. Then the face was withdrawn, and a small silver bucket on the end of a chain was lowered beside him. Raising himself on one elbow, he lifted it. The contents looked like water. He tasted it. It was water, clear and cool. Becoming conscious of a great thirst, he drained a mighty draught. The bucket fell from his grasp, its contents drenching his clothing. He tried to lift his hand to raise the bucket again. Every hint of power was gone. He could not even move his head. It was only with great effort that he summoned strength to close his eyelids. When they were closed, it was a gigantic task to open them again. The feeling of drowsiness swiftly fled. While every muscle was paralyzed, his mind seemed stimulated to as great a degree. He could feel the discomfort of the uneven rock floor, but could not alleviate it by a single movement. Some strange, powerful drug had him firmly in its grip. A door in the wall beside him swung silently open, and four half-clothed coolies entered. Without a word they lifted the American and carried him up a short flight of steps to a spacious room, topped by a skylight of orange glass. In the center of the room they deposited their burden on a teakwood table, hollowed to fit the body of a man most comfortably. By great effort, Vermain forced his eyes to survey the room. Tiled walls and tiled floor were laid in queer mosaic patterns. Everywhere the same motif was repeated, a great dragon with widespread jaws, but toothless as an old hag. He had seen the design many times before, and cudgeled his brain to remember. Then it came to him. This was the insignia that graced the lentil of every Chinese dentist who had successfully fulfilled his apprenticeship on the graduated wooden pegs. It was more a sign of great strength of wrist and finger than of knowledge. But the practice of dentistry was a profession for the sons of mandarins alone in old China. Then Vermain's eyes roved again. On the walls were panel after panel all studded with wooden pegs of various sizes and lengths. Nothing else but bare floor was visible. The truth rushed upon him. This is where Ling Pu taught his pupils the quaint art of pulling teeth from unwilling jaws, by main strength and artful twist. This table upon which he was lying was beyond doubt the scene of the final examination of the apprentices. Actual practice on actual teeth. The young American could not summon strength enough to shudder. At his head, and consequently out of sight, he heard a door open. A babble of Chinese came to his ears. Although Vermain was fairly proficient in the ancient language, he could distinguish but few of the words, for each of the voices seemed to be trying to outdo the others. Then they were stilled by a voice deep and resonant, which he recognized as coming from Ling Pu. The old professor approached the table and stood at Vermain's feet. For several minutes the Chinaman gazed silently at the recumbent figure, the perpetual smile, the wrinkled but kindly old face, the close-fitting black skull-cap, and the folded hands gave old Ling Pu a particularly benevolent expression which his words could not dispel. Ling Pu welcomes the honorable American to this most miserable hovel, began the old Chinaman in his sing-songy salutation. The gods have been good to Ling Pu, the unworthy. They have ordained the white man's visit when Ling Pu's need was the greatest. The hour of the tests of the unworthy pupils was at hand. There was no fitting subject. Then the American comes with his strong white teeth. 
truly the gods are good words and words but no explanation it was now that fear entered vermain's mind for the first time he tried to speak but even his tongue was paralyzed he wanted to explain that there was some mistake that he was vermain representative of the standard oil company that he had never harmed ling pu that he was the warm friend in fact the accepted lover of ling pu's daughter he wanted to tell ling pu that he would feel greatly honored to make ti ling his wife in the good old american way it was no use the words would not come slowly the old man turned to the waiting pupils and as he beckoned he called out the names fang too come thither to you, most honorable son of Wu Fang, shall be the honor of the first test. With a wrinkled thumb and finger, Ling Pu opened the unresisting jaws of the subject. Look, he said at the waiting pupil, the teeth are tight set and strong. It will be a test worthy of all the skill Ling Pu has taught you. See, the one next to the first molar the roots are straight but long and fast grown to the flesh the tooth is small and your grip must be powerful ah it started but your finger slipped try again a twist to the right and a twist to the left now a straight pull see the red clean blood that was worthy of your master the white man's body twitched in agony but he was powerless to move only the pressure of the finger and thumb were needed to keep his jaws apart so potent was the drug that bound his muscles the blood from the wounded mouth almost strangled him until the old professor and his pupil rolled the unresisting form over and let the red fluid drip on the tiled floor then another pupil was called and still another until six teeth had lost their moorings in agony clean extractions worthy of china's best brought exclamations of pride and pleasure to the happy pupils from the old teacher bungling work that crushed flesh and bone was followed by clucks of impatience at inferior skill with each operation vermain's agony became worse until it was unbearable then he fainted when the young american awoke it was dawn of another day the effect of the drug had worn off and his strength had returned the jaw with the toothless holes was inflamed and swollen it ached terribly his throat was parched and his whole body was crying for water yet he determined that not another drop would pass his lips in this hellhole. Frantically, he shook the bars. They were so strong that the strength of six men would not have budged them. The door was close-fitting and barred from the outside. He could not move it. In despair, he paced the floor of the tiny cell. It was midday when the trap-door was opened and the bucket was lowered with a thick-voiced curse that was half grown vermain snatched it up and dashed it against the wall silently the trap-door closed and he was again alone with his thirst and pain near evening the torturers again offered him water and again he refused it the night was one of almost madness thirst and pain filled the hours and gradually thirst took the ascendancy the thickly swollen lips uttered growled curses came morning and with it another offer of water vermain clutched at the bucket and drew back his arm to dash it at the wall he stayed his hand he gazed at the cool crystal clear liquid with a groan he drained the vessel he sank to the floor inert once more the coolies came and carried him to the torture chamber this time 
but four teeth were dragged from the protesting jawbone when mercifully unconsciousness came vermain awoke again and found water beside him this time he drank thirst was supreme over pain six days elapsed before the last tooth was pulled by the master himself vermain was almost mad with agony of body and mind he had long given up hope of rescue or escape death seemed certain for the chinese would not dare liberate their prisoner to tell his story a delirious fever developed and he raved through three mad days he lived over again the agony of the torture table yet at intervals the cool small hand of t ling seemed to ease his aching brow it was during these intervals that the countenance of ling pu would darken with hate as he peered through the trapdoor at the stricken foreigner for it enraged him to hear a white devil making tender love to his daughter even in delirium then one morning the fever left the american and he sank to the floor weak and exhausted this time the bucket contained nothing but water cool and sparkling his abundant vitality soon responded to food and drink and he became almost himself again ling pu's decision was made the four frightened coolies entered and overpowered their weakened prisoner then they bound his wrists behind his back again vermain was taken to the chamber of tortures but this time there were no waiting pupils directly to the table in the center moved the prisoner and his guards a glance at the bed of horrors brought a shudder of remembrance to his frame for on the table pegged in one long row in a testing frame were all the teeth that had once been so much a part of him and that had been so painfully removed vermain closed his eyes again at the sight for a long minute he opened them again at a soft touch on his arm beside him was t ling lovely as a lotus blossom Fermain's heart leapt at the sight of her. The love that he had thought so strong before now overwhelmed him. Gone were his misgivings. She was Mongolian. He was white. Very well, that would be the difference. He was soon to die, but living or dead, Ti Ling was his. Timidly, she looked at her lover with pitying eyes. Then she started as their eyes met in his was no hint of fright or pain they were brimming over with love a blush suffused her golden skin and her gaze fell a tremor of joy shook her slender frame then both raised their eyes to the figure across the table ling pu was seated in his great carved chair his feet on a golden footstool Gorgeous mandarin robes covered his spare body, and the tasseled cap decorated the shaven head. Across his knees rested a long, curved, sacrificial sword. His voice, now harsh with hatred, startled the lovers. Oh, miserable Teeling, he snarled. See to what depths of agony the foreign devil has gone that he should presume to covet the daughter of Ling Pu, the Mandarin. His pain and anguish have been so great that the gods have only permitted him to live through it that he might suffer the last stroke at the hands of Ling Pu. I have made him hideous in your sight, so that through the ages that will be your memory of him. I have seen love for him in your eyes, and for that madness you shall also die. With the sacrificial sword of my ancestors will the vengeance be taken. Look at this unsightly creature, Ti Ling, and hate him as I do. Oh, father, said Ti Ling, in a low, clear voice, though you cut off his ears, dig out his eyes, pull out his hair, sever each hand and foot yet would i love this american 
gladly do I go to death with him. Ling Pu's face turned the color of pale old ivory. His hands shook with rage. Several times he tried to speak and could not. He grasped the great sword in both hands and raised to his feet for the fatal stroke. The weapon flashed a baleful reflection as it was lifted above the old Chinaman's head. It began to descend, and Ti Ling bowed her head to receive its force on her slender neck. The sword clattered to the floor, and Ling Pu flung his arms wildly forward to catch himself, as the golden footstool overturned beneath his stamping feet. The flying hands found the table's edge too late, as the shaven head came down with a crash upon the long row of firm white teeth. The old professor's body went limp as it rolled from the table, taking with it, firmly embedded in the left temple, a long, sharp incisor. The Standard Oil Company's representative in Hiawaku is an upstanding young American, blue of eye and blonde of hair. His pearly white teeth are the delight of his goldenly beautiful Chinese wife, Ti Ling. You would say that Paul Remain's teeth are his own, and truly they are, all but one that is buried with the dust of Ling Pu. The teeth he gathered from the teakwood table in the palace of Ling Pu made a trip across the Pacific to the best dentists in the state, and the plates are marvels of the dental art. The End of Teeth by Galen C. Collin The Telltale Band of Yellow by Hamilton Craigie From The Black Mask, November, 1920 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The Telltale Band of Yellow by Hamilton Craigie Chickenfoot Dara with a skinful of cheap Italian red wine, lurched, stiff-armed, against the basement grill. The warp treads of the ancient staircase creaked under the pressure of careful footfalls. Then, at what he saw, outlined in the red circle of the single gas-jet, Dara's loose lips sagged open. Stark, elemental fear strangled the outcry in his throat. His blunt fingernails met like talons hooked into the basement gate. A moment he stood thus, while above him, like a face without a body, there floated against a dark pool of blackness the dreadful head, like in its semblance to nothing animal or human, save in the broad, porcine snout. For a moment it held against the red glimmer of the gas, which, in a debased areola, seemed to pale to a flat, toneless shading of unholy fire. Then it passed, like the brief smoke of a wind-blown torch. Dara knew nothing of hippogriffs, of leprechauns. He might have called it a gargoyle, or a gin, had he known them by their names. Nor was he familiar with Anubis, the dog-faced deity of the Egyptians. But the head which he had beheld was kin to none of these. Now, spread eagle against the grate, he fell suddenly sick, the fumes of the cheap liquor he had drunk mounting in a swift, dizzying surge against his brain. Stumbling, reeling, clawing desperately outward, behind him the memory of the thing which he had seen, he gained the street and after a headlong flight of several blocks, a park bench. But his last conscious impression, ere he sank into the stupor which would last until well into the next day's noon, was of a face which seemed to float, head high, at the height of a tall man, like a face without a body, a face unspeakable, inhuman, 
and yet real in its terrifying semblance half dog half pig whole horror and with it too ere he sank like a stone into the sea-green silence of oblivion there persisted in his nostrils a savor a stench an acrid faint tang as though the very air itself had been tainted by the passage of that nameless terror two detective sergeant sensibaugh off duty at two a m went up the steps of the Varick street tenement wherein he kept bachelor quarters number thirty two was a malodorous building in a neighborhood grim and chancy enough of its kind on one side there loomed the squat bulk of a stable on the other the towering outline of a chemical plant sensibaugh however was thinking that it was his last night as a bachelor and consequently his last night in number thirty two for tomorrow he would be married his last night but tonight despite the joyousness of his mood there was something in the air he felt it as a heaviness a deadness a breathless weighty hush like the tension before storm but the august evening was close and sultry and yet as he mounted the worn steps into his mind's eye unbidden there came a face writhen snarling bestial vengeful the face of duster joe masterman gang leader and all-round crook as he had last seen it on the day that masterman had gone up the river to begin his ten-year term for loft burglary it had been sensibaugh's testimony which had convicted the gangster and masterman had sworn to get him you damned double-crossing dick masterman had promised i'll get you and it'll take me just ten years and a day and then but others had threatened sensibaugh there was nothing novel in it it was just part of the day's work the vicious hatred of an underworld for all that typified the law an hereditary and accustomed hatred accepted and understood today however duster joe was out no doubt he was even now showing himself in the haunts he had aforetime favored gas pipe louis doubtless for one it may have been habit that caused the policeman to feel for his service pistol as he paused in the entrance of the hallway but as he reached behind him his groping fingers suddenly became rigid a faint hissing breath sounded from his lips as he felt his right arm caught and held abruptly from behind sensibaugh pivoted as a boxer ducks under his adversary's lead whirling sideways to face the empty street then he grinned foolishly clucked with his tongue and released his coat sleeve where it had been caught in the ornamental ironwork of the banister but he hesitated on the threshold glancing upward where above the black well of the stairway there hung a faint pinpoint of gas sensibaugh was not imaginative but it was his last night as a bachelor almost it seemed as if the touch upon his coat sleeve had been a warning a message a summons laid upon him by the urgency of invisible fingers nonsense but the murky air continued heavy lifeless the unwinking eye of the gaslight somehow sinister malevolent as had been said sensibaugh was not imaginative but now like a swimmer breasting a tide of impenetrable and soundless flood he mounted with slow steps the narrow stair and about him as he went forward the darkness closed in like a wall sinister threatening above and beyond him that pinpoint of gas like an evil star now curiously bluish flat unreal as a flickering painted flame sensibaugh loosened his pistol in its arm holster 
searching the thick piled shadows massed beyond the fell circle of that brooding beacon he drew his colt if masterman awaited him somewhere upon the stair or upon the landing above he would be ready for him hugging the wall for the more silent footing there afforded the policeman one hand before him feeling along the plaster the other holding his gun went upward steadily in the whispering gloom eyes strained against the blackness ears attuned to the throbbing silence like the beating of a heart the gas offered no illumination beyond the flat nimbus of pale flame but it seemed to sensibah that if he could see nothing there yet lingered in the atmosphere an aura a something felt yet unperceived something or someone had been before him on that stairway if he or it had passed like the passing of a candle's breath in the malodorous darkness at the stairhead he crouched swung up his arm and the bright lance of his pocket flash clove the darkness in a dazzling arc to right and left but there was nothing he halted at the door to his chambers shrugged inserted the key in the lock the heavy soundproof door swung wide then following his entrance slammed shut behind him with a muffled clang there came a blow at the base of his brain like the impact of a mighty hand he staggered stumbled fell prone into a struggling choking hell which took him by the threat a rising tide engulfing him with an acrid and intolerable stench his gun barked once at the convulsive pressure of his finger but it was a dead man who fired the shot three officer williamson passed on his beat through varick street halted a moment before number thirty two a puzzled look on his broad good-humored countenance for a brief instant head in air he sniffed upward like a pointer then his face gray he reeled abruptly against an area gate his hand at his throat coughing like a man in a fit his side partner turning the corner as it chanced at the sight of williamson doubled over at the area gate came on at a run unslinging his pistol what's up jack he called then he too halted in mid-career falling to a stiff-legged walk as the acrid stench smote him in the face in a blinding overpowering flood with his last remaining glimmer of sense his fist crashed into the glass of a firebox then he slumped into oblivion after a moment cries echoed down the street followed by the clang and rattle of the patrol men came up at a run halted turned back then out of the confusion there arose the cry of gas but it was not until the arrival of the rescue squad that some order was obtained out of the chaos when following the arrival of the police and fire companies the sufferers were treated with a vaporized solution of milk of magnesia and williamson and his partner removed to the nearest hospital but as for detective sensibah he was beyond their ministrations gunson sensibah's partner and friend was stubborn in his belief that it was not altogether an accident which had been responsible for the death of sensibah it was an accident all right but it was planned i tell you chief he was insisting to inspector murchison his immediate superior if you're thinking of masterman dave you're all wrong boy replied old dan he's not in on this how would he be anyway you know what it was the gas tank exploded in thompson's warehouse next door and well that's all right chief but how do you account for the fact that it got into sensibah's room first why 
that it smashed through the party wall? It was only a few inches thick there, you know, and Sitsabaw's rooms were right up against it. Sure, Inspector, but this is what I believe. Gunson leaned forward earnestly, tapping his knee with a blunt forefinger. I believe that someone, Masterman, for a good guess, made that hole in the wall, pushed the tank through, and then smashed it open in Sitsabaw's room just a little while before poor Jim came home to die. He paused. Masterman knew all about tanks and gas. He was an expert before he turned Yegg. An oxyacetylene blowpipe would have done it easy for him. The inspector grunted. That's all very well, Dave, he made answer. But there's one little thing you've overlooked. There's one flaw in your argument. Well, suppose Masterman, or whoever it was, got into the warehouse, breached the wall, rolled in the tank, and let out the gas with a blowpipe. Well and good. Then how do you account for the fact that the murderer, if there was a murderer, was not himself gassed? You know what chlorine is, Dave. No, it was just an accident. That's all there is to it. Gunderson's jaw set stubbornly. I can't answer that, Inspector, he said. I'm not going to try, just now. But as sure as... as Duster Joe Masterman came out of stir when his time was up, Jim Sensabaugh was murdered. And you can't make me believe anything else. He rose, his face grim with purpose. You'll give me a week, working alone, he questioned. That's all I ask. A week, no more. By way of answer, the grizzled inspector bowed his head. Sinsabaw had been one of his best men. He liked Gunderson. Go to it, my boy, he said heavily, and good luck. Gunderson took his leave, but there was one thing he had neglected to mention to Inspector Murchison. A small thing, if you will, but a clue which had furnished him with an idea of something he had observed at the house on Virick Street on the day of the explosion, as the fireman had issued from the house of death. This he had kept to himself, but time was precious. A day might be too little, or too much. 4. Chickenfoot Dara reclined against the bar at Gas Pipe Louis. At Louis, you can still purchase a fair quantity of hooch for four bits even now, and the Snowbird Brigade makes it a headquarters too. Dara, his head wagging foolishly, his loose lips mouthing his words, retold a story for the twentieth time, half to himself, half to a saturnine individual with a predatory nose and a straight gash for a mouth, who had, for some reason, bought Dara a drink. "'Here's luck,' said Dara. "'Well, as I was saying, I seen this ghost, or whatever it was, as I was going into the basement door. It looked like—it looked like—' He paused, shivered, drained his glass. "'Yes,' prompted his new friend. "'Like what, Bo?' He spoke in a friendly tone, yet like velvet over steel. But if Dara could have seen his face, the look in the deep-set implacable eyes, his whistling breath might have ended in a sudden gasp. But he did not. Why, why, like a dog, a pig, mister, he replied. I seen it, sure, but I don't know. His head wagged his eyes glassy with his potions. He fumbled again with his loose lips, muttering inarticulately. The stranger cleared his throat. Then he spoke in a carrying voice. "'You had em, sure, Bo," he asserted. "'The jimmies. You'll be seeing pink monkeys and green elephants next if you don't keep your feet down. I'll say so.' He glanced about the room. Guess you're right, mister, mumbled the derelict without offense. 
I had him bad, sure enough. And then, with an abrupt, drunken stubbornness, "'Twas Dago red wine. I ain't never seen things with Dago red wine, mister. It was there. I seen it. It moved. Right under the gas. It moved. Sure. Well, good night. Good night. He turned and swayed, lurched out into the night, a grotesque, shambling figure, misshapen, formless as the long, wavering shadow which fled ahead, cast by the sputtering arc at the corner. And behind him, behind, he did not see that other shadow, quick, stealthy, furtive, for all of its bulk, a shadow with predatory eyes and a trap-like mouth, moving like a great, grim cat in the darkness. The shadow was nearer now, and a little wind, pattering in the dust like the feet of an invisible army of the dead, stole forward on the wings of the night, whispering, ending with a quick shriek and a sudden hush. A storm was brewing in the west. Like figures in a dream, pursuer and pursued entered a broad belt of darkness, like a deep well of night. The clump-clump of the derelict's heavy brogues echoed for a moment across the cobbles at the intersection of an alley, beyond it the revealing radiance of a street lamp. He saw it, and that was all, for while the brooding blackness held there came a snick of steel a choking gurgle a muffled cry like the quick squeak of a mouse in the wainscot a thud silence chicken foot dara had passed on into the darkness five gunson early in the evening had paused a moment in his search for masterman before the window of a store which had caused him to suck in his breath in the sheer surprise of a discovery which he was certain dovetailed with the other clues which he had turned up at number thirty two he had heard the story of dara at second hand and now as he stared through the dingy panes of the old curiosity shop a sudden inspiration took him by the throat why why of course that was it it had to be for Gunson was confident that he had seen Dara's ghost, or, at any rate, his counterfeit presentment, leering at him through the dirt-encrusted pane. But a hurried questioning of the proprietor, a Spanish Jew with a fondness for gesticulation in inverse ratio to his almost unintelligible speech, gave him pause. But only for a moment. Gunson, however, made a rather peculiar purchase, which he bestowed carefully in an inner pocket. Masterman, after all, need not have entered that shop. In the second place he was far too shrewd a malefactor for that. But the suggestion remained, fantastic, incredible, as he owed it to himself to be, and Gunson, at the corner of the street, had had corroboration, so to speak, when a wizened nondescript rose up almost at his elbow dara chickenfoot he's at gillespie's he said to tell yous he'd wait and gunson without more ado had sought the derelict and the saloon of gaspipe louis perhaps five minutes after the departure of the vagrant and his shadow louis knew nothing of course that was to be expected. Gunson could spare no time to tighten the thumbscrews of his inquisition. It was going on for eleven. He hurried. That rumhound Dara been here lately, Louis? he had asked. For a moment, as he faced the swart Syracusian behind his stained and battered bar, Gunson was conscious of the movement at his back. A ripple, an eddy, a swirl sudden current of electric tension in the stained and spotted mirror he could see but little but at louis's reply nah he's a bum 
he go eight nine o'clock and a look which he fancied that he saw in the sullen furtive eyes of the saloon keeper gunson whirled on his heel in a lightning pivot they came at him in a headlong rush silent no guns knives out life preservers an evil ring of dark faces and clutching hands something hissed in a thin drawn whine at the level of his cheek the knife clanged quivering in the mahogany voices rose bestial snarling croak him croak the bull a slung shot at the end of a swarthy hairy arm drove over his shoulder gunson had been trained up from the streets the alleys to a habit of lightning decision was added the perfect coordination of muscles steel hard and willow withered now he multiplied himself the fighting flame of his norse forebearers rising to a barsark fury at the thought that these were the paid hirelings doubtless of a man who he was now convinced had murdered sensibaugh his fist behind the weight of two hundred pounds of iron-hard muscle crashed into the grinning face the face was blotted out hammed in as he was there was no time for gunplay it was fist and elbow against knife and club in a ferocious free-for-all of which the issue could not be long in doubt he went to one knee under the glancing impact of a sandbag heaved upward shook his head as a pugilist rallies his whirling wits and then muscle and mind and body hurled himself in one furious headlong dive into and through that vicious ring of steel the spank of a clean-cut elbow was followed by the groaning curse and for the first time the crash of an automatic and dull tsing of splintered glass a red-hot needle seared through his cheek as ducking under the outstretched arm of the last of his attackers his swinging uppercut was followed by a grunt and a slumping fall then he was through the swinging doors and away they would not follow him of that he was reasonably certain but nevertheless he went forward at a lunging run jerking his service pistol from its holster as he approached the black maw of the alley then he stumbled and went to his hands and knees fumbled a moment in the darkness produced his pocket flash and in the radius of that clear beam he saw staring up at him from the cobbles the dead face with its straying eyes and brief twisted grin of chickenfoot dara masterman secure in the knowledge that his decoy had by this time accomplished his purpose he had had gunson trailed for the best part of the evening went swiftly to a room which he kept in a slightly more respectable neighborhood this he had used often enough in the past gunson was aware of it of course now with that healthy fatigue which is the prerogative of thieves and murderers as well as honest men masterman flung himself on the bed he was dog-tired so much so that he had removed his coat and hat merely before he was breathing easily like a man whose conscience had never been burdened by anything heavier than a hearty dinner as a matter of fact he had bent over to unlace his shoes but in the very act sleep had overtaken him if he had done so this story might never have been written but he did not and he had had them on since the night of Sinsabaugh's death just twenty-four hours previous it had required no special keenness on the part of gunson to deduce that masterman would do the very thing that he had done seek his room the detective knew the address and anyway the obvious had its importance he would try here first at any rate slipping in quietly by the side door the room was over a saloon on a quiet street gunson unseen mounted the narrow stair listened a moment at the door on the second landing 
turned the knob noiselessly, unlocked the door by turning the key from the outside with a long, thin wire made for this purpose, and entered. And so Masterman awoke at a dazzling light which struck him full in the eyes. He blinked owlishly, then sat up with a jerk, his hand reaching for his gun, and then falling at his side at a crisp voice of the detective. I've got you covered, Masterman. The Yegg cursed, stared a moment wildly. Then his pig eyes snapped evilly at Gunson's other hand, reaching upward behind him, turning up the light. Gunson, putting away his flashlight, bent a hard eye on his prisoner. I want you, Masterman, he said evenly. You rotten killer. Step lively now, you hear? But Masterman, his composure returning after that first amazed glance which had assured him that Gunson was unarmed, spoke, sneeringly confident. You've got nothing on me, Gunson, he said, his heavy face, with its blue-shaven jowls, assuming a satiric mask. You can't prove nothing. I have, or rather you have, replied Gunson cryptically, and I can prove everything. He was beginning. Shake a leg now. When abruptly there came a startling reversal. Not for nothing had Masterman abode aforetime in that haven for the dwellers by night, Paris, of the Thousand Eyes. And among other accomplishments of that grim underworld of the Apache, most ruthless of his kind, had he acquired a more than average efficiency in the art of la savate now at gunson's crisp command he came suddenly into action his right foot shod with its pointy boot swung upward in a bone-smashing kick almost too deadly swift for the eye to follow aimed at the detective's face the impact of that bruising kick would mean unconsciousness a broken jaw or worse but if Masterman was consummate in the attack, in the lightning upthrust of the deadly lunge, like the swift swing of a javelin, Gunson was not unprepared. There is but one parry for that abrupt passade, a single deft movement, and a stopple as swift and certain as the delivery of the kick itself. Gunson moved his head a scant half inch to the right as a boxer evades the whiplash of a straight left, his hand at the same instant curving in a short arc. His fingers closed like iron about the yegg's ankle. There came a quick heave, an abrupt explosion of movement, and Masterman crashed downward to the floor. He glared defiance and implacable hate, merged, however, with a certain respect. But still, he rasped out between pants of breath. You got nothing on me, Gunson. You think you're wise, don't you? You've got it on yourself, repeated Gunson. Then he leaned over the fallen man, his words slow, bitter, dripping with the still acid of a corrosive vengeance. You're slick, Masterman, but you overlook one thing one little thing you're in Bo, up to your neck heels overhead i'll say he barked a short grim laugh i had the motive all i needed was a clue and i got it at number thirty two while i was watching the fireman come out you croaked dara because he'd seen this with his free hand he jerked from his pocket the purchase he'd made at Spanish Joe's, thrusting it before Masterman. A sinister exhibit indeed. The ghost of Dara's perverted dreams. A gas mask of the French type, long snouted like a boar, terrifying indeed, as an accessory to silent halls, dim night, and alcoholic imaginations. But that isn't all, Masterman continued the detective 
it's not a circumstance to this thing you fastened on yourself he stopped his voice rising to a note of triumph you're in masterman ankle deep he cried bending swiftly and jerking the half-laced shoe from the foot of the murderer yellow he exulted and that's your brand your shillabar for as acid acts on litmus so chlorine impregnates with its revealing color change the substances which it touches across and across where the blue sock on the murderer came above the protection of the shoe there shone a stigma of ineffable guilt the eradicable unescapable indelible proof even as gunson had seen it on the stockings of the fireman the revealed and all revealing stain a broad band of starring yellow the end of the tell-tale band of yellow by hamilton craigie the throwback by orlin frederick from weird tales october 1926 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dale grothman a short tale of horror the throwback by orland frederick hines was a corporal in our own battery none of his buddies ever thought about him or if they did it was only to wonder why he had been made he was extremely round-shouldered heavy-set awkwardly muscled his hands were large and broad his hair dark his face cruel but it is almost impossible to describe his eyes they were tiny black discs shallow and yet too deep to penetrate shifting yet darting queer glances directly at one at times they seemed quiet never gentle or kind but docile like those of a great beast raised in captivity but how they flashed when the madness was aroused there was a peculiar brute insanity which so entwined itself with his nature that it was inseparable his eyes flashed with the venom of the pacing tiger when his will was crossed and their glance sent shivers of dread of unspeakable horror up and down one spine it was not the ordinary fear of danger i am too accustomed to facing death to notice that but the intangible loathing a horror which paralyzed all motion a voice from ages past which spoke and held one in its grip while some great terror approached no definite form of dread took precedence yet there was all the grinding torture of crunching bones the sound of ripping flesh the smell of warm blood time and again i have thanked my lucky stars that i never met hines alone on the open prairie in the dead of night his eyes held a powerful hypnotism which would have made me powerless even to shriek i avoided him as i would the beasts of the jungle if unarmed he was of the species that strikes for the love of cruelty and that devastated belgium somehow heinz made friends of a few i suppose they were satellites of his stronger will perhaps they were drawn to him by that blood tie of their kind which ages had not broken love of cruelty his parents emigrated from prussia in eighteen ninety five actuated no doubt by the same restlessness which caused the throwback of centuries in their firstborn what irony that he was to fight against the very land which lent asylum to his forebears we were stationed at a western post when an incident occurred which i have never forgotten the mystery of the affair has never been solved officially but to me it is clear as the noonday sun perhaps i am wrong but i think not 
I have no evidence other than my eyes and that strange fourth sense which held me in Hines' power when his spells came on. He had gone out sometime in the afternoon. It was Sunday. He returned before eleven and turned in. I saw him as he entered the tent. His eyes flamed at the moment with a greenish light, like those of a wolverine in the shadows of the woods. His hands trembled as he reached for the flap to draw it back, and his lips parted like a dog snarling over a bone. Then he grinned. That grin haunts me yet. He was like a lynx, hard put for food, when it has smelled fresh blood. The following morning we learned that there had been a murder, supposedly by some maddened beast. A man's body was found on the open plain a mile from the nearest habitation. No one had heard any sound of struggle during the night, but the body was torn apart, ripped open by great cruel claws. Or was it hands? There were marks of teeth upon the neck where it, or he, had sucked the warm blood. The flesh was bruised from head to foot as if beaten mercilessly with a club. Hines was there with the rest of the boys, to help if need be, but he seemed uninterested. He watched the distant hills more intently than he did the helpers. When he gazed at the blood-spattered earth he seemed neither surprised nor sympathetic, but, or did I imagine it, seemed rather to gloat over the carnage. It was as if he had seen it all before. He was exceedingly docile that day, and during the next two months he seemed content. But gradually the old, rambling growl came back to his throat, and the mysterious look to his eyes. He took to wandering alone again at night. The beast was stalking its prey. Weeks later the sheriff, he told me with the utmost horror, found a coyote, killed fiendishly, and left on the mountainside. It was in the same condition as the body had been, but no one ever connected the two incidents. It was the bloodlust again, but as it was satiated, it left him quiescent for a time. He had no soul. He died in France and were I to guess, he was grinning when he died, for he lay in a pool of blood upon the battlefield in the Argonne. The End of The Throwback by Orlin Frederick Two Hours of Death by E. Thales Emmons From Weird Tales, May, 1923 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Two Hours of Death A Ghost Story by E. Thales Emmons. A few weeks ago, while looking over some papers which I found in the desk of my deceased father, I chanced upon the following manuscript. Whether it is a true record of some adventure in my father's life, or a bit of fiction which he had at some time prepared for publication, I do not know. But I am inclined to believe that it is indeed a true narrative. I have ascertained that such a man as Felix Sayers actually did exist, and that he was an intimate friend of my father, and that he died in the strange manner described in the manuscript but further than that I know nothing. However, I submit the whole thing as I found it, without change. As I picked up my morning paper, the first item to catch my eye was the following. Dies in madhouse. Inmate for thirty-five years dies suddenly. Felix Sayers, aged sixty-nine years, who has been an inmate of the Eastwood Asylum for the Insane, for the past thirty-five years, was found dead in his cell yesterday morning. At one time he was a well-known scientist of this city, 
but at the age of 34 became hopelessly insane and has since been confined in the asylum of which he was at the time of his death the oldest inmate felix sayers was my college chum and in later years my closest friend and now that he is dead i am at liberty to reveal the remarkable story concerning him a part of which not even he has ever known though a principal actor in the awful scene which has been indelibly stamped on my memory haunting my waking hours and recurring to me in oft-repeated dreams my friend was a man of genius and ability and had it not been for the terrible misfortune which came upon him he would have become famous in the scientific world nearly all of his time day and night was given over to scientific research in finding and working upon new hypotheses and bringing to light discoveries in that strange world into which he had evidently been born i was at that time his most intimate friend and to me a great many of his hopes and secrets were confided many nights i have passed in his laboratory listening to his explanation of some new theory or aiding him in his experiments it was always a source of great pleasure to me thus to pass a portion of my time although my mind was not of the same scientific trend as that of my friend his theories were always so lucidly elaborate and so strong fundamentally that the most abstract of them seemed even in the embryo capable of actual demonstration and so great was my confidence in him that i always stood ready to assist in any experiment or test at one point however i drew the line sayers while none the less engaged with material subjects was constantly dabbling in various psychical experiments with which i refused absolutely to have anything to do the occult i argued should remain occult if it had been intended that we should see beyond things of this world the power would have been given us ages ago i maintained and the less one dealt with such unsolvable problems as vexed my friend the happier would be his life having no desire for knowledge of the supernatural i studiously avoided all dealing with it and it was tacitly understood between sayers and myself that beyond the line of ordinary conversation the subject was forbidden i knew however that for him the thing had great fascination and that my opinion did nothing to banish it from his mind at the time of which i write i had not seen sayers for several weeks as it was often the case when he was deepest in his books and experiments i had called at his laboratory but his servant had said that no one was to be admitted and i knew that it was useless to attempt to see him at length i received a letter from him saying that he had something of interest to disclose and urging me to come tonight when i arrived at my friend's laboratory i found him in a high state of nervous excitement pacing back and forth like a caged tiger he greeted me effusively and with his usual directness plunged at once into the matter at hand which was evidently utmost in his mind seating himself at the opposite side of the table and directly facing me he began thornton i want you to prepare yourself to hear something that is to be entirely different from anything i have heretofore shown you it is something that to mankind has always been vague uncertain unfathomable something in fact that has existed only in imagination and in theory but never in demonstration i will show it to you tonight and to the world tomorrow in such a manner as entirely to revolutionize life and living death and dying as you very well know my religious beliefs have always been skeptical but my skepticism has arisen rather from insufficiency of faith with which to overcome the lack of direct evidence which mortals have concerning spiritual things than from stubborn unbelief 
that there is a supreme being i have never doubted his many works are too manifest and it is impossible to conceive of such a creation as this earth and all its delicate mechanisms and of the rest of the universe with all its unknown wonders without some vast supernatural oversight although i have never discussed the subject to any great extent i have nursed it as my pet and secret hobby and have spent many hours in work along certain lines in connection with it in the beginning i put finiteness aside from the question the human mind or soul with its unlimited power has always been regarded by me as the most wonderful of all creations i have been able to find no entirely satisfactory definition of this mind from a purely physical standpoint and therefore sought to obtain one nobody will say that the soul is material it belongs to the body and develops with it but is no part of it life is but a taper which a slight breath may easily puff out but this indeterminable thing called mind i reason must be governed by different laws it is possible that the creator ruled that the greatest of all his works should be blotted out with the cessation of life in that sordid mass of clay the body or did he arrange to reclaim it together with its spiritual complement to a world of its own as men have for ages believed skeptical as i have been i have always been willing to concede that the idea of a spiritual existence while vague seems no more wonderful than thousands of other things which we see about us daily and for the reason that they are manifest give them no thought whatever as a basis for the theory which i set myself to formulate i took what i shall term mind atoms as i have before said we cannot regard the mind force as a material thing but as a contradictory fact we know that it is something and further that generality we are ignorant then as the mind force governs alike each potential of the body this indeterminable something of which it is composed i reason must be in one portion as in another then i place these mind atoms as being diffused in the space occupied by the body and lying even between the atoms of its material composition if at death this mind is merely withdrawn from the body all of which i worked upon as already determined would it not occupy in the spirit world the same space and retain the same shape of the human form from which it had fled then the idea suggested itself that if some powerful and undiscovered action could be produced by the use of drugs probably causing an instantaneous and simultaneous separation of each mind atom from the physical atoms the effect would be a spiritual death while at the same time physical vitality would not be in the least impaired i then went one step further and added the supposition that as the effects of the action wore away it would be possible for the soul to re-enter the body even as it had been driven out and creation would again be complete i have worked untiringly and wrought experiment after experiment until at last i have succeeded in producing a drug that will accomplish all that i have explained to you i have used it on various animals and have seen them recover from the effect of it and thus have ascertained that it is harmless i ventured to try it on myself and i know that i have certainly solved the mysteries of the future although during the brief period in which my soul was in the spirit world i could make but few observations and those of minor importance i saw no other spiritual beings but remained for the most close to my soulless body waiting for the proper moment to return to my physical life if it were indeed to be possible but i am confident that what i have accomplished renders the unrevealed capability of being revealed and robs the hereafter of its secrets he paused 
and for a moment so bewildered was i by the strangeness of it all that i sat speechless my brain in a whirl thinking to overcome my amazement i reached for the wine decanter which was on the table before me and into a glass nearest me i poured some of the strong wine which sayers always kept at hand after draining it i looked up to see the gleam of satisfaction flit across his countenance thornton he said in that glass of wine there is enough of the drug to render you temporarily dead for two hours as i can best calculate in five minutes you will be unconscious i want you to undergo the same experience which i have safely passed through so that we may later exchange ideas on the subject in spite of his assurance a deadly fear took possession of me and i swore and expostulated at his unfair treatment with undisturbed calm he again spoke to me endeavoring to dispel my fears and assuring me that he would be conversing with me again at the end of the two hours even as he was speaking his words became indistinct and an overpowering dizziness seized me then came a moment of which i have no recollection after which by the fact that i stood or seemed to stand within a few feet of the chair in which i had been seated gazing at myself even now in the same position i knew that my body was without a soul even as sayers had said and that i was the soul standing there i looked about me and in place of the invisible atmosphere which i was accustomed to the room seemed filled with a constantly moving pulsing vapor dense gray and fog-like but through which i could discern objects with as much ease as ordinarily i saw my friend lift my body from the chair lay it on a bench and place a cushion under the head then he began pacing to and fro up and down back and forth and i found that i could move about at will and follow him i attempted to speak to him but now there was no sound i reached forth my hand to grasp a chair but it offered no resistance and i realized that i indeed occupied no space but was nevertheless in space and part of space i saw my friend's lips move as though he were speaking i heard no sound but was able to understand his words although he did not address me the glare of the lamps gave me a sensation which had i been in my physical form i would have termed pain and i much preferred to keep in a dark corner by direct mental communication of which i was not at the time aware i was able to signify this fact to sayers and he at once turned out all the lights leaving the laboratory lighted only by a low fire in the grate at the end of the room i was then astonished to find that the absence of light had no effect on my visual powers and that i could see in the dark as well as before from this i drew the conclusion that in reality i possessed no visuality as it seemed my senses i had left behind with my physical self and they were replaced by a strange comprehension of everything about me i still had the ability which the senses conveyed but their actual presence was lacking i could flit through the air with as much ease as i could walk on the floor and could have sunk through the same floor had i desired for the most solid substance offered no resistance to my form i was able to directly pass through anything the success of the experiment up to this point served to restore my confidence in sayers and i entertained no doubt that by the end of the stated time I could return to my body again i therefore determined to lose no time in making all the observations possible sayers was still pacing the room and it was evident from his actions that in a large degree fear was the cause of his restlessness he knew that in all probability i was constantly near him and he would have to avoid coming in contact with me 
had he been able to do so. Felix Sayers possessed a courage beyond that of many men, but few mortals can be brought face to face with the supernatural without experiencing fear. All of us have, at various times, sometimes by day, more often by night, undergone the feeling of the proximity of some ghostly presence, giving rise to a sensation of coldness and choking horror. This was clearly demonstrated to me now, for whenever myself and Sayers came within a few feet of each other, I could easily see that he left my presence. He made no attempt to communicate with me, and paid no heed to the various things I did to attract his attention. After a little, he seemed to recover himself, and calmly walked across the room to where my soulless body lay, and stood there, looking down at it. By the gleam in his eye, and by my wonderful supernatural power of comprehension, I knew in an instant that overwork and nervous strain had at last done their work, that the cord of reason had snapped, and that my friend was a madman. His lips moved, and I heard him, or rather felt him, address my body. At last I have you in my power. I have waited long for this moment, and at last my waiting is to be rewarded. I have driven the soul from the body, and the body lives. But now I will take away life itself, and you will be dead. The words seemed to please him, and he murmured slowly, Dead! Dead! I heard him continue in his madness. It is you who have stolen the honors due me. It is you who prevented me from becoming famous. It is you, curse you, who will marry the only woman I can ever love, and then you ask me to let you live? No, damn you! He then took from a drawer nearby a large and peculiarly shaped dissecting knife, which I had often seen him use, and, with the deliberation of the insane, he proceeded to sharpen it on a steel, testing it from time to time with his thumb. In my overpowering fear for the safety of my physical self, I know not all that I did, but I do know that it was all in vain. How I longed for the power of speech, and what would I not have given for the use of my own strong body with which to cope with him. But I was utterly in his power and at his mercy, and the sickening thought came to me that I, the spirit, must stand passive by his side and see my body, still living, hacked and mutilated by the knife he held. I called for help, but knew there was no sound, and in despair I waited. I heard the madman that was once my friend mutter, That will do! And with the gleaming blade in his hand he started across the room. And I knew that the awful moment was at hand. I attempted to grapple with him, but my hands felt nothing. Another step, and he would be at the bench, and it would all be over. Instinctively I threw myself between the madman and my body, with my arms stretched forth, as if to keep him away. How it was accomplished I cannot tell, but by the look of mortal terror that came in the face before me, such as I have never since seen drawn in any countenance, I knew that I had become visible, and that he saw me. I can imagine the picture at this moment, the spirit guarding the helpless counterpart of itself, and indeed it must have been a tableau to have struck fear to the stoutest heart. My friend's eyes dilated with horror, the knife dropped from his hand. One moment thus he stood. Then his lips parted, and I knew that he had uttered a shriek. He then fell at my feet, blood flowing from his mouth and nose, his eyes rolling in terror. I remained chained to the spot by the fear that he would recover from his fit and carry out his fiendish intention. At length the same feeling of dizziness which I had before experienced returned to me 
and almost before I could realize what was taking place, I found myself sitting upright on the bench, body and soul again united, and the form of Sayers at my feet to convince me that all was not a hideous dream. I placed my poor friend on the bench, and finally I succeeded in bringing him back to consciousness, but in a very weak condition. He passed through a very severe illness, but never regained his sanity. He remained hopelessly insane. Of this awful story I have related, he never recollected any part. I was unable to find any of the wonderful drug in his laboratory, and am as ignorant of its composition now as I was on that terrible night. I have been silent on the matter, hoping that some day Sayers would again regain his reason, but now that he is dead, I have been impelled to write this narrative. The End of Two Hours of Death by E. Thales Emmons A View from a Hill by M. R. James this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rafe Ball A View from a Hill by M. R. James How pleasant it can be, alone in a first-class railway carriage, on the first day of a holiday that is to be fairly long, to dawdle through a bit of English country that is unfamiliar, stopping at every station. You have a map open on your knee, and you pick out the villages that lie to right and left by their church towers. You marvel at the complete stillness that attends your stoppage at the stations, broken only by a footstep crunching the gravel. Yet perhaps that is best experienced after sundown and the traveller I have in mind was making his leisurely progress on a sunny afternoon in the latter half of June. He was in the depths of the country. I need not particularise further than to say that if you divided the map of England into four quarters, he would have been found in the southwestern of them. He was a man of academic pursuits, and his term was just over. He was on his way to meet a new friend, older than himself. The two of them had met first on an official inquiry in town, had found that they had many tastes and habits in common, liked each other, and the result was an invitation from Squire Richards to Mr. Fanshawe, which was now taking effect. The journey ended about five o'clock. Fanshawe was told by a cheerful country porter that the car from the hall had been up to the station and left a message that something had to be fetched from half a mile farther on, and would the gentleman please to wait a few minutes till it came back. "'But I see,' continued the porter, "'as you've got your bicycle, and very like you'd find it pleasant to ride up to the hall yourself. Straight up the road here, and then first turn to the left. It ain't above two miles.' and I'll see as your things is put in the car for you. You'll excuse me mentioning it, only I thought it were a nice evening for a ride. Yes, sir, very seasonable weather for the haymakers. Let me see. I have your bike ticket. Thank you, sir. Much obliged. You can't miss your road, etc., etc. The two miles to the hall were just what was needed, after a day in the train, to dispel somnolence and impart a wish for tea. The hall, when sighted, also promised just what was needed in the way of a quiet resting place after days of sitting on committees and college meetings. It was neither excitingly old nor depressingly new. Plastered walls, sash windows, old trees, smooth lawns were the features which Fanshawe noticed as he came up the drive. Squire Richards, a burly man of sixty-odd, was awaiting him in the porch with evident pleasure. "'Tea first, he said. "'Or would you like a longer drink? "'No? "'All right. "'Tea's ready in the garden. "'Come along. "'They'll put your machine away. 
I always have tea under the lime tree by the stream on a day like this. Nor could you ask for a better place. Midsummer afternoon, shade and scent of a vast lime tree, cool, swirling water within five yards. It was long before either of them suggested a move. At about six, Mr. Richards sat up, knocked out his pipe, and said, Look here, it's cool enough now to think of a stroll, if you're inclined. All right, then what I suggest is that we walk up the park and get on to the hillside, where we can look over the country. We'll have a map, and I can show you where things are. And you can go off on your machine, or we can take the car, according as you want exercise or not. If you're ready, we can start now and be back well before eight, taking it very easy. I'm ready. I should like my stick, though. And have you got any field glasses? I lent mine to a man a week ago, and he's gone off Lord knows where and taken them with him. Mr. Richards pondered. Yes, he said. I have, but they're not things I use myself, and I don't know whether the ones I have will suit you. They're old-fashioned, and about twice as heavy as they make them now. You're welcome to have them, but I won't carry them. By the way, what do you want to drink after dinner? Protestations that anything would do were overruled, and a satisfactory settlement was reached on the way to the front hall, where Mr. Fanshawe found his stick, and Mr. Richards, after thoughtful pinching of his lower lip, resorted to a drawer in the hall table, extracted a key, crossed to a cupboard in the panelling, opened it, took a box from the shelf, and put it on the table. "'The glasses are in there,' he said, "'and there's some dodge of opening it, but I've forgotten what it is. You try.' Mr. Fanshawe accordingly tried. There was no keyhole, and the box was solid, heavy, and smooth. It seemed obvious that some part of it would have to be pressed before anything could happen. The corners, he said to himself, are the likely places. And infernally sharp corners they are too, he added, as he put his thumb in his mouth after exerting force on a lower corner. What's the matter? said the squire. Why, your disgusting Borgia box has scratched me, drat it, said Fanshawe. The squire chuckled unfeelingly. Well, you've got it open anyway, he said. So I have. Well, I don't begrudge a drop of blood in a good cause, and here are the glasses. They are pretty heavy, as you said, but I think I'm equal to carrying them. Ready, said the squire. Come on, then. We go out by the garden. So they did, and passed out into the park, which sloped decidedly upwards to the hill which, as Fanshawe had seen from the train, dominated the country. It was a spur of a larger range that lay behind. On the way, the squire, who was great on earthworks, pointed out various spots where he detected or imagined traces of war ditches and the like. And here, he said, stopping on a more or less level plot with a ring of large trees, is Baxter's Roman villa. Baxter, said Mr. Fanshawe. I forgot, you don't know about him. He was the old chap I got those glasses from. I believe he made them. He was an old watchmaker down in the village, a great antiquary. My father gave him leave to grub about where he liked, and when he made a find he used to lend him a man or two to help him with the digging. He got a surprising lot of things together, and when he died, I dare say it's ten or fifteen years ago, I bought the whole lot and gave them to the town museum. We'll run in one of these days and look over them. The glasses came to me with the rest, but of course I kept them. If you look at them, you'll see they're more or less amateur work, the body of them. Naturally, the lenses weren't his making. Yes, I see they are just the sort of thing that a clever workman in a different line of business might turn out. But I don't see why he made them so heavy. And did Baxter actually find a Roman villa here? Yes. There's a pavement turfed over, where we're standing. It was too rough and plain to be worth taking up, but of course there are drawings of it, and the small things and pottery that turned up were quite good of their kind. An ingenious chap, old Baxter. 
he seemed to have a quite out-of-the-way instinct for these things. He was invaluable to our archaeologists. He used to shut up his shop for days at a time, and wander off over the district, marking down places where he scented anything on the ordnance map, and he kept a book with fuller notes of the places. Since his death, a good many of them have been sampled, and there's always been something to justify him. What a good man, said Mr. Fanshawe. Good, said the squire, pulling up brusquely. I meant useful to have about the place, said Mr. Fanshawe. But was he a villain? I don't know about that either, said the squire. But all I can say is, if he was good, he wasn't lucky, and he wasn't liked. I didn't like him, he added after a moment. Oh, said Fanshawe interrogatively. No, I didn't. But that's enough about Baxter. Besides, this is the stiffest bit, and I don't want to talk and walk as well. Indeed, it was hot, climbing a slippery grass slope that evening. I told you I should take you the short way, panted the squire, and I wish I hadn't. However, a bath won't do us any harm when we get back. Here we are, and there's the seat. A small clump of old Scotch firs crowned the top of the hill, and, at the edge of it, commanding the cream of the view, was a wide and solid seat, on which the two disposed themselves, and wiped their brows and regained breath. "'Now, then,' said the squire, as soon as he was in a condition to talk connectedly, "'this is where your glasses come in. But you'd better take a general look round first. My word! I've never seen the view look better. Writing as I am now, with a winter wind flapping against dark windows and a rushing, tumbling sea within a hundred yards, I find it hard to summon up the feelings and words which will put my reader in possession of the June evening and the lovely English landscape of which the squire was speaking. Across a broad, level plain they looked upon ranges of great hills, whose uplands, some green, some furred with woods, caught the light of a sun, westering but not yet low. And all the plain was fertile, though the river which traversed it was nowhere seen. There were copses, green wheat, hedges and pasture land. The little compact white moving cloud marked the evening train. Then the eye picked out red farms and grey houses, and nearer home scattered cottages, and then the hall nestled under the hill. The smoke of chimneys was very blue and straight. There was a smell of hay in the air. There were wild roses on bushes hard by. It was the acme of summer. After some minutes of silent contemplation, the squire began to point out the leading features, the hills and valleys, and told where the towns and villages lay. Now, he said, with the glasses you'll be able to pick out Fulnica Abbey. Take a line across that big green field, then over the wood beyond it, then over the farm on the knoll. Yes, yes, said Fanshawe. I've got it. What a fine tower. You must have got the wrong direction, said the squire. There's not much of a tower about there that I remember, unless it's old born church you've got hold of. And if you call that a fine tower, you're easily pleased. Well, I do call it a fine tower, said Fanshawe, the glasses still at his eyes, whether it's Oldbourne or any other. And it must belong to a largest church. It looks to me like a central tower, four big pinnacles at the corners and four smaller ones between. I must certainly go over there. How far is it? Oldbourne's about nine miles, or less, said the squire. It's a long time since I've been there. I don't remember thinking much of it. Now I'll show you another thing. Fanshawe had lowered the glasses, and was still gazing in the Oldbourne direction. No, he said. I can't make out anything with a naked eye. What was it you were going to show me? A good deal more to the left. It ought to be difficult to find. Do you see a rather sudden knob of a hill with a thick wood on top of it? It's in a dead line with that single tree on top of the big ridge. I do, said Fanshawe. 
and I believe I could tell you without much difficulty what it's called. Could you now? said the squire. Say on. Why, Gallows Hill, was the answer. How did you guess that? Well, if you don't want it guessed, you shouldn't put up a dummy gibbet and a man hanging on it. What's that? said the squire abruptly. There's nothing on that hill but wood. On the contrary, said Fanshawe. There's a largish expanse of grass on the top, and your dummy gibbet in the middle, and I thought there was something on it when I looked first. But I see there's nothing. Or is there? I can't be sure. Nonsense, nonsense, Fanshawe. There's no such thing as a dummy gibbet, or any other sort on that hill. And it's thick wood, a fairly young plantation. I was in it myself not a year ago. Hand me the glasses. I don't suppose I can see anything. After a pause. No, I thought not. They won't show a thing. Meanwhile, Fanshawe was scanning the hill. It might be only two or three miles away. Well, it's very odd, he said. It does look exactly like a wood without the glass. He took it again. That is one of the oddest effects. The gibbet is perfectly plain, and the grass field, and there even seem to be people on it, and carts, or a cart, with men in it. And yet, when I take the glass away, there's nothing. It must be something in the way this afternoon light falls. I shall come up earlier in the day when the sun's full on it. Did you say you saw people in a cart on that hill? said the squire incredulously. What should they be doing there at this time of day, even if the trees have been felled? Do talk sense. Look again. Well, I certainly thought I saw them. Yes, I should say there were a few just clearing off. And now, by Jove, it does look like something hanging on the gibbet. But these glasses are so beastly heavy I can't hold them steady for long. Anyhow, you can take it from me, there's no wood. And if you'll show me the road on the map, I'll go there tomorrow. The squire remained brooding for some little time. At last he rose and said, Well, I suppose that will be the best way to settle it. And now we'd better be getting back. Bath and dinner is my idea. And on the way back he was not very communicative. They returned through the garden, and went into the great hall to leave sticks, etc., in their due place, and here they found the aged butler, Patton, evidently in a state of some anxiety. "'Beg pardon, Master Henry,' he began at once, "'but someone's been up to mischief here, I'm much afraid.' He pointed to the open box which had contained the glasses. "'Nothing worse than that, Patton,' said the squire. Mayn't I take out my own glasses and lend them to a friend? Brought with my own money, you recollect? At old Baxter's sale, eh? Patton bowed, unconvinced. Oh, very well, Master Henry, as long as you know who it was. Only I thought proper to name it, for I didn't think that box had been off its shelf since you first put it there. And, if you'll excuse me, after what happened... The voice was lowered, and the rest was not audible to Fanshawe. The squire replied with a few words and a gruff laugh, and called on Fanshawe to come and be shown his room. And I do not think that anything else happened that night which bears on my story. Except, perhaps, the sensation which invaded Fanshawe in the small hours, that something had been let out which ought not to have been let out. It came into his dreams. He was walking in a garden which he seemed half to know, and stopped in front of a rockery made of old wrought stones, pieces of window tracery from a church, and even bits of figures. One of these moved his curiosity. It seemed to be a sculptured capital with scenes carved on it. He felt he must pull it out, and worked away, and, with an ease that surprised him, moved the stones that obscured it aside and pulled out the block. As he did so, a tin label fell down by his feet with a little clatter. He picked it up, and read on it, 
on no account move this stone. Yours sincerely, J. Patton. As often happens in dreams, he felt that this injunction was of extreme importance, and, with an anxiety that amounted to anguish, he looked to see if the stone had really been shifted. Indeed, it had. In fact, he could not see it anywhere. The removal had disclosed the mouth of a burrow, and he bent down to look into it. Something stirred in the blackness, and then, to his intense horror, a hand emerged, a clean right hand in a neat cuff and coat sleeve, just in the attitude of a hand that means to shake yours. He wondered whether it would not be rude to let it alone. But, as he looked at it, it began to grow hairy and dirty and thin, and also to change its pose and stretch out as if to take hold of his leg. At that he dropped all thought of politeness, decided to run, screamed, and woke himself up. This was the dream he remembered, but it seemed to him, as, again, it often does, that there had been others of the same import before, but not so insistent. He lay awake for some little time, fixing the details of the last dream in his mind, and wondering, in particular, what the figures had been which he had seen, or half seen, on the carved capital. Something quite incongruous, he felt sure, but that was the most he could recall. Whether because of the dream, or because it was the first day of his holiday, he did not get up very early, nor did he at once plunge into the exploration of the country. He spent a morning, half lazy, half instructive, in looking over the volumes of the County Archaeological Society's transactions, in which were many contributions from Mr. Baxter on finds of flint implements, Roman sites, ruins of monastic establishments, in fact, most departments of archaeology. They were written in an odd, pompous, only half-educated style. If the man had had more early schooling, thought Fanshawe, he would have been a very distinguished antiquary, or he might have been, he thus qualified his opinion a little later, but for a certain love of opposition and controversy, and, yes, a patronising tone, as of one possessing superior knowledge, which left an unpleasant taste. He might have been a very respectable artist. There was an imaginary restoration and elevation of a priory church which was very well conceived. A fine pinnacled central tower was a conspicuous feature of this. It reminded Fanshawe of that which he had seen from the hill, and which the squire had told him must be Oldbourne. But it was not Oldbourne. It was Fulnica Priory. Oh well, he said to himself, I suppose Oldbourne Church may have been built by Fulnica monks, and Baxter has copied Oldbourne Tower. Anything about it in the letterpress? Ah, I see it was published after his death. Found among his papers. After lunch, the squire asked Fanshawe what he meant to do. Well, said Fanshawe, I think I shall go out on my bike, about four, as far as Oldbourne and back by Gallows Hill. That ought to be a round of about fifteen miles, oughtn't it? About that, said the squire, and you'll pass Lambsfield and Wonston, both of which are worth looking at. There's a little glass at Lambsfield and the stone at Wonston. Good, said Fanshawe. I'll get tea somewhere, and may I take the glasses? I'll strap them on my bike, on the carrier. Of course, if you like, said the squire. I really ought to have some better ones. If I go into the town today, I'll see if I can pick up some. Why should you trouble to do that if you can't use them yourself? said Fanshawe. Oh, I don't know. One ought to have a decent pair. And, well, old Patton doesn't think those are fit to use. Is he a judge? He's got some tale, I don't know, something about old Baxter. I've promised to let him tell me about it. It seems very much on his mind since last night. Why that? Did he have a nightmare, like me? He had something. He was looking an old man this morning, and he said he hadn't closed an eye. Well, let him save up his tale till I come back. Very well, I will if I can. Look here, are you going to be late? If you get a puncture eight miles off and have to walk home, what then? I don't trust these bicycles. 
i shall tell them to give us cold things to eat i shan't mind that whether i'm late or early but i've got things to mend punctures with and now i'm off it was just as well that the squire had made that arrangement about a cold supper fanshawe thought and not for the first time as he wheeled his bicycle up the drive about nine o'clock so also the squire thought and said several times as he met him in the hall rather pleased at the confirmation of his want of faith in bicycles than sympathetic with his hot weary thirsty and indeed haggard friend in fact the kindest thing he found to say was you'll want a long drink to-night cider cup do all right hear that pattern cider cup iced lots of it then to fanshawe don't be all night over your bath by half-past nine they were at dinner and fanshawe was reporting progress if progress it might be called i got to lambsfield very smoothly and saw the glass it is very interesting stuff but there's a lot of lettering i couldn't read not with the glasses said the squire those glasses of yours are no manner of use inside a church or inside anywhere i suppose for that matter but the only places i took him into were churches hm. well go on said the squire however i took some sort of a photograph of the window and i dare say an enlargement would show what i want then wonston i should think that stone was a very out-of-the-way thing only i don't know about that class of antiquities has anybody opened the mound it stands on baxter wanted to but the farmer wouldn't let him oh well i should think it would be worth doing anyhow the next thing was fulnicker and oldbourne you know it's very odd about that tower i saw from the hill oldbourne church is nothing like it and of course there's nothing over thirty feet high at fulnicker though you can see it had a central tower i didn't tell you did i that baxter's fancy drawing of fulnicker shows a tower exactly like the one i saw so you thought i dare say put in the squire no it wasn't a case of thinking the picture actually reminded me of what i'd seen and i made sure it was oldbourne well before i looked at the title well baxter had a very fair idea of architecture i dare say what's left made it easy for him to draw the right sort of tower that may be it of course but i'm doubtful if even a professional could have got it so exactly right there's absolutely nothing left at fulnicker but the bases of the piers which supported it however that isn't the oddest thing what about gallows hill said the squire here Patton, listen to this i told you what mr fanshawe said he saw from the hill yes master henry you did and i can't say i was so much surprised considering all right all right you keep that till afterwards we want to hear what mr fanshawe saw to-day go on fanshawe you turned to come back by ackford and thorfield i suppose yes and i looked into both the churches then i got to the turning which goes to the top of gallows hill i saw that if i wheeled my machine over the field at the top of the hill i could join the home road on this side it was about half past six when i got to the top of the hill and there was a gate on my right where it ought to be leading into the belt of plantation you hear that pattern a belt he says so i thought it was a belt but it wasn't you were quite right and i was hopelessly wrong i cannot understand it the whole top is planted quite thick well i went on into this wood wheeling and dragging my bike expecting every minute to come to a clearing and then my misfortunes began thorns i suppose first i realized that the front tire was slack then the back i couldn't stop to do more than try to find the punctures and mark them but even that was hopeless so i ploughed on and the farther i went the less i liked the place not much poachy in that cover eh, pattern said the squire no indeed master henry there's very few cares to go no i know never mind that now go on fanshawe i don't blame anybody for not caring to go there i know i had all the fancies one least likes steps crackling over twigs behind me indistinct people stepping behind trees in front of me 
Yes, and even a hand laid on my shoulder. I pulled up very sharp at that and looked round, but there really was no branch or bush that could have done it. Then, when I was just about at the middle of the plot, I was convinced that there was someone looking down on me from above, and not with any pleasant intent. I stopped again, or at least slackened my pace, to look up, and as I did, down I came, and barked my shins abominably on, what do you think? A block of stone with a big square hole in the top of it, and within a few paces there were two others just like it. The three were set in a triangle. Now, do you make out what they were put there for? I think I can, said the squire, who was now very grave and absorbed in the story. Sit down, Patton. It was time, for the old man was supporting himself by one hand and leaning heavily on it. He dropped into a chair and said in a very tremulous voice, You didn't go between them stones, did you, sir? I did not, said Fanshawe emphatically. I dare say I was an ass, but as soon as it dawned on me where I was, I just shouldered my machine and did my best to run. It seemed to me as if I was in an unholy evil sort of graveyard, and I was most profoundly thankful that it was one of the longest days and still sunlight. Well, I had a horrid run, even if it was only a few hundred yards. Everything caught on everything, handles and spokes and carrier and pedals, caught in them viciously, or I fancied so. I fell over at least five times. At last I saw the hedge, and I couldn't trouble to hunt for the gate. There is no gate on my side, the squire interpolated. Just as well I didn't waste time then. I dropped the machine over somehow, and went into the road pretty near head first. Some branch or something got my ankle at the last moment. Anyhow, there I was, out of the wood, and seldom more thankful, or more generally sore, then came the job of mending my punctures. I had a good outfit, and I'm not at all bad at the business, but this was an absolutely hopeless case. It was seven when I got out of the wood, and I spent fifty minutes over one tyre. As fast as I found a hole and put on a patch and blew it up, it went flat again. So I made up my mind to walk. That hill isn't three miles away, is it? Not more across country, but nearer six by road. I thought it must be. I thought I couldn't have taken well over the hour over less than five miles, even leading a bike. Well, there's my story. Where's yours and Patton's? Mine? I've no story, said the squire. But you weren't very far out when you thought you were in a graveyard. There must be a good few of them up there, Patton, don't you think? They left them there when they fell to bits, I fancy. Patton nodded, too much interested to speak. Don't said Fanshawe. "'Now then, Patton,' said the squire, "'you've heard what sort of a time Mr. Fanshawe's been having. What do you make of it? Anything to do with Mr. Baxter? Fill yourself a glass of port, and tell us.' "'Ah, uh, that done me good, Master Henry,' said Patton, after absorbing what was before him. If you really wish to know what were in my thoughts, my answer would be clear in the affirmative. Yes, he went on, warming to his work. I should say, as Mr. Fanshawe's experience of today were very largely due to the person you named. And I think, Master Henry, as I have some title to speak, in view of me having been many years on speaking terms with him, and swore in to be jury on the coroner's inquest near this time ten years ago, you being then, if you carry your mind back, Master Henry, travelling abroad, and no one here to represent the family. Inquest, said Fanshawe. An inquest on Mr. Baxter, was there? Yes, sir, on, on that very person. The facts as led up to that occurrence was these. The deceased was, as you may have gathered, a very peculiar individual in his habits. In my idea, at least, but all must speak as they find. He lived very much to himself, without neither chick nor child, as the saying is. And how he passed away this time was what very few could offer a guess at. 
he lived unknown very few could know when baxter ceased to be said the squire to his pipe i beg pardon master henry i was just coming to that but when i say how he passed away his time to be sure we know our intent he was in rummaging and ransacking out all the history of the neighbourhood and the number of things he'd managed to collect together well it was spoke off for miles round as baxter's museum and many a time when he might be in the mood and i might have an hour to spare have he showed me his pieces of pots and what not going back by his account to the times of the ancient romans however you know more about that than what i do master henry only what i was a-going to say was this as know what he might and interesting as he might be in his talk there was something about the man well for one thing no one ever remembered to see him in church nor yet chapel at service time and that made talk our rector he never come in the house but once never ask me what the man said that was all anybody could ever get out of him then how did he spend his nights particularly about this season of the year time and again the labouring men would meet him coming back as they went out to their work and he'd pass em by without a word looking they says like someone straight out at the asylum they'd see the whites of his eyes all round he'd have a fish basket with him that they noticed and he always come the same road and the talk got to be that he'd made himself some business and that not the best kind well not so far from where you was at seven o'clock this evening sir well now after such a night as that mr baxter he'd shut up the shop and the old lady that did for him had orders not to come in and knowing what she did about his language she took care to obey them orders but one day it so happened about three o'clock in the afternoon the house being shut up as i said there come a most fearful to do inside and smoke out of the windows and baxter crying out seemingly in an agony so the man as lived next door he run round to the back premises and burst the door in and several others come too well he tell me he never in all his life smelt such a fearful well odour as what there was in that kitchen place it seemed as if baxter had been boiling something in a pot and overset it on his leg there he laid on the floor trying to keep back the cries but it was more than he could manage and when he seen the people come in oh he was in a nice condition if his tongue warn't blistered worse than his leg it warn't his fault well they picked him up and got him into a chair and run for the medical man and one of them was going to pick up the pot and baxter he screams out to let it alone so he did but he couldn't see as there was anything in the pot but a few old brown bones then they says dr lawrence will be here in a minute mr baxter he will soon put you to rights and then he was off again he must be got up to his room he couldn't have the doctor come in there and see all that mess they must throw a cloth over it anything the tablecloth out of the parlour well so they did but that must have been poisonous stuff in that pot for it was pretty near on two months afore baxter were about again beg pardon master henry was you going to say something yes i was said the squire i wonder you haven't told me all this before however i was going to say i remember old lawrence telling me he'd attended baxter he was a queer card he said lawrence was up in the bedroom one day and picked up a little mask covered with black velvet and put it on in fun and went to look at himself in the glass he hadn't time for a proper look for old baxter shouted out to him from the bed put it down you fool do you want to look through a dead man's eyes and it startled him so that he did put it down and then he asked baxter what he meant and baxter insisted on him handing it over and said the man he brought it from was dead or some such nonsense but lawrence felt it as he handed it over and he declared he was sure it was made out of the front of a skull he bought a distilling apparatus at baxter's sale he told me but he could never use it it seemed to taint everything 
however much he cleaned it. But go on, Patton. Yes, Master Henry, I'm nearly done now, and time, too, for I don't know what they'll think about me in the servants' hall. Well, this business at the schooling was some years before Mr. Baxter was took, and he got about again and went on just as he'd used and one of the last jobs he'd done was finishing up them actual glasses what you took out last night. You see, he'd made the body of them some long time and got the pieces of glass for them, but there was something wanted to finish em, whatever it was, I don't know. But I picked up the frame one day and I says, Mr. Baxter, why don't you make a job of this? And he says, Ah, when I've done that, you'll hear news you will there's going to be no such pair of glasses as mine when they're filled and sealed and there he stopped and i says why mr baxter you talk as if they was wine bottles filled and sealed why where's the necessity for that did i say filled and sealed he says oh well I was suiting my conversation to my company. Well, then come round this time of year, and one fine evening I was passing his shop on my way home, and he was standing on the step, very pleased with himself, and he says, All right and tight now. My best bit of work's finished, and I'll be out with them tomorrow. What, finish them glasses? I says. Might I have a look at them? No, no, he says, I've put them to bed for tonight, and when I do show em you, you'll have to pay for peeping, so I tell you. And that, gentleman, were the last words I heard that man say. That were the 17th of June, and just a week after, there was a funny thing happened, and it was due to that as we brought in unsound mind at the inquest, for barring that. No one as knew Baxter in business could anyways have laid that against him. But George Williams, as lived in the next house, and do now, he was woke up that same night with a stumbling and tumbling about in Mr. Baxter's premises, and he got out of bed and went to the front window on the street to see if there was any rough customers about. And it being a very light night, he could make sure as there was not. Then he stood and listened and he hear Mr. Baxter coming down his front stair one step after another, very slow, and he got the idea as it was like someone being pushed or pulled down and holding on to everything he could. Next thing, he hear the street door come open, and out come Mr. Baxter into the street in his day clothes, at and all, with his arms straight down by his sides, and talking to himself, and shaking his head from one side to the other, and walking in that peculiar way that he appeared to be going, as it were, against his own will. George Williams put up the window, and hear him say, Oh, mercy, gentlemen! And then he shut up sudden as if, he said, someone clapped his hand over his mouth, and Mr. Baxter threw his head back, and his hat fell off. And Williams see his face looking something pitiful, so as he couldn't keep from calling out to him. Why? Mr. Baxter, ain't you well? And he was going to offer to fetch Dr. Lawrence to him, only he heard the answer. Tis best you mind your own business. Put in your head. But whether it were Mr. Baxter said it so horse-like and faint, he never could be sure. Still, there weren't no one but him in the street, and yet, Williams was that upset by the way he spoke that he shrank back from the window and went and sat on the bed. And he heard Mr. Baxter's step go on and up the road, and after a minute or more he couldn't help but look out once more, and he see him going along the same curious way as before. And one thing he recollected was that Mr. Baxter never stopped to pick up his hat when it fell off, and yet there it was, on his head. Well, Master Henry, that was the last anybody see of Mr. Baxter, leastways for a week or more. There was a lot of people said he was called off on business, or made off because he got into some scrape, but he was well known for miles round, and none of the railway people nor the public house people hadn't seen him. 
and then ponds was looked into and nothing found and at last one evening fakes the keeper come down from over the hill to the village and he says he's seen the gallows hill planting black with birds and that were a funny thing because he never seen no sign of a creature there in his time so they looked at each other a bit and first one says i'm going to go up and another says so am i if you are and half a dozen of them set out in the evening time and took dr lawrence with them and you know master henry there he was between them three stones with his neck broke useless to imagine the talk which this story set going it is not remembered but before Patton left them he said to fanshaw excuse me sir but did i understand as you took out them glasses with you to-day i thought you did and might i ask did you make use of them at all yes only to look at something in a church oh indeed you took em into the church did you sir yes i did it was lambsfield church by the way i left them strapped on to my bicycle i'm afraid in the stable yard no matter for that sir i can bring them in the first thing to-morrow and perhaps you'll be so good as to look at em then accordingly before breakfast after a tranquil and well-earned sleep fanshaw took the glasses into the garden and directed them to a distant hill he lowered them instantly and looked at top and bottom worked the screws tried them again and yet again shrugged his shoulders and replaced them on the hall table Patton, he said they're absolutely useless i can't see a thing it's as if someone had stuck a black wafer over the lens spoilt my glasses have you said the squire thank you the only ones i've got you try them yourself said fanshaw i've done nothing to them so after breakfast the squire took them out to the terrace and stood on the steps after a few ineffectual attempts lord how heavy they are he said impatiently and in the same instant dropped them on to the stones and the lens splintered and the barrel cracked a little pool of liquid formed on the stone slab it was inky black and the odour that rose from it is not to be described filled and sealed eh said the squire if i could bring myself to touch it i dare say we should find the seal so that's what came of his boiling and distilling is it old ghoul what in the world do you mean don't you see my good man remember what he said to the doctor about looking through dead men's eyes well this was another way of it but they didn't like having their bones boiled i take it and the end of it was they carried him off whither he would not well i'll get a spade and we'll bury this thing decently as they smoothed the turf over it the squire handing the spade to Patton, who had been a reverential spectator remarked to fanshaw it's almost a pity you took that thing into the church you might have seen more than you did baxter only had them for a week i make out but i don't see that he did much in the time i'm not sure said fanshaw there is that picture of Fulnica Priory Church. End of A View from a Hill Recording by Rafe Ball You may telephone from here by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Vogler. She sent the servant to bed at half past ten and sat up in the flat alone. I'll let my cousin in, she explained. She may be rather late. She read, knitted, began a letter, poked the fire, and examined her husband's photographs on the mantelpiece. But most of the time, she looked about her nervously, sometimes going to the door to listen sometimes lifting the corner of the blind to look out upon the lights of north kensington struggling with the blackness the fog was thicker than ever a rumble of traffic feeling its way floated up to her from below but at last the doorbell rang sharply and she ran to let in the cousin 
who had promised to spend the two nights with her during her husband's absence in Paris. They kissed. Both began talking at once. I thought you were never coming, Sybil. The play was out late and the fog's bad. I sent on my box this afternoon on purpose. It came safely, and your room's quite ready. I do hope you'll manage all right without a maid. Oh, I'm so glad you've come, though. Foolish little country mouse. Oh, it's not that so much, though I admit that London still terrifies me at night, rather. But, you know, this is the first time he's been away. I suppose. I know, dear. I understand perfectly. The cousin was brisk and cheerful. You feel lonely, of course. They kissed again. Just unhook me, will you? She added. And I'll get into my dressing gown, and then we'll be cozy over the fire. I saw him off at the Victoria at 8.45, said the little wife when the operation was over. New Haven in Dieppe? Yes. He gets to Paris at seven in the morning. He promised to telephone the first thing. You expensive little monkey. Why? It's ten shillings for three minutes, or something like that, and you have to go to the GPO, or the mansion house, or some such place, I believe. I thought it was the usual long-distance thing direct here to the flat. He never told me all that. Probably you didn't give him a chance. They laughed and went on chatting, with feet on the fender and skirts tucked up. The cousin lit her second cigarette. It was after midnight. I'm afraid I'm not the least bit sleepy, said the wife apologetically. Nor am I, dear. For once the play excited me. She began to describe it vigorously. Halfway through the recital, the telephone sounded in the hall. It tinkled faintly, but gave no proper ring. The other started. There it is again. It's always doing that ever since Harry put it in a week ago. I don't quite like it. She spoke in a hushed voice. The cousin looked at her curiously. Oh, you mustn't mind that, she laughed with a reassuring manner. <laughs> it's a little way they have when the line gets out of order. You're not used to playing the telephone game yet. You should call up the exchange and complain. Always complain. You know, in this world, if you want... There it goes again, interrupted her friend nervously. Oh, I do wish it would stop. It's so like someone standing out there in the hall and trying to talk. The cousin jumped. They went into the hall together, and the experienced one briskly rang up the exchange and asked if there was anybody trying to get through. With fine indignation, she complained that no one in the flat could sleep for the noise. After a brief conversation, she turned, receiver in hand, to her companion. The operator says he's very sorry, but your line's a bit troublesome tonight for some reason. Got mixed or something. He can't understand it. Advise you to leave the receiver unhooked till the morning. Then it can't possibly ring, you see. They left the receiver swinging and went back to the fire. I'm sorry I'm such a timid donkey, the wife said, laughing a little. But I'm not used to it yet. There is no telephone at the farm, you know. She turned with a sudden start, as though she heard the bell again. And tonight, she added in a lower voice, though with an obvious effort at self-control, for some reason or another, I feel uncomfortable, rather excited, queer, I think. How queer? I, I don't know exactly, almost as if there were someone else in the flat, someone besides ourselves and the servant, I mean. The cousin moved abruptly. She switched on the electric lights in the wall beside her. Yes, but it's only the imagination, really, she said with decision. It's natural enough. It's the fog and the strangeness of London after the loneliness of your farm life, and your husband being away, and, and all that. Once you analyze these queer feelings, they always go, Hark! exclaimed the wife under her breath. Wasn't that a step in the passage? She sat bolt upright, her face pale, her eyes very bright. They listened for a moment. The night was utterly still about them. Rubbish! cried the cousin loudly. It was my foot knocking the fender like this. Look! She repeated the sound vigorously. I do believe it was, the other said, only half convinced. But it is queer. You know, I feel exactly as though someone had come into the flat. Quite recently, since you came. I mean, just before the tinkling began, in fact. Come, come, laughed the cousin. You'll give us both the jumps. 
At one o'clock in the morning, it's easy to imagine anything. You'll be hearing elephants on the stairs next. She looked sharply about her. Let's brew our chocolate and get to bed, she added. We shall sleep like tops. One o'clock already. And Harry's halfway across by now, said the wife, smiling at her friend's language. But I'm so glad, oh, so glad you're here, she added. And I think it's most awfully sweet of you to give up a comfy big house. They kissed again and laughed. Soon afterward, having scalded their throats with hot chocolate, they went to bed. It simply can't ring now, remarked the cousin triumphantly as they passed the receiver dangling midair. That's a relief, her friend said. I feel less nervous, really. I'm too ashamed of myself for anything. Fog's clearing, too, Sybil added, peering for a moment through the narrow window beside the front door. An hour later, the little flat was still as a grave. No sound of traffic was heard. Even the tinkling of the telephone seemed to hold twenty-four hours away, when suddenly it began again, first with soft little tentative noises, very faint, troubled, hurried, buried almost out of the hearing inside the box, then louder and louder, with sharp jerks, finally with a challenging and alarming peal, and the wife who had kept her door open, without pretense of sleep, heard it from the very beginning. In a moment she found herself in the passage, and Sybil, wakened by her cry, was at her heels. They turned up the lights and stood facing one another. The hall smelt, as things only smell at night. Cold, musty. What's the matter? You frightened me. I heard you scream. The telephone's ringing again, violently, the wife whispered, pale to the lips. Don't you hear it? This time there's someone there. Really? The cousin stared blankly at her. The laugh choked in her throat. I hear nothing, she said defiantly, yet without confidence in her voice. Besides, the thing's still disconnected. It can't ring. Look, she pointed to the hanging receiver, motionless against the wall. You're white as a ghost, though, she added, coming quickly forward. Her friend moved suddenly to the instrument and picked up the receiver. It's someone for me, she said, with tear in her eyes. It's someone who wants to talk to me. Oh, hark, hark how it rings. Her voice shook. She placed the little disc to her ear and waited while her friend stood by and stared in amazement, uncertain what to do. She had heard no ringing. You, Harry, whispered the wife into the telephone with brief intervals of silence for the replies. You? But how in the world so soon? Yes, I can just hear, but... Very faintly. Miles and miles away, your voice sounds, what? A wonderful journey. And sooner than you expected? Not in Paris. Where then? Oh, my darling boy. No, I don't quite hear. I can't catch it. I don't understand. The pain of the sea is nothing, is what? You know nothing of what? The cousin came boldly up. She took her arm. But child, there's no one there, bless you. You're dreaming. You're in a fever or something. Hush, for God's sake, hush. She held up a hand. In her face and eyes was an expression of indescribable fear, love, bewilderment. Her body swayed a little, leaning against the wall. Hush, I hear him still. But all miles and miles away. He says he's been trying for hours to find me. First he tried my brain direct, and then, then, ah. Oh, he says he may not get back again to me, only he can't understand, can't explain why. The cold, oh, the awful cold keeps his lips from, ah! Oh. She screamed aloud as she flung the receiver down and dropped a heap upon the floor. I don't understand. It's death, death. <sighs> and the collision in the channel that night, as they learned in due course, occurred a few minutes after one o'clock, while Harry himself, who remained unconscious for several hours after the boat picked him up, could only remember that his last desire, as the wave caught him, was an intense wish to communicate with his wife and tell her what had happened. The next thing he knew, he was opening his eyes in the Dieppe Hotel. And the other curious detail 
was furnished by the man who came to repair the telephone next day. At the exchange, he declared, the wire from midnight till nearly three in the morning had emitted sparks and flashes of light no one had been able to account for in any usual manner. Queer, said the man to himself after tinkering and tapping for ten minutes, but there's nothing wrong with it at this end. It's the subscriber, more likely. It usually is. End of story. This recording is in the public domain.